still life, with Amanda Root as Laura Jessen, John Dateen as Dr. Alec Harvey, Stephanie Cole as Myrtle Baggett, and Trevor Peacock as Albert. Still life. Oh, yes, man, about digestives, bourbons, ginger nuts. Uh, any more is? Oh, I'm afraid not. Fresh out. Oh, well, um, digestives then. That'll be a penny, madam. All aboard! Here we are. Your change. Thank you. I could do a restock in my tray, Mrs. Baggett. I'm out of Mari's and Nestle's plane. Well, let me see. <laughs> an old girl on a 410 asked if I'd got an ice cream wafer. <laughs> I didn't half laugh. I don't see there was anything to laugh at. A very natural request on a fan spring day. What did she think I was? Stop me and buy one. <laughs> be quiet, Beryl. And as for you, Stanley, don't be saucy. You were saucy when you started to work here, Stanley, and you've been getting saucier ever since. Right, here you are. Go on now. Right, oh. Bye, Beryl. <laughs> Beryl Walkers, I'll trouble you to remember you're on duty. I didn't do anything. Exactly. Stop filing your nails and go and clean table three. I can see the crumbs from here. Yeah, well, it's them rock cakes. Just we... do as you are told. Yes, Mrs. Baggett. Hello, Albert. Oh, Albert. Quite a stranger, aren't you? Uh, I couldn't get in yesterday. I, uh, I had a bit of a dust-up. What about? Well, I saw a chap getting out of a first-class compartment, and when he came to give his ticket up, it was third class. I told him he'd have to pay excess, then he turned a bit nasty, and I, I had to send for Mr Saunders. Oh, that got a good he'd be. I'd have popped him to explain, but I had a date. A, a date? A, a chap, I know, is uh, getting married. And, Very uh, interesting, I'm sure. Oh, come on. What's up with you, anyway? Beryl, hurry up. Yes, Mrs. Baggett. I'm afraid I can't stand here wasting my time in idle gossip, Mr. Godby. Aren't you going to offer me another cup? You can have another cup and welcome when you finish that one. Beryl will give it to you. I've got my accounts to do. I'd rather you gave it to me. Tame and tame. Wait for no man, Mr. Godby. I don't know what you're so happy about, but whatever okay. it is... I'm sure I don't know to what you are referring to. A cup of tea, please. Oh, certainly. A cake of pastry? No, thank you. Fine weather, isn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. Apart from the old April shower. Uh, threepence. Thank you. Oh, there's the boat train. What about my other cup? It's left to be moving. The 543 will be here in a minute. What's on the gate? Young William. Don't decide to trouble you. But could you give me a glass of water? I've got something in my eye and I want to bathe it. Oh, oh would dear. you like me to have a look? No, please don't trouble. I think the horse will do it. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Bit of coal dust, I expect. Oh, a man I knew lost the sight of one eye getting a bit of grit in it. Oh, painful thing. <laughs> Very painful. Better? Oh, I'm afraid not. Oh, can I help you? Oh, no, please, it's only something in my eye. Oh, please let me look. I, I happen to be a doctor. Oh, it's very kind of you. Turn round to the light, please. Look up. Now look down. Oh. oh I, I can see it. Now, I'm just going to touch it with the corner of my handkerchief. Keep still. There. Oh, oh dear, what a relief. Yeah. It was agonising. Looks like a bit of grit. It was when the express went through. Thank you very much. Not at all. Here we go. I must run. Oh, Beryl, bring those empties through to the back. Yes, Mrs. Baggett. How lucky for me that you happen to be here. Anybody could have done it. Oh, I'm sorry. Alec Harvey. 
Laura Jessen. Well, you did, and I'm most grateful. Oh, there's my train. Goodbye. Goodbye. but you can't expect me to be a cook, housekeeper and char ruled into one during the day and a loving wife in the evening. Oh, dear, no. There are just as good fish in the sea, I says, as ever came out of it. And I packed my boxes then and there and left it. <gasps> Didn't you ever go back? Never. I went to my sister's place at Folkestone for a bit and then I went in with a friend of mine and we opened a tea shop in Hay. Oh, what am I doing? Dead as a doornail inside three years. Well, I never. So you see, every single thing she told me came true. The six of clubs, an unexpected journey, the queen of diamonds. Oh, you sound cheerful. Full of the joys of summer, Mrs. B. Uh, two rock and an apple. I thought the expression was full of the joys of spring. Yes, but it's July, Mrs. B. Uh, less of the Mrs. B, my lad. Who's are these for, anyway? Partly for London on the up platform. Well, why can't they come in here for them? Ask me another. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got something in your eyes, Stanley? Uh, nothing beyond a bit of a twinkle now and again. <laughs> awful. You behave yourself, my lad. Now, here are your rock cakes. Beryl, stop sniggering and give Stanley an apple off the stand. <laughs> Go on now. Be off with you. Yeah, all right. Give us a chance. What people want to eat on the platform for, I really don't know. Oh, and tell Mr. Godby not to forget his tea. Right, Al. <laughs> oh. Sorry, oh, 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 Tea or lemonade? <laughs> Tea, I think. It's more refreshing, really. Two teas, please. Oh, certainly, Doctor. It is, Doctor, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, cakes or pastry? Uh, Laura, cakes or pastry? No, thank you. Are those bath buns fresh? Well, certainly they are. They were made this morning. Two, please. Right, that'll be eight pence. Thank you. Oh, here's your change, Doctor. You must have a bath now. Fresh this morning. Oh, they do look good, I must say. One of my earliest passions. I've never outgrown it. Do you like milk in your tea? Yes, don't you? Yes, fortunately. <laughs> Station refreshments are generally a wee bit arbitrary, you know. I wasn't grumbling. <laughs> do you ever grumble? Are you ever sullen and cross and bad-tempered? Of course I am. At least not sullen, exactly. But I sometimes get into rages. Oh, I can't visualise you in a rage. I really don't see why you should. <laughs> do you feel guilty, Alec? I do. Guilty? Well, you ought to more than me, really. You neglected your work this afternoon. I worked this morning. A little relaxation never did anyone any harm. Why should either of us feel guilty? I don't know. Sort of instinct. As though we were letting something happen that oughtn't to happen. <laughs> How awfully nice you are. When I was a child in Cornwall, we lived in Cornwall, you know. May, that's my sister, and I used to climb out of our bedroom window on summer nights and go down to the cove and bathe. It was dreadfully cold, but we felt adventurous. I'd never have dared to do it all by myself, but sharing the danger made it all right. That's how I feel now, really. Have a bun. It's awfully bad for you. Oh, you're laughing at me. Yes, a little. But I'm laughing at myself, too. Why? For feeling a small pang when you said about being guilty. There you are, you see. We haven't done anything wrong. Of course we haven't. An accidental meeting, then another accidental meeting, then a little lunch, movies. What could be more ordinary, more natural? We're adults, after all. <laughs> I never see myself as an adult, do you? Yes, I do. I'm a respectable married woman with a husband and a home and three children. But there must be a part of you, deep down inside, that doesn't feel like that at all. Some little spirit that still wants to climb out of the window, that still longs to splash about in the dangerous sea. 
Perhaps we none of us ever grow up entirely. How awfully nice you are. You said that before. I thought perhaps you hadn't heard. I heard all right. I'm respectable too, you know. I have a home and a wife and children and responsibilities. I also have a lot of work to do and a lot of ideals all mixed up with it. What's she like? Madeline. Yes. Small, dark, rather delicate. How funny. I should have thought she'd be fair. And your husband? What's he like? Medium height, brown hair, kindly, unemotional, and not delicate at all. You said that proudly. Did I? What's the matter? The matter? What could be the matter? You suddenly went away. I thought perhaps we were being rather silly. Why? Oh, I don't know. We're such complete strangers, really. It's one thing to close a window, but quite another to slam it down on my fingers. I'm sorry. Please come back again. It's too bad for one. And worse than coffee, I mean. If this is a professional interview, my fee is a guinea. <laughs> it's nearly time for your train. I hate to think of it chugging along and interrupting our tea party. I really am sorry now. What for? For being disagreeable. I don't think you could be disagreeable. You said something just now about your work and ideals being mixed up with it. What ideals? Oh, that's a long story. I suppose all doctors ought to have ideals, really. Otherwise, I should think the work would be unbearable. Surely you're not encouraging me to talk shop. Do you come here every Thursday? Yes, I come down from Cherry and spend a day in the hospital. Stephen Lynn graduated with me. He's the chief physician down there. I take over from him once a week, and it gives him a chance to go up to London, and me a chance to study the patients. Is that an advantage? Of course. You see, I, I have a special pigeon. And what is it? Preventive medicine. Oh, I see. <laughs> no, I'm afraid you don't. I was trying to be intelligent. Most good doctors, especially when they're young, have private dreams. That's the best part of them. Sometimes, though, those get over-professionalised and strangulated and... Am I boring you? No. I don't quite understand, but you're not boring me. What I mean is this. All good doctors must be primarily enthusiasts. They must have, like... Writers and painters and priests, a sense of vocation, a deep-rooted, unsentimental desire to do good. Yes, I see that. Well, obviously one way of preventing disease is worth 50 ways of curing it. That's where my ideal comes in. Preventive medicine isn't anything to do with medicine at all, really. It's concerned with living conditions and common sense and hygiene. For instance, my speciality is pneumoconiosis. Oh, dear. Of tubular. It's simpler than it sounds. It's nothing but a slow process of fibrosis of the lung due to the inhalation of particles of dust. In the hospital here, there are splendid opportunities for observing cures and making notes because of the coal mines. You suddenly look much younger. Do I? Almost like a little boy. What made you say that? I don't know. Yes, I do. Tell me. Oh, no, I couldn't, really. You were saying about the coal mines. Yes. The inhalation of coal dust. That's one specific form of the diseases. It's called anthracosis. What are the others? Chalicosis. That comes from metal dust. Steelworks, you know. Yes, of course. Steelworks. And silicosis. Stone dust. That's gold mine. I see. There's your train. Yes. You mustn't miss it. No. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all. It's been so very nice. I've enjoyed my afternoon enormously. I'm so glad. So have I. I apologise for boring you with those long medical words. Oh, I feel dull and stupid not, not to be able to understand more. Shall I see you again? It's the other platform, isn't it? You'll have to run. 
Don't worry about me. Mine's due in a few minutes. Shall I see you again? Of course. Perhaps you could come over to Catchworth one Sunday. It's rather far, I know, but we should be delighted to see you. Please. Please. What is it? Next Thursday. The same time. No. I can't possibly. I... Please. I ask you most humbly. You'll miss your train. All right. Run. Goodbye. Alec, your hat. Thank you. I'll be there. Thank you, my dear. The train about to depart from platform four is the 540 for Charlie, Lee Green, and Langdon. All aboard! I'll be there. Resist it. I will trouble you to keep your hands to yourself. You're blushing. Coming in here, taking liberties. Ah, I didn't think it'd take to a friendly little slap after what you said last Monday. Never mind about <laughs> last Monday. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, don't be mad at me. It's just high spirits. Oh, oh high spirits indeed. I'm 21 today. I'm 21 today. Oh, such a noise. <laughs> they hear you on the platform. A pit. Are you? Upon my knee. Oh, my God, B. Deep you for two yourself. and a two for tea. Yeah, look, just take your tea and be quiet. Oh, it's all your fault anyway. I was thinking of tonight. If you don't behave yourself, there won't be a tonight or any other night either. I'm in the mood for love simply because you're near me. Will you hold your noise? Funny, but when you're near me, I'm in the mood for... Give us a kiss. Oh, I would do no such thing. I'm oh, just a quick one. Cross the couch. Stop it. Stop it. Come on, there's a light. Now, let go of me this minute. Oh, come on, just one. Aye, <laughs> aye. Oh. Oh. Look at me, Banbury's all over the floor. Look like I came in just in time. You shut your mouth and help Mr. Godfrey pick up the cake. Uh, anything to oblige. Good oh, good afternoon, Dr. Harvey. Two cheese, please. A cake or pastry? No, thank you. Just the tea. Uh, nice weather for October. Yeah. Uh, very nice. A bit of a nip in the air, though, the east wind. <laughs> uh. Stanley, what are you standing there gaping at? Where's Beryl? Oh, love's young dream. Never you mind about burial. You ought to be on platform four. Oh, there, there's been a run on the Cadbury's nut milk this afternoon. I'll need some more. Take six, then, and don't forget to mark them down. All oh, right, yo. It's all right about tonight, isn't it? I'll think about it. It's Claudette Colbert, you know. Oh, by chance, I shall get to enjoy Claudette Colbert with you hissing in my ear all the time. I'll be as good as gold. Uh -huh. We can't part like this. I think it would be better if we did. You don't really mean that. I'm trying to mean it. I'm trying with all my strength. Oh, my dearest dear. Don't, please don't. It's no use running away from the truth, darling. We're lovers, aren't we? <gasps> if it happens or if it doesn't, we're lovers in our hearts. Can't you see how wrong it is? How dreadfully wrong. I can see what's true, whether it's wrong or right. Mr. Saunders won't show Mr. Godby. What for? Never know. Well, I know he's a bloody fool. Be quiet, Albert. In front of burial. Oh, don't mind me. Well, go on. <coughs> right. I'll be back. That'll be nice, I'm sure. There's no chance of Stephen getting back to the flat until late. Nobody need ever know. It's so furtive to love like that. 
So cheap. Much better not to love at all. It's too late not to love at all. Be brave. Oh, what is there brave in it? Sneaking away to someone else's house, loving in secret. It'll be far braver to say goodbye and never see each other again. Could you be as brave as that? I know I couldn't. Couldn't you? Listen, my dear. This is something that's never happened to either of us before. We've loved before and been happy before, but this is different. Something lovely and strange and desperately difficult. It's too difficult. I'm lost. Don't say that, darling. Loving you is hard for me. It makes me a stranger in my own house. Familiar things, ordinary things that I've known for years, like the dining room curtains and the wooden tub with the silver top that holds the biscuits and a watercolour of San Remo that my mother painted look odd to me, as though they belonged to someone else. When I've just left you, when I go home, I'm more lonely than I've ever been before. I passed the house the other day without noticing and had to turn back. And when I went in, it seemed to draw away from me. My whole life seems to be drawing away from me. And, and I don't know what to do. Oh, darling. I love them just the same. Fred, I mean, and the children. But it's as though it wasn't me at all. As though I were looking on at somebody else. But do you know what I mean? Is it the same with you, or is it easier for men? It isn't any easier for me, darling. Honestly, it isn't. Oh, I know. I know. I pretend to hold you in my arms all the way back in the train. Oh. I'm angry with every moment that I'm not alone. To love you uninterrupted. Whenever my surgery door opens and a patient comes in, my heart jumps in case it might be you. Oh, how silly we are. How unbearably silly. Friday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday. It's all right, isn't it? Oh, yes. Of course it is. Don't pass the house again. Don't let it snub you. Go boldly in and stare that damned watercolour out of countenance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, afternoon, lady. Good afternoon. Oh, two whiskies, please. I'm very sorry. It's out of hours. Oh, come on, lady. Take me on a couple of soda, boys. Yes, I just think it's a couple. <laughs> Under cover of them poor old sandwiches. Them sandwiches were fresh this morning, and I shall do no such thing. Oh, come on. Be a soul. Oh, no, no. You're asking me to break the law, young man. Oh, I think I've got a cold coming up. Oh, oh, you can't afford to let the army catch a cold, uh, you know. You can have as much as you want after six o'clock. Oh, an oh. stone. That's what you've got, Lady in Arter Stone. Oh, don't you be cheeky. Our throat's like a parrot's cage. Listen. <laughs> May lessons <laughs> Does not permit me to serve you alcohol out of hours, and that is fine. We're soldiers, we are, willing to lay down our lives yeah, for you, right. and you grudge us a couple of splashes. You wouldn't want sure. to get me into trouble. Well, <laughs> give us a chance, lady. Let's all just give us a chance. Oh. Burial. <laughs> oh. Burial. <laughs> Ask Mr. Godfrey to come here for a moment, will you? Yes, Mrs. <laughs> Oh, who's he when he's home? You'll soon see he coming in here cheeking me. Now then, naughty, naughty. Oh, what about them drinks, lady? I've already told you I cannot serve alcoholic refreshments out of hours. Oh, come off it, Mother. Be a pal. I'll give you Mother, you saucy upstart. Oh, oh, who are you calling an upstart? <laughs> right. What's going on in here? Mr. Godby, these gentlemen are annoying me. Oh, well, we haven't done anything. All we did was ask for a couple of drinks. Off it, both of you. Oh, okay. We've got a much righter day You heard here. what I said. Up it. What, what is this? A free country or a bloody oh, Sunday school? Oh, strange due in a minute. Platform oh. two, up it. Look at that. Oh, come on, Johnny. Don't oh. argue with a poor little basket. Up it. Toodaloo, Mother. And if those sandwiches were made this morning, you're surely tempted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Albert. What a nerve talking to you, lot. Be quiet, Beryl. Pour me a nip of brandy. I'm feeling quite upset. I've got to get back to the gate. I'll be seeing you later, Albert. OK. Yeah. Here you are, Mrs. Baggett. Fine is three, star. Thank you, Perriel. Well, I'll, I'll make a start on those display shells, shall I? Mm. Oh. Oh, I say one thing for Albert Godby. He may be on the small side, but he's a gentleman. There's your train. 
I'm going to miss it. Please go. No. The train is now standing at platform four. I wish four. I could think clearly. I wish I could know, really know what to do. Everything's against us. All the circumstances of our lives, those have to go on unaltered. We're nice people, you and I, and we've got to go on being nice. Let's enclose this love of ours with real strength, and let that strength be that no one is hurt by it, except ourselves. Must we be hurt by it? Yes. When the time comes. Very well. All the furtiveness and the secrecy and the hole in the corner cheapness can be justified if only we're strong enough. Strong enough to keep it to ourselves. Something of our own. Forever. To be remembered. Very well. I'm going now. To Stephen's flat. I'll wait for you. If you don't come, I shall know only that you weren't quite ready. That you needed a little longer to find your own dear heart. This is the address. Oh, there's the 543. You know, we ought to have another Unky and Palmer's to put on the middle shelf, really. Well, I think there's some more in the bag. Have a look, would you, Beryl? Yes, yeah, you bag it. That fuel train, dear, isn't it? Yes, thank you. You're going to miss it. Oh, well, there's always the next one. I'll just clear away, shall I? No, not that, please. I need the piece of paper. An address. Oh, sorry, dear. So, I think we might be in for a white Christmas. Do you want me to wait? I've got to go straight back. Oh, why? Well, Mother will be waiting up. I'll be a sport, Beryl. Yeah, shut down five minutes early and say you was kept ten minutes late, and that gives us a quarter of an hour. What happens if Mrs. Baggett comes back? She won't. She's out having a bit of slap and tickle with her, Albert, eh? <laughs> <laughs> shh, shh. Stan, you are awful. Yeah, I'll wait for you in the yard. All right. Evening, miss. Glass of brandy, please. Well, it, it, it's ten to ten. We're just closing. I see you are, but you're not quite closed yet, are you? Three star. Yes, that'll do. Ten pence, please. Here. And have your piece of paper and an envelope. I, I'm afraid you'll have to get that at the bookstore. The bookstore shut, please. It's very important. Oh, all right, wait a minute. I should be so much obliged. Oh, here we are. Oh, thank you. Look, we close in a few minutes, you know. Yes, I know. If you need anything else, I'll be in the back. Thank you. My... My dearest... Sorry, but oh, oh, darling! No, please get away! Please don't say anything. I can't let you go like this. I feel so utterly degraded. It was just a beastly accident that Stephen came back early. He doesn't know who you are. He never even saw you. I listened to your voices in the sitting room. I crept out and down the stairs. Feeling like a prostitute. Oh, don't talk like that. Please. I suppose he laughed, didn't he? 
I suppose you spoke of me together as men of the world. We didn't speak of you. We spoke of a nameless creature who had no reality at all. Oh, why didn't you tell him the truth? Why didn't you say who I was and that we were lovers? Shameful, secret lovers who'd been using his flat for weeks because we had nowhere else to go. Why didn't you tell him that we were cheap and low and... Stop it, Laura. <gasps> Pull yourself together. It's true, don't you see? It's true. It's nothing of the sort. We know the truth. We know we really love each other. That's all that matters. It isn't all that matters. Self-respect matters. Decency matters. I can't go on any longer. <laughs> Could you really say goodbye? Not see me anymore? Yes. If you'd help me. I love you, Laura. I shall love you always until the end of my life. I can't look at you now because I know... I know that this is the beginning of the end. Not the end of my loving you. But the end of our being together. But not quite yet, darling. Please. Not quite yet. Very well. Not quite yet. I know what you feel. I know about the strain of our different lives, apart from each other. The feeling of guilt, too persistent. Perhaps too great a price to pay for the few hours of happiness we get out of it. I know all this because it's the same for me, too. You can look at me now. I'm all right. Let's prepare ourselves. A sudden break now, however brave and admirable, would be too cruel. We can't do such violence to our hearts and minds. Very well. I'm going away. Oh, I see. But not quite yet. And so after ten, I'm afraid I shall have to look up now. Of um, course, yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. Cigarette. Yes, please. Here. Promise me that however unhappy you are, you'll meet me next Thursday as usual. I'll hire a car and we'll drive out into the country. All right. I promise. We've got to talk. I've got to explain. About going away? Yes. Where are you going? Where can you go? You can't give up your practice. I've had a job offered me. I wasn't going to take it, but I must. I know it's the only way out. Where? A long way away. Johannesburg. Oh, God. There's my train. My brother's out there. They're opening a new hospital. They want me in it. It's a fine opportunity, really. I'll take Madeline and the boys... It's been torturing me for weeks. I haven't told anybody, not even Madeline. I couldn't bear the idea of leaving you. But now I see it's got to happen soon. Anyway. It's almost happening already. When will you go? In about two months. Oh, it's quite near, isn't it? Do you want me to stay? Do you want me to turn down the offer? Oh, don't be foolish. Sir. I'll do whatever you say. That's unkind of you, my darling. No. Oh, Laura, don't. Please don't. I love you. I love you. Not here. Someone will see. Someone. Oh. Mm. Mm. We knew we'd get hurt. I'm being very stupid. Oh. You're not angry with me, are you? No, I'm not angry. Forgive me. 
For what? For everything. For having met you in the first place. For taking the piece of grit out of your eye. <laughs> for loving you. For bringing you so much misery. I'll forgive you. If you'll forgive me. Good night, darling. Good night. See, please, three locks and a bath bun and make it snappy. What's the matter with you? Beryl Oppit. Don't you go all You heard Beryl me, Oppit. Beryl Oppit. <laughs> well, I'll <okay, huh? laughs> oh, Here's your tea. We're still on for the uh, pictures tonight, Myrtle. What is it? Broadway Melody of 1936. I've got preserved tickets. Oh, come in here when you get off and I'll make us a nice little supper in the back. Before we go. Oh, Myrtle. Oh, now, 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 Bert, you behave. We, we don't want the whole station laughing at us. Oh, what is that, a laugh at? Oh, <laughs> oh look out. Oh. Someone's coming in. Oh, it's only Romeo and Juliet. Shh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Same as usual. Yes, please. Quite springy out, isn't it? Yes, quite. You know what they say about March? In like a lamb, out like a lamb. <laughs> I want to help her finish your tea and get back to the game. Uh, I'll uh, see you tonight. Seven o'clock. <laughs> Are you all right, darling? Yes, I'm all right. I wish I could think of something to say. It doesn't matter. Not saying anything, I mean. I'll miss my train and wait to see you into yours. No. No, please don't. I'll come over to your platform with you. I'd rather. Very well. Do you think we shall ever see each other again? I don't know. Not for years, anyway. The children will be all grown up. I wonder if they'll ever meet and know each other. Couldn't I write to you? Just once in a while? No. We promised we wouldn't. Please know this. That you'll be with me for ages and ages yet. Far away into the future. Time will wear down the agony of not seeing you. And the memory of you won't ever go. Please know that. I know it. It's easier for me than you. I do realise that. I really do. I, at least, will have different shapes to look at. And new work to do. You have to go on among familiar things... My heart aches for you. I'll be all right. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want to die. If only I could die. If you died, you'd forget me. I want to be remembered. Yes, I know. I do, too. Goodbye, my dearest love. Goodbye, my dearest love. We've still got a few minutes. Thank God. Oh, Laura! What a lovely surprise! Oh, Dolly! My dear, I've been shopping till I'm dropping. <laughs> Sounds like a song, doesn't it? My throat's parched. I thought of having tea at Spindles, but I was terrified of losing the train. Oh, oh dear. This is Dr. Harvey. Oh. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? I, would you be a perfect dear and get me a cup of tea? <laughs> I don't think I could drag my old bones as far as the counter. <laughs> uh, here's sixpence. No, no, please. Oh. <laughs> my dear, what a nice-looking man. Who on earth is he? Oh, really, you're quite a dark horse. I shall telephone your husband in the morning and make mischief. <laughs> Oh, I've been meaning to pop in, but Tony's had measles, and I had all that fuss about Phyllis. But of course you don't know. She left me. 
Suddenly upped and went, my dear, without even an hour's warning, let alone a month's notice. And you'll never guess... Uh, oh, <laughs> I'll tell you all about it on the train. Ah, uh, thank you so much. Oh, they've certainly put enough milk in it. Uh, but still, it's wet, and that's really all one can ask for in a refreshment room. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Oh, no sugar. Oh. It's in the spoon. Oh, of course. Oh, what a fool I am. <laughs> well, Laura, you look frightfully well. Oh, I do wish I'd known you were coming in today. We could have come together and lunched and had a good gossip. I loathe shopping by myself. There's your train. Yes, I know. Hmm. Aren't you coming with us? No, I go in the opposite direction. My practice is in Cherry. How interesting. What sort of doctor are you? I mean, are you a specialist at anything or just a sort of general family doctor? I'm a general practitioner at the moment. <laughs> Dr. Harvey is going out to Africa next week. Oh, but my dear, how thrilling. Are you going to operate on the Zulus or something? <laughs> I always associate Africa with Zulus, but I may be quite wrong. <laughs> I must go. Yes, you must. Goodbye, Lord. Oh, he'll have to run. He's got to get right over to the other platform. How did you meet him? I got something in my eye one day. He took it out. My dear, how very romantic. I'm always getting things in my eye, and nobody the least bit attractive has ever paid the faintest attention. <laughs> Which reminds me... You know about Harry and Lucy Jenner, don't you, Laura? No, what about them? My dear, they're going to get a divorce. At least, I believe they're getting a, a, a conjugal separation or whatever, and the divorce later on. It seems that there's an awful missus somewhere or other in London. Friday, that he's been Saturday, out Saturday, for ages. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Goodbye. Dearest love. Goodbye. My dearest love. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want to die. If only I could die. Laura! Laura! Oh, excuse me. Can you tell me, is that the Ketchworth train? No, no, that's the boat train. The express. Oh, yes. Well, that doesn't stop, does it? Express trains are my son's passion in life. Oh, dear. I must not get his chocolate. Um, I, I want some chocolate, please. Milk or plain? Plain, I think. No, no, perhaps milk will be nicer. Have you any with nuts in it? Give me one plain and one milk. Laura? No, oh, where is she? Oh, I never noticed her go. Laura? I want to die. If only I could die. I want to die. If only I could die. I want to die. If only I could die. Thank you. train. I couldn't think where on earth you disappeared to. I just wanted to see the express go through. A sip of brandy would buck you up. No, no thank you. I'm all right. Really. Well, if you're sure. The train now standing at platform three is the 5.43 for Keshwa. Oh. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday.
in Still Life by Noel Coward, adapted by Malcolm McKee, Laura Jessen was played by Amanda Root, and Dr. Alec Harvey by John Dateen. Stephanie Cole played Myrtle Baggett, and Trevor Peacock, Albert. Beryl was Sonny Ormond, Stanley, Brian Parr, and Dolly Messeter was Josephine Tewson. The musical composition was by Malcolm McKee. Schofield plays Gary Essendine in this new production of Noel Coward's Present Laughter with Fenella Fielding, Miriam Margulies, Joy Parker, Patricia Routledge and David Timpson. Present Laughter. Hello, hello. Cynthia, darling, it's Daphne. Yes, are you alone? Listen, I'm... You know where? Yes, in Gary Essendine's flat. No, he isn't awake yet. There's nobody about at all. No, in the spare room. I've only just got up. I'm not dressed or anything. I can't go on about it now. Someone might come in. Yes, as soon as I'm dressed. In about an hour, I should think. Of course, I can't wait to tell you. All right. Oh, good morning. Good morning. What time is Mr. Essendine going to be called? He will ring. What time does he usually ring? Well, it depends what time he went to bed. If you are very late, he will probably sleep until the afternoon. Oh, dear. Couldn't you call him? Alas, no. We can never call him. Uh, well, do you think I could have some coffee or orange juice? I will see. Or something. Oh, dear. Whoops. Uh, excuse Don't me. Don't worry, Brad. Uh, good morning. Good morning, miss. I, uh, I suppose you are Mr. Essendine's uh, butler. Done it, miss. Name's Fred. Have you any idea what time Mr. Essendine get up? Well, might be any time. He didn't leave no note. Couldn't you call him? It's nearly 11 o'clock. Oh, the whole place goes up in smoke if we wake him by accident, let alone call him. Well, uh, do you think I could have some breakfast? Oh, well, now, what would you fancy? Some coffee, please, and some orange juice. righty oh, Miss. Morning, Miss Reed. Morning, Fred. Oh, good morning. Good morning. I'm Mr. Essendine's secretary. Is there anything I can do for you? Oh, well, I, I'm afraid it's rather awkward. Uh, you see, Mr. Essendine drove me home last night from a party, and I idiotically forgot my latchkey. Ah. Uh, and so Mr. Essendine very sweetly said I could spend the night here, uh, in the spare room. I see. And uh, now, I, I was wondering if somebody could tell Mr. Essendine that I'm, <laughs> well, uh, here. Uh, I, I don't want to go away without saying goodbye and thanking him. Have you known Mr. Essendine long? Uh, well, no, not exactly. Exactly. I, I mean, of course, I, I've known him for ages. I think he's wonderful, but we actually only met last night for the first time at Maureen Janet's party. I see. Uh, have you been with him for a long while? Just on 17 years. Oh, how wonderful. I expect you know him better than anybody. Less intimately than some, better than most. We talked for hours last night. He, he told me all about his early struggles. Mm -hmm. Did he by any chance mention that life was passing him by... Yes, I think he did say something like that. Oh, dear. Why? I just wondered. <laughs> well, I, I do hope you don't think it's awful, me staying the night here like this. I mean, it, it, it does look rather bad, doesn't it? Well, really, Miss... Uh, Stillington, uh, Daphne Stillington. Miss Stillington, that's hardly my business, is it? Uh, no, I suppose not, but I wouldn't like you to think... Seventeen that... years is a long time, Miss Stillington. I gave up that kind of thinking in the spring of 1922. Will you have breakfast in here, Miss, or in the spare room? Uh, in here, please. I really think you'd be more comfortable in the bedroom. The studio becomes rather active round about 11. People call you know, and the telephone rings. Uh, very well. I uh, let you know the minute he wakes up. Oh, thank you so much. Don't uh, mention it, miss. Oh, who's she, I wonder? Weren't you here last night? No, she's news to me. If he hasn't rung by 12, we'd better wake him. You know what happened last time? It can't be helped. He's got to lunch out anyhow. Well, if the balloon goes up, don't blame me. Whoops, Lord, here he is. I suppose it's no interest to either of you that I've been wakened from a deep, deep sleep. 
Why, everyone's screaming like banshees. What's going on? I've been talking to Miss Stillington. Who the hell is Miss Stillington? She's in the spare room. I didn't ask where she was, Monica. I asked who she was. We might look her up in the telephone book. She forgot her latchkey, if you know what I mean. Go away, Fred, and get me some coffee. Right here. And don't say right here. Oh, very good, sir. Oh, thank you very much. You met her at a party last night and brought her home here and told her about your early struggles and she stayed the night. Oh, I remember now. She's a darling and I'm mad about her. What did you say her name was? Stillington. Daphne Stillington. Uh, I knew it was Daphne, but I hadn't the faintest idea it was Stillington. How'd she look to you? Restive. Poor little thing. I hope you were sweet to her. Has anybody given her anything to eat? Fred's taken her some coffee and orange juice. What's she doing now? I don't know. Drinking it, I suppose. Oh, it's dreadful, isn't it? What are we to do? She wants to say goodbye to you and to thank you. Whatever for? That, Gary, dear, I am in no position to say. She's probably sobbing her heart out. Why don't you go and see? Lend me a comb, and I will. Here. What a deplorable-looking object. Good God, I look 98. Never mind. In two years from now, I shall be bald as a coot with rows of angry false teeth leering at me from a tumbler. Then perhaps she'll be sorry. On the contrary, I shall be delighted. There will be fewer eager, gently bred debutants ready to lose their latch keys for you when you've got a toupee perched on top of your head, and life will be a great deal simpler. I shall never wear a toupee, Monica, however bald I get. Perhaps on stage I might have a little front piece, but in life, never. I intend to grow old with distinction. I'm sure that'll be a great relief to all of us. Here's your sordid little comb. Now do go and do a nice goodbye scene, there's a dear, and get rid of her as quickly as possible. We've got to do the mail, and Morris might appear at any minute, and we can't have her littering up the place and getting in everybody's way. Oh, Gary, I thought I heard your voice. My dear. If you want me, I shall be in the office, Gary. Go along, Monica. You won't forget, will you, that at 12 sharp, Morris is coming to discuss what understudies you're going to take to Africa? No, Monica. And that at 12.30, you have given an appointment to Mr. Roland Moore. I shall remember, Monica. Ah, <laughs> darling. Gary, oh, Gary, I'm ridiculously happy. Oh, I'm so glad, darling. Are you? Happy? Hmm. There's something awfully sad about happiness, isn't there? What a funny thing to say. It wasn't meant to be funny. I've been in love with you for such a long time. Oh, don't. Don't say that. Why? What's the matter? Don't love me too much, Daphne. Promise me you won't. You'll only be unhappy. No good can come of loving anyone like me. I'm not worthy of it. Really, I'm not. You're more worthy of it than anyone in the world. Foolish child. I'm not a child. I'm 24. Ah, 24. <laughs> 24. If only I were younger. If only you were older. What does age matter when people love each other? I wonder how tragically often that's been said. Well, it's true. Look at me, Daphne. Look at me kindly, clearly and honestly. Look at the lines in my face, my thinning hair. Look at my eyes. You're not so very old. I didn't say I was so very old, Daphne. I merely said look at me. As a matter of fact, I'm only just 40. What's 40? Too old for 24. You mean you don't love me? I don't mean any such thing. But Gary, Listen, you just... my dear. You're not in love with me, the real me. You're in love with an illusion, the illusion that I gave you when you saw me on the stage. Last night I ran a terrible risk of breaking that dear young illusion forever, but I didn't, oh, thank God I didn't. It's still there. I can see it in your eyes, but never again. Never, never again. That's all I dare to hope for now. Moments like last night. That's why I'm so lonely sometimes, so desperately lonely. But I have learned one bitter lesson in my life, and that lesson is to be able to say goodbye. But Gary, Let me go on, dear. But I want to... Shh! We meet not as we parted. We feel more than all may see. My bosom is heavy-hearted, and thine full of doubt for me. One moment has bound the free. That moment has gone forever, like lightning that flashed and died. Like a snowflake upon the river, like a sunbeam upon the tide, which the dark shadows hide. But Gary, Be quiet for a minute, darling. That moment from time was singled as the first of a life of pain. The cup of its joy was mingled, delusion too sweet though vain, too sweet to be mine again. There now, that was Shelley. Don't you think it's beautiful? Yes, but Gary, There's I want to... nothing Shelley didn't know about love. Not a thing. All the sadness, all the joy, all the unbearable pain. Oh, Gary. 
don't, don't cry. Please, please don't cry. I can't bear it. But how can you say that I'm only in love with an illusion and not the real you at all? Because it's true. It isn't, it isn't. It was the real you last night. You weren't on the stage. You weren't acting. I was. I'm always acting, watching myself go by. That's what's so horrible. I see myself all the time eating, drinking, loving, suffering. Sometimes I think I'm going mad, mad. I could help you if you'd only let me. What, dear? I could help you if you'd only let me. If only you could. But it's too late. It isn't. I swear to you it isn't. You see, I'll prove it to you. You must get out of the tiresome habit of contradicting everything I say. It is too late. Listen, my dear. It isn't that I don't love you, I do. I knew it the first moment I took you in my arms last night. But you see, I'm not free, like other men, to take happiness when it comes to them. I belong to my public and to my work. In two weeks' time, I'm going to Africa with a repertory of six plays. And do you realize what that means? The work, the drudgery, the nerve strain. But that's my job. The one thing to which I must be faithful. When I come back, if I come back, I shall look at you again and I shall know in the first glance whether you've waited for me or not. Now, come here. Kiss me. Once, just once. And then go. Okay. You darling. Au revoir, my sweet. Not goodbye. Just au revoir. Uh, quarter past eleven. Come, dear. Way with melancholy. It's quarter past eleven. Hurry up and get dressed. Oh, Lord. Do you want your coffee here or upstairs? Anywhere, Fred. Anywhere. I put it anywhere within reason. I'd have brought it in to you, but I heard all the weeping and the wailing going on and thought perhaps I'd better not. Put the tray down, Fred, and go away. Oh, dear. <laughs> Fred said I was to go and speak to the young lady. Very well, Miss Erickson. What shall I say to her? I really don't know. I've been to the grocery. That's as good an opening gambit as any. Just see that she has everything she wants, Miss Erickson, and turn on a bath for her. At last, no, that I cannot do. The tap makes no water. Well, rise above the whole situation and do the best you can. Oh, I will try. Preserve that spirit of cheerful optimism, Miss Erickson. Ugh. Coffee tastes of curry powder. Never mind. I do mind. I wish I had a French chef instead of a Scandinavian spiritualist. You could never get rid of Miss Erickson. She worships you. Everybody worships me. It's nauseating. There's hell to pay if they don't. Hello? Mr. Essendine's secretary speaking? Oh, Tony. Hold on. He's just here. He wants to know what you thought of the play last night. I'll tell him. Morning, Tony. Thank you very much for the seats. They were most comfortable. No, Tony. No. Frankly, no. Now tell me, in a few brief phrases, what on earth persuaded you to coax poor old Laura from her merciful retirement? Oh, as I know, she has a certain attack. She also happens to be one of the few actresses living who can be dressed by Scaparelli and look as if she'd been upholstered by maples. And she has about as much sex appeal as a haddock. No, I haven't read them. I never read notices. That's insufferable. If they think ranting and roaring's good acting, I'm thankful I'm going to Africa. Uh, come round about six. Liz will be here. She gets back from Paris today. All right, goodbye. See you later. Is Miss Stillington dressed yet? Yes, but she is crying, which makes her slow. The bath was on the blink. You'd better go upstairs, Gary. Right. Miss Erickson, tell Fred Mr. Essendine wants his bath. Uh, I will tell him. Oh, hello. Oh, Henry. Yes. Yes, he's in, but he's gone to have his bath. Today? Well, I thought you weren't going until the end of the week. Yes, of course. He's not lunching until half past. All right, I'll tell him. Hello, Mr. Erickson. What's everybody in? Yes, I think so. Good morning, Monica, dear. Oh, Liz, darling. We thought you weren't coming back until tonight. I came over on the ferry, loaded with gifts oh. like an eastern potentate. Here's one for you. Oh, how lovely. It's a bottle of scent and very expensive. Oh, thanks so much, Liz. Oh, you are a darling. What's God up to? In the bath. I brought him a dressing gown. How thoughtful. He's only got 18. Don't be acid, Monica. You know he loves peacocking about in something new. It's nice and thin and highly suitable for Africa. <laughs> Miss Erickson looked more peculiar than ever this morning. 
Is her spiritualism getting worse? She got in touch with a dead friend at a séance on Sunday, and all he said was no, 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 and Christmas Day. It upset her very much. I do hope she won't get any dotty and do something awful. I don't think she will. Hers is quite a tranquil madness. Hello, Fred. How's everything? Bit of a lash up, miss. <laughs> Same as usual. It's very resolute of Fred to go on calling me Miss, isn't it? I think he has a sort of idea that when you gave up being Gary's wife, you automatically reverted to maidenhood. <laughs> it's a very pretty thought. <laughs> oh. Oh, Miss Stillington. Oh. There you are. I'm so sorry about the bath. Oh, it didn't matter a bit. This is Mrs. Essendine. Miss Stillington. How do you do? Oh, Mrs. Essendine? Do you mean, I, I mean, are you Gary's wife? Yes. Oh, I... I thought you were divorced. We never quite got round to it. Oh. Please, don't look agitated. I upped and left in years ago. Miss Stillington lost her latchkey oh. last night, so she spent the night in the spare room. Oh, you poor dear. You must have been absolutely congealed. Uh, 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 do, do you think I could get a taxi? I'll ring up for one. No, don't do that. My car's downstairs. It can take you wherever you want to go. Oh, that's most awfully kind of you. Not at all. The chauffeur's got bright red hair and his name's Frobisher. You can't miss him. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're sure it's not inconvenient? Not in the least. Just tell him to come straight back here after he's dropped you. Uh, oh, yes, uh, of course I will. Uh, thank you very much again. Not at all. Uh, go goodbye. I'll see you out. No, no, please. No trouble. No trouble at all. <laughs> Has that been going on long, Monica, or is it new? Quite new. I found it wandering about in Gary's pyjamas. Oh. Poor little thing. How awful for her to be faced with me like that. You ought to have pretended I was someone else. Serve her right. She ought to be ashamed of herself. She seemed to be what is known as a lady. It's very odd, isn't it? That type's particularly idiotic, and the woods are full of them. They go shambling about London without hats and making asses of themselves. Very discouraging. Well, I don't mind if only they'd leave Gary alone. It makes the morning so complicated. I think it's high time we all went for him again. If only out of consideration for Africa. I'll have a go at him. After all, he's turned 40 now. It's high time he relaxed. If you think a big scene's really necessary, we can get Henry and Morris, too, and have a real rouser the night before he sails. It's generally more effective when we all do it together. Morris is awfully hysterical these days, and Henry's not nearly so reliable since he married Joanna. Do you like her? Hmm. She's a lovely creature, but tricky. Yes, I think I like her all right. I don't. You never would, darling. She's not your cup of tea at all. Who isn't your cup of tea at all? Joanna. Oh, she's not bad. A bit predatory, perhaps, but then as far as I can see, everyone's predatory in one way or another. I shall give it up for Lent. Good morning, darling. Where's my present? On the piano. It's not another glass horse, is it, to go with Lord Baldwin? No, it's a dressing gown for Africa. A dressing gown, Monica, just what we wanted. Oh, oh it's absolutely charming. I'm mad about it. Oh, so beautifully austere. Don't say anything important for a minute. Ah, impeccable taste. Best possible colonial propaganda. Henry rang up. He's going to Brussels today, and he's coming in to see you before he goes. I think Morris is, too. Go away, then, Monica. I must talk to Gary before Morris gets here. It's important. You'd better hurry. Mr. Maul will be here in a minute. Who is Mr. Maul? Uh, you know perfectly well who he is. He's the young man who wrote that mad play, half in verse, and caught you on the telephone. You were so busy being attractive and unspoiled by your great success that you promised him an appointment. Monica, dear, it is your pride and pleasure to protect me from things like that. I can't possibly see him. You must see him. He's coming all the way from Uckfield, and it serves you right for snatching the telephone when I wasn't looking. I've noticed a great change in you lately, Monica. I don't know whether it's because you've stopped cramming yourself with potatoes or what it is, but you're getting nastier and nastier with every day that passes. Go away. I shall be in the office if you want me, Of course you'll be in the office, spinning awful plots and intrigues against me. I shouldn't wonder. I will if I can think of any. Oh, go away. Liz, do try and persuade him to have some electric treatments on his hair. It's getting terribly thick. Well, darling, ah, tell me all about everything. I saw the play. Uh-huh. Was it good? Yes, very. We shall have to change it a bit, but I don't want to go on about it until I've seen Morris after lunch. I told him I can't open until November. I must have a holiday after Africa, so there's lots of time. Now, I want to talk to you about something else. I don't like that tone at all. What's on your mind? You. Your general behaviour. Really, Liz? What have I done now? Who was that 
poor little creature I saw here this morning in evening dress. She'd lost her latchkey. They often do. Now, you listen to me, Liz. You're over 40, you know. Only just. And in my humble opinion, all this scampering about is rather undignified. Scampering about, indeed. You have a genius for putting things unpleasantly. I suppose you've been discussing all this with Monica Morrison Henry. I haven't yet, but I will, unless I see some sign of improvement. Blackmail, hey? You know how you hate it when we all make a concerted pounce? The thing that astonishes me in life is people's arrogance. Well, you're a fine one to talk about arrogance. It's fantastic. Look at you all, gossiping in corners, whispering behind your fans, telling me what to do and what not to do. It's downright sauce. That's what it is. And what happens if I relax my loving hold on any of you for one minute? Disaster. I happen to play a three-month season in New York. Henry immediately gets pneumonia, oh. goes to Biarritz to recover, meets Joanna, and marries her. Isn't all this a little beside the point? Certainly not. Twenty years ago, Henry put all his money into the Lost Cavalier, who played it for 18 months to capacity with extra matinees. I did. Who started his whole career as a producer in that play? Morris. And who... I wish you'd stop asking questions and answering them yourself. It makes me dizzy. Well, where, where would you all be without me? Where would Monica be now if I hadn't snatched her away from that revolting old aunt of hers and given her a job? With the revolting old aunt. And you, one of the most depressing, melancholy actresses on the English stage. Where would you be if I hadn't forced you to give up acting and start writing? The open air theatre, Regent's Park. Good. <laughs> God, I even had to marry you to do it. Yes, and a fine gesture that turned out to be. Well, I was in love with you for longer than anyone else, so you can't grumble. I never grumbled. I believe in going through any experience, however shattering. Nonsense. You adored it. You know you did. I still do, dear. You're so chivalrous, rubbing it in how dependent we all are on you for every breath we take. Well, I didn't say that. Anyhow, you're just as dependent on us now. We stop you being extravagant and buying houses every five minutes. We stopped you in the nick of time from playing Peer Gint. I still maintain that I should have been magnificent as Peer Gint. Above all, we stop you from overacting. You have now gone too far. I think you'd better go away somewhere. I've only just come back. Monica! Monica! What on earth's the matter? Monica, have you, or have you not, ever seen me overact? Frequently. That's a conspiracy. I knew it. As a matter of fact, you're overacting now. Very well. I give in. You're all against me. It doesn't matter how much I'm wounded and insulted. It doesn't matter that my timorous belief in myself should be subtly undermined. Your belief in yourself is about as timorous as Napoleon's. And look what happened to him. He died, forsaken and alone, on a beastly little island in the middle of the sea. <laughs> Islands have that in common. Now, about Morris. What about Morris? What's wrong? I'm not definitely sure that anything is, really, but I've heard things. Oh, what sort of thing? I think you're going to have to do a little of your famous finger-wagging. It's Joanna. Joanna? Apparently, Morris is in love with her. Morris and Joanna? He must be mad. Is Henry suspected? I don't think so. But then he never would, would he, unless it was shoved under his nose? But never to marry her in the first place. I always said it was a grave mistake. You can't introduce stereotype diamond-studded sirens into a closely-knit group like us without asking for trouble. I don't think she's as stereotyped as all that. Really? But she's dangerous, all right. Oh, but really, it's too tiresome. Just as I'm going away and everything. Might bust up the whole business. Yeah, if Henry finds out, it certainly will. What are we to do? You'd better, first of all, find out from Morris whether it's true or not. And if it is, how far it's gone. Then read the riot act and get him away somewhere. Take him to Africa with you, anything. Oh, there's that beastly young man from Uckfield. And here am I, trembling like a leaf. I can't face him. I know I can't. It may not be the young man at all. It may be Morris. Oh, to hell with Morris. To hell with everybody. Oh, don't be idiotic. You know as well as I do that if there's any truth in this Joanna business, it'll land us all in the most sordid complications and probably wreck everything. You've got to find out. And if you don't, I shall. He won't tell you a thing. He'll only get into a rage and ask you to mind your own business. I shall be in until 1.15. Telephone me when he's gone. He won't go. I'm lunching with him. I can't give you a detailed report of his love life over the telephone with him sitting here. Dial my number by mistake and just say, I'm so sorry it's the wrong number. Then I shall know. What will you know? That everything's all right. But if you say, I'm so terribly sorry it's the wrong number, 
I'll know that everything's all wrong and be round in a flash to back you up. Intrigue! My whole life is enmeshed in intrigue! Have you got that clear? Will you promise to do it? All right. The front doorbell, Miss Erickson, yeah. has been pealing incessantly for 28 minutes. Oh, that's yes. Why, Mr. Maul, I'm expecting... Oh, yeah. Mr. Maul! Ah! How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> this is my wife, Mr. Maul. Uh, she just popped in for a moment and is now about to pop out again. Oh, how do you do? I know you have an appointment with Gary, and I wouldn't dream of interrupting you, so I'll say goodbye. Goodbye. Remember, Gary, I shall be sitting by the telephone. I'm so sorry it's the wrong number. All right. I'm so terribly sorry it's the wrong number. All wrong. Bye. Do sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you. A cigarette? <laughs> no, thank you. Don't you smoke? No. Oh. Would you like a drink? No, thank you. Oh. Tell me, how old are you? Twenty-five. Why? It doesn't really matter, I just wondered. How old are you? Oh, uh, before in December. <laughs> ah, Jupiter, you know. <laughs> Very energetic. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so, of course. <laughs> you've, uh, you've come all the way from Uckfield. It isn't very far. I know, but it sort of sounds far, doesn't it? It's quite near Lewis. Oh, there's nothing to worry about then, is there? Now, I must talk to you about your play. I expect you hated it. Well, uh, to be candid, I did think it was a little uneven. I thought you'd say that. I'm glad I'm running so true to form. Well, I mean, it really isn't the sort of thing you would like, is it? In that case, why on earth did you send it to me? I just took a chance. I mean, I know you only play rather trashy stuff as a rule, but I thought you just might like to have a shot at something deeper. What is there in your play, Mr. Moore, that you consider so deep, apart from the plot, which is completely submerged after the first four pages. <laughs> Plots aren't important. It's ideas that matter. Uh, look at Chekhov. In addition to ideas, I think we might concede Chekhov a certain flimsy sense of psychology, don't you? You mean my play isn't psychologically accurate? It isn't very good, you know. Really, it isn't. I think it's very good indeed. I understand that perfectly, but you must admit that my opinion, based on a lifelong experience of the theatre, might be the right one. <laughs> the commercial theatre. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. I suppose you'll say that Shakespeare wrote for the commercial theatre and, and the only point in doing anything with the drama at all is to make money. All those old arguments. What you don't realise is that the theatre of the future is the theatre of ideas. That may be, but at the moment I am occupied with the theatre of the present. <laughs> what do you do with it? Every play you appear in is exactly the same. Superficial, frivolous, without the slightest intellectual significance. You have a great following and a strong personality, and all you do is prostitute yourself every night of your life. All you do with your talent is wear dressing gowns and make witty remarks when you might be really helping people, making them think, making them feel. There can be no two opinions about it. I'm having a most discouraging morning. If you want to live in people's memories to go down to posterity as an important man, you'd better do something about it quickly. There isn't a moment to be lost. I don't give a hoot about posterity. Why should I worry about what people think of me when I'm dead as a doornail anyway? My worst defect is that I'm too apt to worry about what people think of me when I'm alive. But I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm changing my methods, and you are my first experiment. Sit down. As a rule, when insufferable young beginners have the impertinence to criticize me, I dismiss the whole thing lightly because I'm embarrassed for them and consider it not quite fair game to puncture their inflated egos too sharply. But this time, my highbrow young friend, you're going to get it in the neck. To begin with, your play is not a play at all. It is a meaningless jumble of adolescent pseudo-intellectual poppycock. Oh, uh, oh. It bears no relation to the theatre or to life or to anything, and you yourself wouldn't be here at this moment if I hadn't been bloody fool enough to pick up the telephone when my secretary wasn't looking. Now that you are here, however, I would like to tell you this. If you wish to become a playwright, you leave the theatre of tomorrow to take care of itself. Go and get yourself a job as a butler in a repertory company, if they'll have you. 
learn from the ground up how plays are constructed, what is actable and what isn't, then sit down and write at least 20 plays, one after the other, and if you can manage to get the 21st produced for a Sunday night performance, you'll be damn lucky. I had no idea you were like this. You're wonderful. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm awfully sorry if you think I was impertinent just now, but I'm awfully glad, too, because if I hadn't been, you wouldn't have got angry, oh. and if you hadn't got angry, I shouldn't have known what you're really like. You don't in the least know what I'm really oh, like. Oh, yes, I do, now. I can't say it matters, anyhow. Oh, it matters to me. What do you mean? Do you really want to know? What are you talking about? Well, uh, it's rather difficult to explain, really. What is rather difficult to explain? What I feel about you. Now, my dear young man... No, 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 please, let me speak. You see, in a way, I've been rather unhappy about you for quite a long time. Oh. You've been a sort of obsession with me. I saw you in your last play 47 times. One week I came every night in the pit because I was up in town trying to pass an exam. Did you pass it? No, I didn't. I'm not entirely surprised. My father wants me to be a lawyer. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. That's what the exam was for. But actually, I've been studying psychology a great deal because somehow I felt that I wasn't at peace with myself. Imagine. Then gradually, bit by bit, I began to realize that you signified something to me. What sort of something? I don't quite know. Uh, not yet. You know that not yet? It's one of the most sinister remarks I've ever heard. Oh, don't laugh at me, please. I'm always sick if anyone laughs at me. Forgive me, but you know you really are a most peculiar young man. I'm all right now, though. I think I shall be able to sublimate you all right. S sublimate me? Yes. Then I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to go away and start now. I'm expecting my manager, and we have some business to discuss. Oh, well, that's all right. I'm going immediately. Shall I get you your script? Oh, oh no. <laughs> Tear it up. You were quite right about it. It was only written with part of myself. I see that now. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. Monica! Monica! Gone. If ever that young man rings up again, get rid of him at all costs. He's as mad as a hatter. What did he do? He started by insulting me and finished by sublimating oh, me. Oh, dear, you look quite shattered. I am. Have a glass of sherry. Those are the first kind words I've heard this morning. I think I'll have a nip, too. <sighs> There's Morris. Here you are. Thank you. What time is it? Uh, Twenty to one. I'll let him in. Oh, there's a strange young man sitting on the stairs. What's he doing, Henry? Crying. What have you been up to, Gary? I haven't been up to anything. I merely told him what I thought of his play. Oh, I'm glad to see you haven't lost your touch. Sherry Morris? Oh, thanks. Henry? Is it the same sherry you always have? Yes. No, thanks. Why not? What's the matter with it? Nothing much. It's just not very nice. You ought never to have joined the Athenaeum, Henry. It was disastrous. I don't really see why. It made you pompous. It can't have. I've always been too frightened to go into it. Ugh. Well, Henry's quite right about the sherry. It's disgusting. If anybody complains about anything else, I shall go out of my mind. This studio has been like a wailing wall all morning. Hello. What's the matter with the old boy, Monica? He seems remarkably crotchety. Well, Liz went for him a bit, and then I told him he overacted. <laughs> he really has had rather a beastly time. Mm. And then that dotty young man on top of everything. Well, never mind, Gary. God's in his heaven. All's right with the world. I've got some lovely news for you. What? Nora Fenwick can't come to Africa. Why not? She's broken her leg. Well, really. How does silly bitch do it? She fell down at Victoria Station. She had no right to be at Victoria Station. Who can we get? Morris wants Beryl Willard, but I don't think Morris wants who? Beryl Willard. Does he? So Morris wants Beryl Willard. Why not? She's extremely competent. Oh, I agree. I quite agree. Beryl Willard is extremely competent. Beryl Willard has been extremely competent man and boy for 40 years. Oh, now, Gary. In addition to her extreme competence, she has contrived with uncanny skill to sustain a spotless reputation for being the most paralyzing, epoch-making, monumental, world-shattering, god-awful, Bore that ever drew breath. What he's trying to say is that he doesn't care for Beryl Willard. All right, she's out. Whom do you suggest? Uh, just a moment. If you're going to start one of those casting arguments, I'm going. I've got to catch a plane for Brussels. I just want to let you know that you can't have the Mayfair Theatre for the French play in the autumn. Why not? Because Robert's got it for the whole season, starting in September. 
Why did you let him? You knew I wanted it. The forum is very much nicer and the capacity is bigger. It's a conspiracy. You both of you have been trying to get me into that underheated morgue for years. It's being done up and redecorated. It'll have to be rebuilt brick by brick before I set foot in it. Oh, arrange it later, will you, Morris? He's obviously in one of his states this morning. I can't stop now. What are you going to Brussels for, anyhow? Business. Nice, ordinary, straightforward business. Nothing to do with the theatre at all. I can't wait to get there. Goodbye, sweetie. Try to be a little more amiable when I come back. Oh. Uh, goodbye, Monica. Goodbye, Henry. Uh, goodbye, Morris. Oh, Morris, by the way, you might ring up Joanna. She's all alone. Oh, I have. Uh, I'm taking her to the opening at His Majesty's tomorrow night. Fine. Goodbye. Goodbye. Do you want me anymore? Why? What are you going to do? I'm going to write to Beryl Willard and ask her to come and live with you. <laughs> so, Morris, you're taking Joanna to the opening at His Majesty's tomorrow, are you? Yes. Why? Oh, Morris. What the devil's the matter? You like Joanna, don't you? Well, yes, of course I do. She's a darling. I wouldn't describe her as a darling, exactly, but then I don't see very much of her. I'd rather gather that you do. What are you getting at? People are beginning to talk, Maurice. What about? About you and Joanna. Oh, rubbish. Perfectly true, and you know it. I don't know anything of the sort. You in love with her? <laughs> no, of course I'm not. Do you swear to me that you haven't had an affair with her? Mind your own business. Good God, if this isn't my business, nothing is. If you're fooling about with Joanna on the side and Henry finds out, do you realise what it'll mean? I refuse to go on with this conversation. You can refuse until you're blue in the face. You're going to listen to me. I've no intention of submitting to one of your famous finger-wagging tirades. I'm sick to death of them. I'm not going to ask you any more questions. I am, however, going to make you see one thing clearly, and it's this. You, Henry, Monica, Liz, and I share something of inestimable importance to all of us. And that something is mutual respect and trust. God knows it's been hard won. Here we are, five people, closely woven together by affection and work and intimate knowledge of each other. It's too important a set-up to risk breaking for any outside emotion or reason whatsoever. Joanna is alien to us. She doesn't really belong to us. She never could. Henry realises that perfectly well. He's nobody's fool, and to do him justice, he's never tried to force her on us. But don't you believe for one moment that Joanna isn't a potential danger? Because she is. She's 100% female, exceedingly attractive, and ruthlessly implacable in the pursuit of anything she wants. If she could succeed in wrecking havoc among all of us, I'm quite certain she would leave no stone unturned. She's a scalp hunter, that baby, if ever I saw one. And all I implore you is this, be careful. But I haven't the least intention of... You need to say anything now, but be careful. Is that clear? Quite. Good. Oh, oh, good heavens, it's after one. I uh, forgot to ring for a table. Well, there's no need, we can always go upstairs. No, we can't. Upstairs smells of potted shrimps. It might take a minute to bring up. Um, oh, uh, I'm so sorry, it's the wrong number. <laughs> oh, how foolish of me. <laughs> I'm always doing that lately. Hello. Oh, Liz. Uh, no, I've been in about half an hour. Yes, dear, quite alone. I'm turning over a new leaf. Hadn't you heard? Yes, with both of them. I went to supper with them at the Savoy afterwards, and Morris and I dropped her home. No, I didn't go on about it any more. I thought it wise and hard. You sound a bit sceptical. No, as a matter of fact, she was very charming. She's quite intelligent, you know, and I must say she's a permanent pleasure to the eye. <laughs> All right. No, I've got to lunch with Tony. Very well, about eleven. Yes, of course I'm going straight to bed with a book. Good night, darling. Same to you. Be good. Well, bed, I think. Damn, who on earth's that? Joanna! Gary! Oh, I can't tell you how relieved I am that you're in. I've done the most idiotic thing. Why? Whatever's happened? I've forgotten my latch key. Oh, Joanna. Oh, oh, don't look at me like that. I'm not in the least inefficient to the rule. This is the first time I've ever done such a thing in my life. I'm in an absolute fury. 
I had to dress in the most awful rush to dine with Frida and go to the Toscanini concert. I left it in my other bag. And I suppose the servants all sleep at the top of the house? They do more than sleep. They apparently go off into a coma. I've been battering on the door for nearly half an hour. <laughs> Would you like a drink? Oh, very much indeed. I'm exhausted. We must decide what is best to be done. I went to a call box and rang up Liz, but she must be out because there wasn't a reply. Oh, you rang up Liz and there wasn't a reply. Hmm. Thank you. As I hadn't any more coppers and the taxi man hadn't either, I came straight here. Cigarette? Thank you. <laughs> you are looking very whimsical. Don't you believe me? Of course I believe you, Joanna. After all, why on earth shouldn't I? I don't know. You always look at me as if you didn't trust me an inch. It's a shame, you know, because I'm so nice, really. I'm sure you are, Joanna. I know that voice, Gary. You've used it in every play you've ever been in. Complete naturalness on the stage is my strong suit. You've never really liked me, have you? No. <laughs> Not particularly. I wonder why. I always had a feeling you were rather tiresome. In what way tiresome? Oh, I don't know. There's a certain arrogance about you, a little too much self-assurance. You don't care for competition, I see. You're lovely looking, of course. I always thought that. Thank you. If perhaps a little too aware of it. Oh, I wish you'd stop being suave, just for a minute. What would you like me to do, fly into a tantrum, burst into tears? I think I should like you to be kind. Kind? Yes. At least, kind enough to make an effort to overcome your perfectly obvious prejudice against me. I'm sorry, it's so obvious. I'm not quite an idiot, although I must say you always treat me as if I were. Now, I know you resented my marrying Henry, you all did. And I entirely see why you should have, anyhow, at first. But after all, that's five years ago. During that time, I've done my best not to obtrude myself, not to encroach on any special preserves. My reward has been rather meagre, from you particularly. Nothing but artificial politeness and a slightly frigid tolerance. Oh, poor, poor Joanna. I see my appeal has fallen on stony ground. I'm so sorry. Well, what shall we do now? Oh. Is there a necessity to do anything? Well, my social sense tells me that something is demanded, but for the life of me, I can't think what it is. There's always the radio. Oh, oh no. Not here, there isn't. I'm so glad I'm adult. You must be pretty shattering to the young and inexperienced. Is that a subtle allusion to my charm? You glitter so brightly. You're so gaily caparisoned. All the little bells tinkling. I sound like a circus horse. Well, you are rather like a circus horse, as a matter of fact. Prancing into the ring to be admired, jumping with such assurance through all the paper hoops. You know, Joanna, dear, you really must make up your mind. This provocative skirmishing is getting me down. What do you want? I want you to be what I believe you really are, friendly and genuine, someone to be trusted. I want you to do me the honour of stopping your eternal performance just for a little. Ring down the curtain, take off your makeup and relax. I was right about you from the first. Were you? Yes, you're as predatory as hell. Gary. You got poor wretched Henry when he was convalescent, you made a dead set at Morris, and now, by God, you're after me. Don't deny it, I can see it in your eye. You suddenly appear out of the night, reeking with the lust of conquest. The whole atmosphere is quivering with it. You had your hair done today, didn't you? And your nails. Probably your feet, too. That's a new dress, those are new shoes. And your mind even more expertly groomed to vanquish than your body. Every word, every phrase, every change of mood cunningly planned, just the right amount of sex antagonism mixed with subtle flattery, just the right switch over perfectly timed from provocative implication to wistful diffidence. You want to know what I'm really like, don't you, under all the glittering veneer? 
Well, this is it. This is what I'm really like, fundamentally honest. When I'm driven into a corner, I tell the truth. And the truth at the moment is that I know you, Joanna. I know what you're after. I can see through every trick. Go away and leave me alone. <laughs> Curtain. Oh. <laughs> darling, darling. How dare you call me darling? I think you are a darling. I always have. Will you please go away immediately? <laughs> you're really the reason I married Henry. Are there no depths to which you will not descend? Absolutely none. I'm in love with you. I've been in love with you for over seven years now, and it's high time something was done about this it. This is the end. No, my sweet, only the beginning. Listen to me, Joanna. I think you'd better listen to me first. You shall do no such thing. No, you must. It's terribly important to us all. Please sit down. I'd rather walk about, if you don't mind. Sit down. Dear, sweet Gary, please sit down. You must concentrate. Things aren't nearly as bad as they look. I've got to explain, and I can't if you're worrying about it all the this time. This is dreadful, dreadful. Now, first of all, I want you to promise to answer me one question absolutely truthfully, will you? What is it? Will you promise? Yes, all right. Go on. If you had never seen me in your life before, if we'd met for the first time tonight, if I were in no way concerned with anyone you know, would you have made love to me? Would you have wanted me? Yes. Well, that's that. Now... Look here, Joanna. No, shut up. Now, you must be fair. You must let me explain. When I said just now that you were really the reason I married Henry, that was only partly true. Now, I'm devoted to Henry. Much fonder of him than he is of me. Oh, he was madly in love with me for the first two years, but he isn't now. You stood between us. Not only in my heart, but his. He hated your thinly veiled disapproval of me. And it gradually strangled his love for me. That's the worst of people like you, with your damn dominant personalities. You not only affect people when they're actually with you, but when they're away from you as well. Henry has been rightly unfaithful to me 11 times, to my certain knowledge, during the last three years. He's probably having a high old time in Brussels at this very moment. You're lying, Joanna. I'm not lying. I don't mind enough to lie. Henry's a Darling, I wouldn't leave him for anything in the world. We get on perfectly. Much better now, really, than we did before. But you're the one I'm in love with and always have been. Now, I don't want to live with you, God forbid. You drive me mad in a week. But you are, to me, the most charming, infuriating, passionately attractive man that I've ever known in all my life. What about Morris? Morris? That was so idiotic. He was only a step nearer you. Is he in love with you? Has there been anything between you? Of course there hasn't. He's very sweet, but he doesn't attract me in the least and never could. Do you swear that? There's no need for me to swear it. You can see, can't you? And even if you can't see, you must at least be able to feel that what I'm saying is true. We're neither of us exactly adolescent. We both know enough by experience that when our instincts are pushing us with all their force in one direction, that it's foolish and painful to rush off into another. Are you sure it's so foolish? It's the most foolish thing in the world to store up regrets. Who could you and I possibly harm by loving each other for a little? Please, may I get up now? Yes. How was the Toscanini concert? Glorious. He played the eighth and the seventh. Personally, I prefer the fifth. I like the ninth best of all. There's nothing like the dear old ninth. I love the Queen's Hall, don't you? So uncompromising. I love... The Albert Hall. Much, much more. I wonder why. I always find it depressing. Not when they're doing Hawatha, surely. Even then. I won't hear one word against the Albert Hall.
morning. Good morning. Is Mr. Essendine awake yet? He has not run. I wonder if you'd be very kind and tell him that I am awake. Unless no, he would be crazy with anger. Would he indeed? I should be crazy with anger myself unless I have some breakfast. Been ringing that bell in there for hours. It does not work. Oddly enough, that dawned on me after a while. It is the mice. They eat right through the wires. They're very destructive. Good morning, miss. Good morning. Oh, dear. I beg your pardon. You're Mrs. Lippiat, aren't you? Yes, I am. Sure. What do you know? That, I gather, was Mr. Essendine's valet. Does he always behave like that? He was a steward on a very large ship. Most of the ship stewards I've met have got good manners. He's the only one I know. I would like some china tea, some thin toast without butter, and a soft-boiled egg, please. We have no china tea and no eggs either, but I will make the toast with pleasure. Have you any coffee? Yes, we have coffee. Then kindly bring me some as quickly as you can. I will tell Fred. And as he was on such a very large ship, perhaps he could do something about the tap in that bathroom. And as he was not a bathroom steward. Good morning, Miss Lee. Good morning, Miss Erickson. Good morning, Monica. Joanna, thank heaven you've come. I've had such a complicated chat with that housekeeper. Did you stay here last night? Yes. Wasn't well, it sweet of Gary to let me? I did the most idiotic thing. I lost my latchkey. You lost your latchkey? I was in a dreadful state, and then I suddenly thought of Gary. Suddenly thought of Gary. Why do you keep repeating everything I say? I don't know. It seems easier than saying anything else. Why, Monica... You actually look as though you disapproved of my staying the night here. I think it was tactless, to say the least of it. I haven't said why. It was a perfectly natural thing to do in the circumstances. I always knew it. Always knew what? That you'd cause trouble. Oh, there's someone at the door. You'd better go back in the spare room. I'm quite happy here, thank you. Just as you please. Good morning, Monica. Hello, Liz. I'm so glad you've come. Joanna's here. Oh, is she? Good morning, Joanna. This is a surprise. Liz, darling, I tried to get you for hours last night. I'd lost my latchkey and was in the most awful state. But you weren't in. I was in from ten o'clock onwards. You must have been ringing the wrong number. I rang the number you gave me. Then I must have given you the wrong number. I shall be in the office if you want me, Liz. Poor thing. She's aged so terribly since I last saw her. So she's mad about Gary, like all of us. All of us, Joanna? I must say, he is enchanting. We had the most lovely talk last night. I think it would be better if neither Morris nor Henry knew you stayed the night here, Joanna. Good heavens, why? Henry wouldn't mind a bit. I wouldn't be too sure of that if I were you. Anyhow, Morris would. Morris? What's it got to do with Morris? Oh, really, Joanna? I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Now, listen to me. I know perfectly well that you have been unfaithful to Henry with Morris, so you needn't trouble to deny it any further. It's a most abominable lie. Unfortunately, I dined quietly with Morris last night upstairs at the Ivy. He was very upset and became rather hysterical, as you know he sometimes does. And he told me everything. So he told you everything, did he? Well, it's quite natural that he should. After all, we're very old friends, you know, all of us. How dare he discuss me with you, or with anyone. Oh, don't be silly, Joanna. A charming constellation of gossipy little planets circling round the great, glorious sun. I was coming to that. What do you mean? I don't want to know anything about what happened last night, but I'll tell you one thing. The great, glorious sun is not going to get tangled up in this if I can stop it. And I can. You mean... You mean you'd be low enough to tell Gary? Yes, and Morris, and Henry. I'll tell them all, unless you do as I say. And what if I don't? You'll be out, my dear, with all of us for good. With Gary most of all, quite soon. And you wouldn't like that, you know. It would be very shaming to your vanity. You're very sure. Absolutely positive. I know Gary very well, you know. After all, I've had every opportunity. But you ever left him? For him, yes, I think it is. Why should you imagine that I should mind so terribly if I were... Out with all of you, as you put it. Principally because you made such a terrific effort to get in. Now, are you going to be sensible and do what I ask you or not? You haven't asked me anything yet. I want you to promise me that you won't see Gary again before he goes to Africa. I'm bound to see him again. How can I avoid it? You can be ill. You can go to Paris, anywhere. I've no intention of doing any such thing. Very well. It'll be you breaking everything up, not me. That'll be Morris. He told me last night he was coming to see Gary at 11. 
Look here, Liz. I'm glad, really. It'll be more convenient. Well, I, I can't face him. You'll be too unpleasant. I'll do as you say. You swear it? You swear you won't see him again? You'll go away? Yes, 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 I swear Well, it. quickly, go into the spare room. Don't come out until I tell you. Yes. It's, um, it's a Mr. Maul. He says he's got an appointment. A Mr. Who? Maul. He looks a bit wet to me. Oh, dear. Oh, well, I suppose you'd better show him in. Miss Reed can deal with him. I'll tell her. Right here, Miss. Monica! Monica! What is it? Uh, Mr. Maul is here. He's no right to be. He's raving mad. Mr. Maul. Oh, uh, good morning. Good morning. We met before, do you remember? Yes, very well. <laughs> Just the other day. Yes. Have you an appointment with Mr. Essendine? Oh, yes, indeed. I uh, spoke to him last night on the telephone. He told me I was to come at 10.30. I fear I'm a little late. I'm afraid you can't possibly see him just at the moment. Could you come back later? Isn't there anywhere I could wait? Oh, oh go into the office for a moment, and I'll find out when Mr. Essendine will see you. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Uh, oughtn't I to have let him in? Oh, I don't know. He says Mr. Gary told him to come, although I hardly believe he did. You'd better go and wake him up and ask him. No, Monica. Don't wake Gary yet. I'd rather he slept on for a bit. All right, Fred, we'll call him later. It's all the same to me. Now listen, Monica. I've guaranteed that neither you nor I will say a word to Henry or Morris or anybody about her being here if she swears not to see Gary again before he goes to Africa. And did she? Yes, she did. But Morris will be here at any minute, and it's going to be awkward. There's a telephone in the spare room, isn't there? Yes. Is it the same number as this, or different? Well, it's the private line. This one is an extension from the office. Mm, what's the number? You know it, the private line. Sloan 2642. Here he is. Leave oh. this to me. I'll explain later. Right ho. Oh, if you wouldn't mind waiting, sir, he's uh, still asleep. Oh, no, he isn't. He's coming downstairs. <laughs> Gary, where are you going? Out. Out where? Just out. Suppose I can go out if I want to, can't I? Well, I never even knew you was up. You are a dark horse and no mistake. Don't be impertinent, Fred, and go away. All right, all right. The, the gentleman's in the office and the lady's in the spare room. If you happen to want either of them. What's he talking about? The man's office rocker. Lady? No, really, Gary, you're impossible. Who is it? I would be so very, very much obliged if everybody would mind their own goddamn business. For heaven's sake, get rid of her. I've got to talk to you. I, I'm in a bad way. What's the matter? But get rid of her first, whoever she is. She's, she's probably got her ear clamped to the keyhole. How can I get rid of her? She may be in the bar. Well, tell her to hurry, then. Now, look here, Morris. But if you won't, I will. I forbid you to go near that room. Morris, Morris! Uh, will you come out, please? I, as soon as you can. Idiot! I'm coming. Huh? I was only just powdering my nose. Liz, it's you. Of course. Who did you think it was? Oh, what on earth were you making such a fuss about, Gary? I make fuss. Don't know what you mean. Why are you so completely dressed so very suddenly? You were asleep a few minutes ago. Oh, no, I wasn't. And what's more, I most gravely doubt whether I shall ever sleep again. Perhaps your conscience was troubling you. I cannot for the life of me imagine why everybody is so absolutely beastly to me. I'm bullied and cross-questioned, ordered about from morning to night. I can't wait to get to Africa, to be away from a lot of you. It won't exactly be unrelieved sadness for us. Oh, for God's sake, stop bickering, both of you. I am in the most terrible state. Why? What about? Well, Liz knows. I told her last night. What does Liz know? What did you tell her last night? Pull yourself together, Morris. Have a drink or something. You'll try not to be sick. I don't want a drink. If I have a drink, it'll make it much worse. It always does. This is the most fascinating little conversation, but I must say I should appreciate the full flavour of it more if I had the faintest inkling as to what it was all about. I haven't slept for three nights, Gary, ever since you talked to me the other morning. Oh, dear. Why not? It's bad enough getting one of my awful obsessions. You know what I'm like when I get an obsession. God knows you've helped me through enough of them, but... Uh, this time I, I've made an utter fool of myself, and I've lied to you into the bargain. Lied to me? What do you mean? Joanna and I love each other, Gary. It's been going on for months, but we made a pact that we'd lie about it to everyone, whatever happened, in order not to make an awful fuss and upset everyone. But I'm not used to lying to you. I never have before, and it's been absolutely driving me mad ever since. Yesterday afternoon I couldn't bear it any longer, and I told Joanna I was going to tell you. She was furious, and she said she'd never speak to me again if I did, and went away and left me. I've been trying to find her ever since. She's disappeared. Her servant says she hasn't been home all night. I'm so terrified something's happened to her. Perhaps it has. Oh, you don't like her, Liz. You never did. 
Well, I'm not sure that I do, really, but I love her. You needn't fuss any more, Morris. Joanna spent the night with me. Spent the night with you? Yes, on the sofa. She lost her latchkey. No. She's there now. I told her I'd tell you to ring her up if I saw you. I'll go round now. Oh, you'd better ring up first and see if she's still there. She may have gone out. I'll get the number for you. Oh, cool. thanks, Liz. Thank you very much. Hello? Maggie? Is Mrs. Lippiat still there? All right. Here you are, Morris. Oh, thank you. Hello? Hello, Joanna? Gary, you are a terrible fool. Uh, yes, yes, it's me, Morris. I've been terribly worried about you. Why didn't you tell me you were with Liz? How'd you get her out? She's huh? not out. She's in the spare room on the other line. Ah, ah, well, I thought something had happened to you. Well, yes, I'm at the studio. No, no, only Liz and Gary. Yes, I have. I had to. Oh, how can you be so cruel? L listen, Joanna. Look, I, I must see you. Joanna! She she's hung up. Serve you right. Look, I must see her. I must see her. What am I to do, Liz? Control yourself and don't be hysterical. I'm going to Liz's flat now. You're not. You're coming with me. Coming with you? Where to? Hampstead Heath. Oh, it's cruel and heartless of you to try to be funny at a moment like this when you know I'm utterly miserable. I'm not trying to be funny. What's the matter with Hampstead Heath? Be quiet, Gary. Listen, Morris. It really would be better if you didn't try and see Joanna in your present state. Have a drink and calm down. For goodness sake, Liz, stop flogging everyone into dipsomania. You can see her later in the day. I'm surrounded with lies and intrigue and sickening emotionalism, and I tell you here and now, I'm not going to put up with it for a minute longer. My whole life is spent trying to help people and giving them wise, kindly advice and trying to shield them from the buffets of fate, and what's the result? They batten on me. They drain every ounce of vitality out of me. And then expect me to go tramping back and forth all over darkest Africa in order to make money for them. Money, money, money. That's all they think about. And when I'm weltering in my last moments in some malarial swamp, all you'll be saying is 10%, 10%, 10%. What happens if I try to snatch a little happiness for myself? A little gaiety, a little relaxation. I'm at once accused of being immoral and undignified and letting down my position. Position, indeed. And I have no more position than a little frightened beetle. Cringing away into the shadows, trying frantically to hide away from the blinding, merciless light of criticism. Did you or did you not give an appointment to Roland Moore this morning? What? Did you or did you not give an appointment to Roland Moore? I most emphatically did not. He terrifies the life out of me. Well, he's here. I'm afraid I told a wicked lie oh. about the appointment, but I had to see you. It was very important. Mr. Maul, you promised to stay in the office. Yes, but I wanted to tell you that it's all right. What's all right? About what I felt about you. I've got the whole thing straightened out. I'm absolutely delighted, and I congratulate you from the bottom of my heart, but you really must go away now. Oh, please go now, Mr. Moore. Mr. Essendine is in the middle of a conference. Like hell he is. Oh, oh there's somebody at the door. Oh, Miss Erickson, Fred, there's somebody at the door. I have the remotest idea who it is, but I strongly suspect he's a mad cripple from soap purges who's passionately in love with me. <laughs> well, I'd better go and let him in. Mr. Moore, I really do think it would be better if you could come back oh, later. Couldn't I stay a little longer? You see, every moment I'm near him, I get smoother and smoother and smoother. My whole rhythm improves tremendously. Oh, where's Joanna? She's disappeared. I thought you weren't coming back till tomorrow. She hasn't been home all night. Nobody knows where she is. It's all right, Henry. She stayed with me. But I... No, if you don't believe me, ring her up. Monica, get my flat on the telephone. You know the number. Yes, I do. Oh, thank you, Monica, if you would. How do you do? My name's Roland Maul. What? Uh, how do you do? Roland Maul. I don't think we've met. Please go away, Mr. Maul. Hello, Joanna? Hold on a minute. Henry wants to speak to you. Yes. Yes, he's here. In the studio. Thank you. Oh, darling. Oh, darling, you gave me the most awful fright. Oh. No, I oh. got through everything yesterday and there was no sense in staying, so I... But I sent a telegram. No, I, I couldn't think what had happened. Yes, yes, we're all here. No, I think I shall have to lunch with Morris. There's uh, some difficulty about a theatre for Gary for his play in the autumn. Will you be coming back to the house? 
All right, darling, I'll tell her. Uh, she says she's going out in a minute. Oh, tell her to stay where she is. I'll pop in and see her presently. Liz says, do stay where you are. She'll be around presently. What? Joanna? Huh? She's hung up. Uh, there's a Lady Saltburn outside, Miss Reed. She says she has an appointment for 11.30. Lady who? Good heavens, what's today? Black Thursday. Thursday? I'd completely forgotten. Lady Saltburn's niece. You promised to give her an audition and recommend her to the RADA or something. Do you remember? No, I most certainly do not. She must be sent away immediately. We can't send Lady Saltburn away. She gave us fifty pounds for the footlights fund. <laughs> I am in no condition to listen to people's nieces this morning. I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown as it is. Why? What's happened? Too much, Henry. Far, far too much. You must see her. It won't take a minute. It would be most terribly rude not to, after all you promised. Fred, ask her in. Right here, Miss. It's all very exciting, isn't it? Uh, we, we, we'd better go. I'll come back later, Gary. Liz, Henry? Yes, all right. Uh, we'll go round to Liz's flat and talk to Joanna. It's, it's only just round the corner. No, no, um, I must go to the office and you must come too. It's urgent. Lady Saltburn, Miss Daphne Stillington. Oh, no. Thank you, Monica, dear. You're a great comfort to me. Oh, Mr. Essendine, this is so charming of you. Not at all. It's a pleasure. Uh, this is my niece, Daphne. I believe you knew her mother years ago. She died, you know, in Africa. In Africa? I've been longing to meet you, Mr. Essendine. I've loved everything you've ever done. What a charming tribute. Oh, Daphne simply wouldn't give me any peace until I had rung up your secretary and absolutely implored her for an appointment... She's so tremendously keen, you know. Oh, she must be. I must introduce you to everybody. My wife, Lady Saltburn, my secretary, Miss Reed. Oh, how do you do? You were so kind on the telephone. And these two vivacious figures are Mr. Lippiat in blue. How do you do? And Mr. Dixon in grey. How do you do? Mr. Maul in yellow. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? This is quite a peep behind the scenes, isn't it, Daphne, dear? This is the most thrilling moment of my life, Miss Dressendine. I've always wondered what you'd be like close to... Uh, please excuse us. We really must go. Yeah. How sad. Goodbye. Uh, Liz? I'll come later. Uh, all right. Uh, good, good, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Lady Sorbonne. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Moore. I'm staying, too. Won't you sit down, Lady Sorbonne? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Are you ready, Daphne? You know how busy Mr. Essendine is. I'm sure it's very sweet of him to see us at all. We mustn't impose on him. Uh, yes, I'm ready. What are you going to do, sing? Uh, no, I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to say a, a few lines. Say a few lines. Would you like to stand on anything? Uh, no. Sit on anything? Uh, no. Glass of water? No, thank you. Far away. <laughs> we meet not as we parted. I knew it. We feel more than all may see. My bosom is heavy-hearted, and thine full of doubt for me. One moment has bound the free. That moment has gone forever, like lightning that flashed and died, like a... A, a snowflake, dear. A, a snowflake upon the river, like a sunbeam upon the tide, which the dark shadows hide. That moment from time was singlet. Singlet? Very good. Never heard that before. As the first of a life of pain, the top of its joy was mingled. Even better, mingled. Delusion too sweet, though vain. Too sweet to be mine again. Very good indeed. <laughs> Bare room is like a frigid air. Joe, and I have no intention of staying in it one moment longer. Will somebody kindly call me a taxi? You'd better take my car, Joanna. It's downstairs. The chauffeur's got red hair, and his name's Frobisher. Oh, Daphne. Thank you very much. I shan't see you again, Gary. I'm going to Paris tomorrow for a month, so this is goodbye. I do hope that when you go to Africa, you'll be wise enough to take all your staunch, loyal satellites with you. It's too dangerous for a little tinsel star to go twinkling off alone and unprotected. Please don't imagine that I haven't enjoyed the circus enormously. I have. But in the circuses I've been used to, it was always the ringmaster who cracked the whip, not the clowns. Goodbye. 
Oh, she's splendid. Oh, Daphne. Daphne, Daphne. Oh, this is splendid. Splendid. I feel reborn. Oh, go to hell. Is everything packed, Monica? Yes. I must be going home now, Gary. Oh, Monica, don't leave me. I feel depressed. Just now you were screaming for peace. I'll be here first thing in the morning. I wish you were coming with me. I shall be utterly lost with some dreary temporary African. Is Liz coming to the station? No. Why don't you go round and see her? You know perfectly well. She's still in a rage. I haven't seen her for a week. Have you tried? Of course I have. I've telephoned her three times. Each time she spoke to me kindly and remotely as though an idiot child. I'm not sure she didn't spell some of the words out for me. Would you like me to have a go at her? Certainly not. If she wishes to behave like an outraged mother superior with chill blames, let her get on with it. I do see her point. You really did go a little too far. For heaven's sake, don't you start on me too. I've got enough to put up with. By the way, you'd better be careful of the telephone rings. Roland Maul has been calling up all the week. I should welcome even him tonight. At least he'd be interesting psychologically. So would Rasputin. Oh, I feel dreadfully flat. Oh. I suppose everybody feels flat when they're going away. It's your own fault that you're alone, you know. You refused all offers. You pleaded for a few hours' solitude and said you'd throw yourself out of the window if you didn't get it and that then we should all be sorry. I wonder if I shall ever see England again. I, I see myself under a mosquito net, fighting for breath. Who with? You have no imagination, Monica. Just a flat, literal mind. Must be very depressing for you. Now, now, now. You're getting a big boy, you know. You'll be 42 next birthday. Just fancy. 41 next birthday. Just fancy. <laughs> Good night, darling. I do envy you, Monica. You're so serene and unruffled. You go churning through life like some frightening old warship. Thank you, darling. That sounds most attractive. Good night. <sighs> Have one more drink. No, thanks. I really must be getting home. Good night. Going away now, Mr. Essendine. Have you everything you want? Frankly, Miss Erickson, no, I have nothing that I want. Oh, what a pity. Have you? Have any of us what we want? Oh, Mr. Essendine, you're only acting. For a moment I was quite upset. You lead a very strange life. Miss Erickson, do you enjoy it? Oh, yes, indeed. Tell me all about it, from A to Z. Where are you going now, for instance? I am going to my friend in Hammersmith. She is a German. Is she a spy? Yes, I think so, but she is very kind. I understand from Fred that she's also a medium. Oh, dear, yes. Sometimes she makes a trance. It's very surprising. She will lie on the ground for many hours making noises. What sort of noises? They're different. Sometimes she sings high up like a bird. Other times she may make a little bark. Often she is very ill. I'm not surprised. Oh, well, I must be pushing off now, Mr. Essendine. Push away, Miss Erickson. It's been most interesting. Thank you very much. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Hello, it's me. Daphne. Really, Daphne, dear, how very sweet of you to think of coming to say goodbye. But I haven't come to say goodbye. What do you mean? I'm coming with you. I bought my ticket this afternoon. You what? I've run away. I left a note for my aunt. You see, I know something now. I've known it all the week, really, ever since that awful morning when I fainted, when that dreadful prostitute came out of the spare room in that tawdry evening gown. That was no prostitute, Daphne. That was the wife of one of my dearest friends. Oh, never mind. I know that you need me now as I need you. Now, Daphne, dear, this is really too absurd. You must go home at once. Oh, I knew you would say that. Please, put on your hat again and don't be silly. I know you better than you think I do. I know when you're acting and when you're not. You're acting now. I'm not doing any such thing. I'm speaking to you with the utmost sincerity of which I'm capable when I order you to put on your hat, get into a taxi, and go back to your aunt. No, you needn't be frightened. I won't make any demands on you, whatever. I don't want you to marry me or anything like that. I'll just be there when you want me, when you're tired and lonely and want someone to put their arms around you. 
I won't even see you on the boat if you don't want me to. I'm not a very good sailor, anyhow. Not a very good sailor. There's somebody at the door. Oh, who is it? How do I know? You'd better wait in the spare room. No, Gary, please, not the spare room. All right, the office, then. Only go quickly. Oh, we'll get rid of them soon. Promise whoever it is. Here, don't leave your hat. Oh. In you go. Quiet as a mouse now. I must see no. you. No, no, oh, no. Mr. Ball. No, 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 no. I'm afraid you can't. I'm going to bed. It's a matter of life and death. I'm afraid I must insist. Come back, come back. What the hell do you mean by forcing yourself into my house like this? That's right. Shout. You're magnificent when you're angry. I'll tell you something, young man. You're just raving bloody mad. That's what's the matter with you. Please leave this house immediately. I'm afraid I can't. It's quite impossible. I've burnt my boats. Burnt your what? Boats. Now, look here, Mr. Moore. You may call me Roland. Well, uh, Roland, I want to put this to you sensibly and calmly. This is my last night in England, and I have a great deal to do. You said just now that you were going to bed. Be that <laughs> as it may, Roland, I would still I like... I know you think I'm mad, and I really don't blame you a bit, but I assure you I'm not at all. After all, there's no valid reason, is there, why I shouldn't be acting being mad, just as you're acting being sane. I'm not acting! Oh, you are always acting. That is what's so fascinating, and you're so used to it, you don't realise it yourself. I am always acting, too. I've been acting being mad with you because it amuses me to see you put on a surprised face. I'm absolutely devoted to your face in every mood. I suppose you wouldn't consider acting getting the hell out of here, would you? <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh, what exactly do you want? To be with you. That's why I'm coming to Africa. That's why you're what? I bought my ticket this morning. It's only steerage, but that's better than a poke in the air with a burnt stick. <laughs> I've given up my law studies and left Uckfield for good. And that's why I'm rather excitable tonight. You needn't be frightened that I shall get in your way or, or make any demands on you. Oh, you mean you don't expect me to marry you? There's somebody at the door. Now, please be a good boy and go away, will you? Please don't send me away. You're too great a person to be unkind. Let me stay with you. I can protect you from a whole lot of things you know nothing about. Such as? Yourself. All your dangerous vibrations. I won't let you send me away. You'll regret it your whole life long if you do. I'll wait in the spare room. Mr. Moore, come out of that room immediately. Don't be such a bloody fool. Roland. Roland, dear. Oh, my God, who the hell is that? Joanna! Hello, darling. What's the meaning of this, Joanna? Don't you know? Yes, I know. You're coming to Africa with me. You bought your ticket this afternoon. You're not going to make any demands on me. And you're not a good sailor. I'm a perfect sailor. What are you doing? Telephoning. Henry. Henry? Oh. Hello? Uh, I'm so terribly, terribly, terribly sorry. It's the wrong number. Yes. No good doing that anyway. He's not in. It doesn't matter now. Under this rather taut, strained manner of yours, deep down inside, aren't you just a little bit glad to see me? Absolutely delighted. It'll settle things once and for all. That's what I thought. When did you get back from Paris? This afternoon. Did you get my telegram saying goodbye? Yes, Monica read it out to me. Good, I meant her to. I thought you were going to stay for a month. No, you didn't. You knew perfectly well I wouldn't be able to. I must say I tried for the first few days to put you out of my mind, railed against you. Then I remembered. What did you remember? I remembered what you said to me the other night. You said no matter what comes after this, what circumstances combine against us, what tears are shed, this is magic, the loveliest magic that I've ever known. That is from the second act of Love is So Simple. Yes, I recognized it. I saw the play several times, you know. In that case, why on earth do you believe it? I didn't. But the fact of your saying it proved something to me. It proved that you are no more sincere emotionally than I am. That you no longer need the pangs of love, but are willing to settle for the fun of love. I couldn't agree with you more. That, to date, is the most immoral statement I've ever heard in my life. It's true, though, isn't it? No, it's not. No need to be tested, darling. How dare you, Joanna? It's women like you who undermine the whole integrity of civilization. What's that out of? It's not out of anything. As I told you the other night... I've always wanted you. I've always known instinctively that we were right for each other. You need me. The people around you are no longer enough. 
I need you. You're the first man I've ever met who's worthy of my steel. I can't guarantee that we shall be domestically happy together, but we'll have a good time. Well, I'll be damned. You were quite right when you said just now, with remarkable clairvoyance, that I was coming to Africa with you. I am. I've got the bridal suite. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was all they had left. <laughs> oh, my God. And I've written a note to Henry explaining everything. He's dining with Morris at the Athenaeum. They can read it together. <laughs> oh, who's that? With any luck, it's the Lord Chamberlain. Gary? Ah, Liz, come along in. Hello, Joanna. Liz, darling, how nice you look. Thank you so much. I do my best. I think it's only fair to tell you. I'm sailing with Gary tomorrow. What fun! So am I. What, dear? I decided this afternoon. It's certainly a big day for the Union Castle line. If I may say so, Liz, I think that's rather silly of you. I really don't see why. It'll be charming. We can all eat together at the same table and do our lifeboat drill together. I think it's only fair to warn you that Joanna has written a little note to Henry and Morris explaining everything. Good. Then they'll probably be coming too. And I should like to take this opportunity of cutting my throat from ear to ear. Nonsense, darling. You'll enjoy the voyage enormously. There won't be a dull moment. You think you're being very clever, Liz, don't you? For a woman of your experience, Joanna... You're being a trifle obtuse. It's very important for all of us that this African tour of Gary's should be a success. Obviously, there's no way of preventing you coming if you want to. But you'd better realise it before it's too late that from the social and publicity angle, you will be there as a friend of mine. I'll give you just two guesses as to who that is. A gathering of the clan. I'll go, Gary. Perhaps I was wrong about you after all. You haven't got the guts of a rabbit. I'm very glad I haven't. I'm sure they'd be extremely inadequate. Is it true? That's all I want to know. Is it true? False friend. False friend. Come, come, Morris. You're not in the Athenaeum now. It's no good trying to be flippant. This is a miserable, disgusting situation, and you know it. A stab in the back. That's what it is. A low-down stab in the back. Not too low-down, I hope. I've had a note from Joanna. She says that you've been lovers and that you're going away together tomorrow. Is that true? Perfectly true. Answer me, Gary. I'll tell you what's true and what's not true, and you can stop bouncing up and down like a rubber ball and listen. Be careful, Gary. Careful? I've been a damn sight too careful with a lot of you for years. Have you or have you not been Joanna's lover? Yes, I have. You miserable cat. You shut up. Joanna, you came here the other night determined to get me, didn't you? And you were plausible and superficially alluring enough to succeed. You certainly aroused my curiosity very cleverly, but it takes more than cleverness to touch either my heart or my mind. You haven't got a heart or a mind. You haven't got one decent instinct in you. You're morally unstable and false through and through. But the love of God, stop being theatrical. Oh, dear. Look here, Henry. It's high time you and I got down to brass tacks. You're taking up a very high and mighty attitude over this, but if you'll trouble and look at the facts, honestly, for one minute, you'll find that you don't mind as much as you think you do. No. Oh. Morris is the one who minds for the moment. Morris? What do you mean? Oh, Gary, that was disgraceful of you. Disgraceful, my foot. I'm sick of everybody lying and intriguing and acting all over the place. All right, Gary, you win. I wouldn't have thought anyone could sink so low. fiddle dee What did you mean about Morris? Answer me. I mean that Morris and Joanna have been carrying on an abortive little ding-dong under your silly nose for months. I'll never speak to you again until the day I die. Well, we can have a nice little chat then, can't we? Morris, Joanna, is this true? Of course it's uh, true. Uh, and mind you, it hasn't lasted quite so long as your rather dreary little affair with Dora Radcliffe. That's been hiccuping along for nearly a year now. Henry! And don't you pretend that you didn't know, Joanna. You were absolutely uh, delighted it gave you room to expand. Uh, I told you that in the deepest confidence. How could you be so vile as to betray it? I'm sick to death of being stuffed with everybody's confidences. I'm bulging with them. You, all of you, come to me over and over again and pour your damn tears and emotions and sentiment over me until I'm wet through. You all behave just as badly as I do, really, in many ways a great deal worse. You believe in your lacrimose, amorous hangovers. I at least have the grace to take mine lightly. You, Henry, wallow. And I laugh because I believe now, and I have always believed, that there is far too much damn nonsense talked about sex. You, Morris, love taking your paltry attachments seriously. That's your way of enjoying yourself. Henry's technique is a little different. He plumps for the domestic blend. 
That's why he got tired of Joanna so quickly. Anyway, he's perfectly suited with poor Vera. She's been knee-deep in pasture ever since she left Rodine. Joanna is different again. She devotes a great deal of time to sex, not for the intrinsic pleasure of it, oh, 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 oh no, merely as a means to an end. She is a collector, a go-getter, an unscrupulous, attractive pirate. Personally, I'm none of these things. To me, the whole thing's vastly overrated, and always has been. I enjoy it for what it's worth, and what's more, I fully intend to go on doing so for as long as anybody's interested. And when the time comes that they're not, I shall be perfectly content to settle down with an apple and a good book. Well, I'll be damned. Of all the brazen, arrogant sophistry I've ever listened to, that takes the prize for all time. You have the nerve to work yourself up into a state of moral indignation about us when we all know... I have not worked myself up into anything. I'm merely defending my right to speak the truth for once. Truth? <laughs> you wouldn't recognize the truth if you saw it. You spend your whole life attitudinizing and posturing and showing off. And where would you all be if I didn't? I should like to know. I suppose you'll be telling me next it's your restraining influence that's maintained me as an idol of the public for 20 years. You're not the idol of the public. L look what happened to you in Pity the Blind. I was magnificent in Pity the Blind. Yes, for 10 days. 11. If it hadn't been for us, he'd have done Pierre Gint. If anybody else so much as mentions Pierre Gint in my house again, I swear before the bar of heaven I shall produce it at Drury Lane. Well, you won't produce it on my money. This has been a disgusting, degrading scene. If it wasn't for the fact that Morris and I signed the contract for the Forum Theatre this morning, we should, both of us, wash our hands of you forever. What? What? Now, Gary, for heaven's sake. I'm sick of this idiotic performance. I'm going. Do you hear me, all of you? I'm going for good. Take my car. It's downstairs. Mm. This has been a great evening for speaking the truth, hasn't it? Well, I should like to add just one little contribution to the entertainment before I leave. I consider you, Mr. Gary Essendine, to be not only an overbearing, affected egomaniac, but the most unmitigated cad it has ever been my misfortune to meet. And I most devoutly hope that I shall never set eyes on you again as long as I live. Do you mean to tell me, Henry, that you signed a contract for that theatre when I particularly told you that no power on God's earth would induce me to set foot in it? Now, look here, I Daddy. will not look there. No, no, no. This is nothing more or less than the most outrageous betrayal of faith, and I'm deeply, deeply angry. Listen, Gary, as I told you the other day, they're doing up the whole theatre, reseating the orchestra floor, which will put over a hundred on the capacity. There you are. Money, money, money. In addition, they're simply mad to have you there and have even consented to put a shower bath in your dressing room. I don't care if they put a swimming bath in my dressing room and a squash court and a Steinway grand, I will not play a light French comedy to an auditorium that looks like a gothic edition of Wembley Stadium. No, no, no. It won't look like that, darling. I've seen the designs. They're very good. So you've seen the designs. So you're in this too. Traitress, traitress. Really, Gary, I promise you. Go away. Go away, all of you. I can bear no more. I have to face that dreadful sea voyage tomorrow. And then those agonizing months of drudgery across the length and breadth of what is admitted to be the most sinister continent there is. Please, 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 all of you go. Parasites, parasites, vultures waiting to claw the flesh from my bones. For 20 years I've given you everything. I gave you my youth. Where is my youth today? Sent whistling down the wind. I gave you my vitality. Where is my vitality drained out of me? And now when I'm nothing but a husk, an empty shell... I'm to be sent out to die in the white man's grave. Oh, oh. Go on, both of you. I'll talk to him. Ah, that performance wouldn't deceive a kitten. He's losing his grip. Come on, Henry. It's a pity they're pulling down the Lyceum. They're not. Oh, I feel quite exhausted. You're not really coming to Africa with me, are you? Certainly I am, and not only to Africa. I'm coming back to you for good. Liz, darling, I don't want you to come back to me. I'm perfectly happy as I am. That can't be helped. You behave abominably anyway, but you won't be able to be quite so bad with me there. Liz, I implore you not to come back to me. Have you no sympathy, no heart? I'm thinking of the good of the firm. Oh, that reminds me. I must leave a note in the office for Monica. The office? My God! What's the matter? Daphne's in there. Who's in there? Shh, 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 Daphne. 
and rolling balls in the spare room. You've got a sofa in your flat, haven't you? Of course. Why? You're not coming back to me, Liz, dear. I'm coming back to you. That was Paul Schofield as Gary Essendine in Noel Coward's Present Laughter. Joy Parker played Liz Essendine, Patricia Routledge, Monica Reed, and Fenella Fielding, Joanna Lippiot. Alan Rowe played Henry Lippiot, Vernon Joyner, Morris Dixon, Miriam Margulies, Daphne Stillington, Betty Huntley Wright, Lady Saltburn, Timothy Bateson, Fred, Diana Olson, Miss Erickson, and David Timpson, Roland Moore. Present Laughter was adapted for radio and produced by Ian Cottrell. Relative Values by Noel Coward It's 2.30 on a Saturday afternoon in July 1951. And just at the very end of the film, he realises that she is the one he's loved all along. And they walk up hill together, hand in hand, and the music gets louder and louder. Thank you, Alice. Oh. I shan't have to see her now, shall I? Oh, she's lovely, Mr. Cresswell. Really, she is. Well, you must have seen her in something. I've got better things to do with my spare time than to sit in the Odeon sucking sweets and gaping at a lot of nonsense. Now, come on, pass me that tree. Love is my religion is on a deal all this week. It's one of her early ones, but it's gorgeous. She's this nun, you see. Which nun? The one that gets captured by the Japanese. Uh, get on with emptying these ashtrays, or we shall all be captured by the Japanese. And they do the most terrible things to her, but she won't tell where he is. Well, who is? Well, Don Lucas. Get on with your work, Alice. They'll be in in a minute. They're in love with one another in real life, her and Don Lucas. I read about it in one of Never the mind who she's in love with and who she isn't. It's no business of yours. And don't believe what you read in these movie magazines either. It's all a pack of lies, cooked up from press, silly girls like you. Hello, Dora. What's me lady lost now? The, uh, the list for the church plate. She wants to show it to Lady Hailing. I put it in her bag myself this morning. Can Maureen come up and help with the tea tomorrow afternoon, Mr. Cresswell? Help with the tea? What on earth for? Well, I could lend her a cap and apron. No one would notice. Two years ago, Alice, your sister Maureen was offered the job you've got now, wasn't she? Yes, Mr. Cresswell. And she turned up her nose at it because she said domestic service was common, isn't that so? Yes, Mr. Cresswell. Why then should this fastidious girl suddenly wish to don the garb of slavery? Well, I always Has she said to herself, I know that they are short-handed at Marshwood on account of Amy having to visit her granny in Canterbury and May being in bed with shingles. Oh, stop talking nonsense. You're keeping Alice from her work. Or has she said to herself, for the sake of Mr. Crestwell, who is rapidly going balmy, I will sacrifice my naughty pride and spring gladly into the breach? I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Crestwell. The answer, I... Alice, is no. The answer, Alice, is that your sister, like so many of her contemporaries, is a filmstruck, good-for-nothing little fathead. And all that she wants to help with the tea for is to get a close-up view of Miss Miranda Frail and probably ask her for her autograph. <laughs> and I tell you solemnly here and now that if she gets it, it will be over my dead body. Run along now, Alice. You've been standing about quite long enough. Oh, yes, Mrs. Moxton. And take these glasses with you. Yes, Mr. Cresswell. Oh. Now, what is the yeah. sense of talking to the girl like that? She doesn't understand half, you say. That is a cross I've learned to bear with fortitude, Dora. No one understands half of what I say. Then save your breath and say less. What's the matter with you? You've been snapping everybody's head off for the last three days. Oh, here it is. What's up? Nothing's up. Oh, I must take this in. Her ladyship's waiting for it. Ever since the news came, you've been behaving like a tragedy queen. I mean, it can't matter to you all that much. It does matter to me. It matters to us all. No, you can't believe these movie magazines, you know. I don't read movie magazines. Oh, yes, you do. I saw three of them in your room only last week. What were you doing in my room? Well, you asked me to fetch your work basket. 
and with my inherent chivalry, which all the disruptive forces of social revolution have been powerless to destroy, I nipped up three flights and got it for you. I didn't ask you to go poking and prying about. Your work basket, Dora, was on the table by your bed. Beside it was three magazines. On the cover of one of them was a full-page photograph, in colour, of the future Countess of Marshwood in a two-piece bathing suit, <laughs> being warmly embraced by a gentleman in a one-piece bathing suit. Well, Alice must have left them there when she was doing the room. I <laughs> accept your unconvincing explanation. Well, well, I suppose it's only natural that I should want to see what the new mistress of the house looked like. Uh, this unwitting bit of espionage on my part took place last week, Dora, before any of us had the slightest idea that his lordship intended to marry again. I'm surprised at you, I really am. <laughs> You've been with this family longer than I have, and you don't seem to mind this, this, this terrible thing one bit. All you do is make jokes about it. Oh, why couldn't he pick someone of his own class? Class? Dear, I've forgotten what that word means. Well, you may have forgotten what it means. I haven't. Ah, that, Dora, is an admission of defeat. It proves that you have willfully deafened yourself to the clarion call of progress. What happened to your early dreams and ambitions? What happened to your divine discontent? I wish you'd stop trying to be funny for one moment. Oh, don't take it so hard. It may not be as bad as you think. I mean, look at it philosophically and hope for the best. <laughs> That's what her ladyship's trying to do. She's had Lady Hailing nagging at her all through lunch. She kept on trying to change the subject, but it was no use. Her ladyship is just as upset as we are well, inside. Has she said so? No, she has not, but I can tell. All right. All right. Miss Miranda Frail may not be all that common. I mean, she's English-born anyhow. It says so in Alice's magazines. I do not care if she was born in Timbuktu. I only know that when she walks into this house, I walk out. Well, oh, you better start packing. They'll be here at about six. I mean it. Seems to me that you take it all a bit too seriously. What happened to your laissez faire? I expect I lost it, along with my divine discontent. <laughs> Couldn't you find the list, Moxie, dear? Oh, well, yes, my lady. Here it is. Ah, now, don't go, for heaven's sake. I shall need your help. Yours too, Cresswell. And Mr. Peter, the Admiral, Lady Haley, yes, everybody. Yes, yes. Now, there's a full-blooded crisis on about the church fate. Everything's got to be changed round. Now, where's that horrid little map of the ground, Moxie? Oh, I think it's in the blotter, my lady. I may require you to go and murder Major Petherick, Cresswell. You're very good, my lady. Oh, he's absolutely dug his feet in about the roundabouts. I've just been talking to him on the telephone. He was he was quite insufferable. Here's the map, my lady. Uh, what's that space there? Oh, that's Mrs. Burridge's clock golf and the tea tent, Peter. We can't possibly move that. It would drive everybody mad. What about there, then, right at the other end, where all those little squiggles are? Those little squiggles are graves. You can't have a roundabout grinding out candy kisses all over the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> there, then. Oh, do get your mind away from that corner, Peter. It's still a church property. We know the fate is annual hell, but it isn't the day of judgment. <laughs> the only alternative, milady, is to move the band. Well, that's out of the question. I mean, the brigadier wouldn't hear of it. You can't hustle the Royal Marines about from pillar to post at the last minute. I always thought, Admiral, that that was what Marines were for. <laughs> <laughs> now, read out that list, Moxie. There might be something else that's movable. Tom Bowler, Mrs. Edgecombe. Guessing the weight of the cake, Mrs. Bryce. Miss Hodmarsh is lucky dip. I should never have suspected her of having one. <laughs> Do be quiet, Peter. Go on, Moxie. Jumble stall, Mrs. Pollitt and Mrs. Dint. C cooling drinks with the stars, Miss Miranda Frail. Oh, that's not official yet, because we haven't asked her. But I don't see how she can refuse, do you? Oh, I think it'd be the least she could do. Now, what's the matter, Moxie? Uh, nothing, milady. Uh, nothing. I've... Uh... I've got a slight headache, that's all. Then give me that tiresome list and go and lie down for a little. There's some aspirin in my bathroom, if you haven't got any. Yes, thank you, Millet. <laughs> Excuse me. No. Oh. oh, has anything particular happened to upset Moxie, Crestwell? I think she has been feeling a bit under the weather for the last three days, my lady. I believe that the unexpected news of his lordship's betrothal came as a great shock to her. Yeah, it came as a great shock to all of us. Has she disgusted with you, Cresswell? Hardly at all, my lady. Until just now, before you came in. 
Well, without asking you to betray her confidence in any way, has she explained why she feels so very strongly about it? As far as I could gather, my lady, I believe it is the social aspect of the situation that is upsetting her more than anything else. You mean, you mean she considers my son to be marrying beneath him? That is so, my lady. I tried to reason with her to coax her into a more tolerant frame of mind, but like Major Petherick in the roundabout, she just dug her feet in. Well, thank you, Crestwell. Would that be all, my lady? Except for the roundabout, yes. You'd better take the list and the map to Mr. Durham and see if he has any ideas. Very good, my lady. I have to see him after tea anyhow, but he might be able to think up something in the meantime. Well, I don't know what I should do without Crestwell. Do you remember how all through the war, he and Moxie and I ran this house and dealt with all those brisk wafts, and he never turned a hair? Oh, I shall miss him horribly. But why should you do without him? Oh, Cynthia, I can't take him away from Nigel. He belongs here. Are you so certain that Nigel will want you to go? Oh, he won't say he wants me to go, but I don't approve of resident mothers-in-law. I had quite enough of that with Joan. I shouldn't think that this one would be very like Joan. Well, she couldn't be duller at any rate. <laughs> Nobody could. Joan may have been dull, but she was at least a lady. Oh, really? <laughs> Cynthia. Well, you know perfectly well what I mean. Yes, I know what you mean. Anyhow, Miranda Fayle is a good actress, and she has excellent legs, mm. which means that she'll probably move well at any rate. <laughs> Joan used to walk across a ballroom as though she were trudging through deep snow. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, dear Bogie Whittaker caught her on the hop before she had time to think. Otherwise, she'd be here now instead of in Kenya. I cannot understand your attitude, Felicity. The fact that Nigel's first marriage was such a disaster should make you all the more anxious that his second should be a success. Nigel's first marriage was not a disaster. It was a triumph. To begin with, it lasted only two years. It produced a son and heir, and disintegrated painlessly in the nick of time. The nick of time? Well, certainly. I was on the verge of strangling Joan with my bare hands when she went away. I'm not a deeply religious woman, but I've always regarded Bogey Whittaker as a concrete proof of the efficacy of prayer. I am perfectly aware that nowadays all social barriers are being swept away and that everybody is as good as everybody else, but... If Nigel is allowed to marry this synthetic, trumped-up creature, it will be just one more nail in all our coffins. <laughs> Dear Cynthia, you really must not let righteous indignation play such hell with your syntax. <laughs> oh, do take her away, John. Right. She's getting quite hoarse from barking up wrong trees. Well, I'm merely saying what I think. Well, dear, it's so exhausting. Well, John agrees with me at any rate, don't you, John? Well, oh, yes, yes, I agree. It's fairly obvious to me that Nigel must have been tricked into this in some way. I mean, after all, he's no fool. But, John, dear, he is. Hmm? He's my own son, and I ought to know. Oh, come along, John. See you at dinner. Uh, you know you can rely on us to back you up, Felicity, in whatever line you choose to take. Yes, of course I do. But I think in this instance that masterly inactivity is the best strategy. In fact, my dear Admiral, we must study the chart and take our bearings before. We set our course. Mm. Anchors away. Come along, John. Very well, we'll be over at about 8.30. Eh? Keeping good heart, my dear. Oh. oh, dear. I'm afraid I was beastly to poor Cynthia. She really maddens me at times. <laughs> Personally, I think the Admiral and his good lady are both cracking balls. Mm, perhaps they are. But you see, they're such old friends. <laughs> what is it, Moxie? I haven't forgotten anything important, have I? Uh, no, my lady, I just wanted to speak to you, that's all, but I'll come back later. It's all right, Moxie, dear, I'm going to the village. You can have a clear field. No, no, it, it doesn't matter, Mr. Peter. I'd rather come back later. Oh, oh, dear. She's obviously in a state. Oh, I wish she wouldn't be. I really do. It's so catching. Why do you suppose she's taking it so dreadfully to heart? Have you talked to her about it much? no. Whenever I mention it, she changes the subject. She's very deeply angry, I think. With Nigel? Yes. She, you see, she adores him. She always has, ever since she first came here. You know, he was only 15 then, and they used to go to the matinees together and have tea afterwards at Gunter's. I think she feels that he's letting down the side. Maybe she's right. Oh, there's still just a hope that she's wrong. I think it's a pretty slim one. Well, I don't see why. After all, it isn't the first time an English peer has married an actress. In the old days, they never stopped. Oh, answer it, Peter, there's a dear. It's probably the press again. 
They've been ringing up all day. You can evade them with more authority than I can. There, I think you underrate yourself. Hello? Hello, yes. Yes, this is. Yes. Hold the line for a moment, will you? It's for you, dear. A personal call from London. Ask who it is. Who wishes to speak to her? Oh, oh, oh all right. Hold on. It's the prodigal son himself. Oh, Nigel. Mm. Oh, dear. Hello. Yes, yeah, speaking. Oh, the line's terrible. <laughs> Sounds as though someone was snoring. Oh. Hello, hello. Nigel. Yes, dear. Yes, of course it is. What? Oh, do speak louder. I can't hear a word. He can't hear me either. Well, where are you? I said, where are you? Oh, oh, I see. You're, you're just leaving now. Oh, <laughs> oh, lovely, darling. Yes. Uh, how are you? Uh, both. No, 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 dear. I said, how are you both? Yeah, yes, but I'm doing my best. I'm screaming like a banshee. Banshee, darling. Oh, B for bottle, A for Andalusia, N for Nebuchadnezzar. No, 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 Nebuchadnezzar. N for nobody, S. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, it's not in the least important. I was only trying to explain what I was screaming like. I'm going mad. Jiggle the thing. Well, if I jiggle the thing, I should be cut off. No. Ah, yeah, that's better. That's better if the snoring is stopped anyway. That's better, yes. I can hear you now. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Ah, good. Oh, what a shame. Oh, I expect it was because she was in a strange bed. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have said that. You think I was being critical. <laughs> very well. Very well, darling. No, no, no. Nobody but Peter and the Halings. Yes, well, I thought you'd like to be quiet on your first evening. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'd expect you between six and seven. Yes, well, of course I am. Oh, I'm sure she's charming. I shouldn't have said that either. It, it sounded patronizing. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't the least important. It sounded like Nebuchadnezzar because it was Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I really can't explain now. It's all so complicated. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, all right, darling. Oh. Oh, my goodness. That was one of the most... Idiotic conversations I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Did he sound cheerful? Well, a little irritable, I thought, but that might have been the telephone. I expect he was nervous. I wasn't, I wasn't beastly to him, was I? I, I mean, I didn't sound cross or anything. <laughs> no, dear aunt. You were very, very good. I know it's horrid for you, and I do sympathize, really, I do. Please don't, Peter. Even a kindly look would undermine me at the moment. <sighs> now, be a dear and go and find Moxie. I'd better get that over. She's probably hovering. All right, I will. Milady. It's all right, Moxie. The coast is clear. Yes, milady. Oh, you look dreadfully grim, Moxie. Now, what is it that's worrying you? The thought of what I have to say to you, milady, that's what's worrying me. I'm afraid I have to leave you, milady. Leave me? Why, Moxie, what on earth? At you... once, milady. Today, I've, uh, I've had some bad news. Oh, my dear. Oh, I'm so awfully sorry. Now, what is... It's my aunt, milady, my, my, my mother's sister. She's, uh, she's very seriously ill, and she's all alone. Where? Uh, South Sea. But why is she all alone? I mean, she must have someone to look after her. Oh, well, her husband looked after her, milady, but, um, but, but he died. Yes, he died, suddenly. Two days ago, I've just had a telegram from one of the neighbours. And you have to leave at once? Yes, my lady. Oh, my poor Moxie, how horrid for you. Well, when do you think you'll be able to come back? Well, that's just it, my lady. I shan't be able to come back. What? You see, she's all alone, and she may just sort of linger well, for years. Do you mean to say that you want to leave me for good now? This minute? Oh, no, it isn't that I want to, my lady. Please... Please believe that. It, it's just that I must. But this aunt of yours, I mean, what's the matter with her? What's she suffering from? Well, ah, uh, I don't rightly know, my lady. The, uh, the, the doctors don't seem to be able to make up their minds. Well, couldn't she go to a hospital? Oh, no. Uh, no, no, she can't be moved. And her husband, who looked after her? 
I mean, what did he die of so very suddenly? He was run over, my lady, by an army lorry. Where? Just opposite the South Parade Pier. How do you know all this? It was in the telegram. Your aunt must have very extravagant neighbours. <laughs> yes, my lady. Moxie, how long have you been with me? Well, I came to Marshwood as housemaid 20 years ago. And you became my personal maid a year later? Yes. And you've been my personal maid and my personal friend and part of the family ever since? Yes, my lady. So we have lived together, travelled together, laughed together and gossiped together for approximately 19 years. <laughs> yes, my lady. Can it be that during all that long time, Moxie, you have looked upon me as a drivelling idiot? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, my lady. I knew it was no use. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't believe it. You're a terribly bad liar. I noticed it on the telephone. Yes. You're upset about his lordship's marriage. Now, that's the trouble, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yes, that's the trouble. And you seriously wish to leave me because of it? Yes, please, my lady. Why, Moxie, dear? Why should it matter to you so desperately? Please, let me go, my lady. Don't ask me to explain. I can't stay here. I must leave at once. But why? I have my reasons. Well, in that case, there isn't anything more to be said, is there? Oh, but I... Obviously, I can't force you to stay with me if you don't want to. Come and say goodbye to me when you're packed. Very well, my lady. <laughs> Oh, Moxie, 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 dear, this is too utterly fantastic. I can't possibly just let it happen. Now, please tell me why you feel that you have to leave me. No, I promise you I will try to understand whatever it is. Please, Moxie, dear. I can't. It's too humiliating. I'm so ashamed. Oh, it isn't Nigel, is it? I mean, it, it isn't that he's ever... Oh, no. Oh, no. No, of course it isn't. Is it? Is it perhaps that you, that you love him more than you no, can help? No, no, lady. No, it's it's nothing like that. I swear it isn't. Of course, I love his lordship. I've loved him ever since he was a boy, but not like that. We are all worried about this sudden engagement, but we really must all make an effort to face the situation calmly and sensibly. For all we know, Miranda Frail might be. Simple and kind and absolutely charming. And the only really important thing is that she should make him happy, isn't it? She won't. But we can't prove that, can we? If you searched the whole wide world with a tooth comb, you couldn't find anybody less fitted to be his lordship's wife and the mistress of this house. Why are you so sure? How do you know? Because, my lady... Miss Miranda Frail happens to be my young sister. Oh, I do wish you'd sit down, Peter. Nothing can be achieved by you charging about the room like a like a sort of dodgem. What on earth is a dodgem? One of those little motor cars you go on in Margaret and bang into everybody. Oh, I haven't banged into anybody yet. We must concentrate. This is a serious crisis. If we concentrate until we're blue in the face, we shan't get any further. There's only one possible solution, and you know it. Send Moxie away somewhere. Send her abroad. I've told you once and for all that I am not going to be parted from Moxie. I couldn't live without her, and I don't intend to try. But it may not be for long. We may be able to dissuade Nigel from marrying this tiresome woman, and then she could go back to Hollywood and no one need ever know. And how do you propose to go about dissuading him? Surely when he knows that his prospective sister-in-law is his mother's maid, it'll shake him a bit. Uh, what was their name? Uh, their family name, I mean. A birch. <laughs> it seems they had a grocer's shop in Nightingale Lane, somewhere between Brixton and Clapham. Frida, that's my future daughter-in-law, was the flighty one. Moxie's real name is Dora, you know. She married Moxton, Edith Harrington, chauffeur. They had a child, but it died. And then Moxton died, too. So she went back to the shop and her mother. And Frida? 
Oh, Frida had upped and left long before then. Apparently, she started making a beast of herself quite early. In what way? Oh, the usual way. She kept on almost having babies, but not quite. A lack of concentration? And then there was apparently a terrible scene. The mother had a stroke, and Frida beetled off to America with a theatrical agent called Greenberg. Well, that was the last Moxie saw of her. Did the mother die? Yes, and the shop failed, and Moxie came here as housemaid shortly afterwards. Hmm. Twenty years is a long time, though. Perhaps Frida, Miranda, whatever her name is, wouldn't recognize her now. Well, of course she would. Moxie had hardly changed at all. She could change, though, couldn't she? How do you mean? I've got an idea. Oh, disguise her, I suppose. No, promote her. Promote Moxie? And what do you propose to do? Pop a tiara on her head and pretend she's the Duchess of Devonshire. Look, as I see it, the crux of this whole situation is that Moxie is a domestic servant, a lady's maid. In fact, a social inferior. There's nothing inferior about her, social or otherwise. Oh, all right, or I couldn't agree with you more, but that's beside the point. Yes, but what did you mean about promoting her? Well, step her up. Make her your secretary. But she can't do shorthand or type. She can't even spell very well. Neither can you. But everybody knows her as my maid. They don't think I was dotty if I suddenly said she was my secretary. Well, companion, then. Secretary companion. She must be entirely redressed. Oh, Peter. She'd never agree to it in a thousand years. I don't see why. She's a woman of considerable pride. She'll bitterly resent the idea of stepping out of her own media in order to be sociably acceptable to her own sister. Well, let's ask her anyhow. Well, I think before we say anything to her, I should like Crestwell's opinion. Ring the bell. Oh, all right. There you are. You rang, my lady. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, Crestwell. Um, I have been thinking for some time of making a change in the household. A change, my lady. And I wanted to ask your opinion before I decided definitely. You see, it concerns Moxie. Oh, yes, my dear. I, um, I wish to, uh, to promote her, I mean to alter her status. And I was wondering what you would think of the idea of her ceasing to be part of the domestic staff and becoming my secretary. Secretary, my lady? I mean, uh, companion secretary. To what degree would such a... Metamorphoses affect the status quo, my lady. Well, uh, well, I, I don't know, really. I mean, uh, you see, but that would all have to be gone into very carefully. Meals, for instance. Oh, dear. Oh, that is a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Problem, certainly, my lady, but not an insoluble one. I presume that you could eat in the dining room when you were en famille, as it were? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I, I, I suppose so. Yes. Well, of course she could, but um, what do you think of the idea, Crestwell? May I ask if you've discussed it with Mrs. Moxton herself? Oh, oh not yet. We wanted to get your reactions first. Why, you think she won't agree? I think, taking into consideration the very special circumstances, she might. How much do you know, Crestwell? In common with most of the human race, sir, I know very little, but imagine I know a great deal. Dear Crestwell, don't be evasive. Please, this is a crisis. Miss Miranda Frail, his lordship's intended bride, happens to be Mrs. Moxton's sister. Thank you, my lady. You may rely on my discretion. You, you already guessed it. By simple deduction and putting two and two together, I had arrived at the conclusion there was something a bit dodgy going on. Well, you were quite right, Crestwell. Nothing indeed could be dodgier. Now, will you help us? In what way, my lady? Oh, in any way you can. You are a wise man and an exceedingly persuasive one. Thank you, my lady. Oh, I shall never forget how you managed that dreadful waff who took to the bottle and kept on disappearing on her bicycle in the middle of the night. Well, that was more moral blackmail than persuasion, my lady. <laughs> well, will you go now and ask Moxie to come down? Very good, my lady. Try not to enjoy the situation so wholeheartedly, Peter. I can't imagine why you don't marry Crestwell, Felicity. It'd simplify everything. Oh, it's terribly upsetting, really. Well, it needn't be if it's properly handled. Oh, it's Moxie that I'm worrying about. You know, I've suddenly realized something. Something curiously humiliating. What? 
I don't really know her at all. What on earth do you mean? Oh, she knows me all right. She knows all my problems and all my relations. She has nursed me through illnesses. She's seen me in tears. She's seen me dressed and undressed, with my face plastered with grease or made up to the eyes. And only once in 19 years have I ever seen her in her dressing gown. And that was in the station hotel at Genoa, when I had to main poisoning from eating bad fish. Surely true knowledge of character doesn't necessarily depend on constantly seeing people in their dressing gowns. She has done her job faithfully and well. She has comforted me and cosseted me and received all my confidences for all those long years. And until today, I didn't even know that she had a sister. But if she were ashamed of her, if she'd cut her out of her life, it was quite natural that she wouldn't discuss her or even mention her. I've told Moxie many things that I was ashamed of. Crestwell says you wish to speak to me, lady. Oh, yes, Moxie, I do. Uh, most urgently. Uh, will you sit down? Uh, both of you. Oh, Very well, thank you, my lady. lady. And now then, Moxie, dear. Uh, I have explained the situation confidentially to Mr. Peter. Oh, no, I had to discuss it with somebody. As well as being my nephew, he is an old friend whose discretion can be completely relied on. I quite understand, my lady. Crestwell also. Crestwell? But as a matter of fact, he had already guessed. Oh. Had he indeed, milady? A process of natural deduction, Dora. Cause and effect, you know. I don't know any such thing. But I do know about people nosing about and not minding their own Now, business. you mustn't be cross with Crestwell, Moxie. He's eager to help us in any way he can. It's very kind of him, I'm sure. The thought of you leaving Marshwood and me for any reason except that you were unhappy here fills me with dismay. But that is the reason, my lady, I shall be unhappy here. I couldn't very well be anything else in the circumstances. I fully appreciate that, Moxie. And that is why I have decided, after careful deliberation, to alter the circumstances. May I ask how, my lady? I wish you from now onwards to cease being my personal maid and become my companion secretary. I'm afraid I couldn't possibly do that. Well, why not? Well, I should feel so silly, my lady. And besides, wouldn't be right. But why not? Now then, Dora, don't be stubborn. Oh, look, I can't type, for one thing, and my writing's terrible. The question is one of status rather than actual achievement. That's the whole point. Oh, <laughs> You mean it would embarrass my sister less to find me in a false position than in a real one? Touché. We are trying to help you, Dora. Well, well how, how would, would this, this change, if it took place, well, how would it really help matters? Well, it would put you on a different footing in the house, Moxie. For instance... You would take your meals with us, when we were alone. <laughs> and when there were visitors? Uh, well, well, I, I suppose that would really depend on how many there were. Uh, we, um, we could make the old Japanese room into a sort of private sitting room for you. And you could occasionally have a tray up there in peace and quiet. Oh, I could even invite my sister up there every now and then for a little snack, couldn't I, my lady? Now, don't be angry, Moxie. Please, don't be angry. I'm not angry, my lady. Really, I'm not. And I do understand what you're trying to do, but it's no good. Wouldn't work. Play acting and pretending to be what I'm not. That won't settle anything. Dora, may I make a suggestion, my lady? Of course you may. Now, keep calm, Moxie. But it... Well, to begin with, the secretary companion idea won't wash for one very good reason. What reason? It isn't good enough for her. When Dora's sister arrives in this house, she will naturally be received as one of the family, won't she? Well, of course she will. Then Dora will have to be two. I must say, I see Crestwell's point. Oh, so do I. But what I don't see is how it can possibly be arranged. His lordship has been away for over four months, hasn't he? Yes. Uh, suppose that during that time, an uncle of Dora's died in Australia and left her a large sum of money, enough to give her an income for life. Yes. I'm beginning to see. <laughs> Go on. Being sentimentally attached to the family, as you might say, she wouldn't want to leave Marshwood, however financially independent she was, would she? Well, I don't know. Would you, Moxie? Of course I wouldn't, milady. Therefore, she would be staying on here at least for the time being, as a personal friend and meet her sister on equal terms rather than as one of the staff. 
Yes, I see that. But what I don't see is how this could possibly be explained convincingly. But there isn't anyone to explain it to apart from Nigel. And you can get him alone soon after he arrives and tell him about Moxie's uncle. You can add that she's very sensitive about having been a lady's maid and that he's not to say a word. Yes, but what about the hailings? Oh, I'll deal with Cynthia and the Admiral. I'll pop over before dinner and swear them to secrecy. Do you think you can do it, Moxie? Oh, well, I mean, do you think your I'm sister just... will recognise you? <laughs> well, I... Uh... I don't know. She hasn't laid eyes on me for 20 years. I've been saving a few things to say to that one, whether she recognises me or not. Do you hate her, Moxie? If ever a girl needed her bottom smacking, she did. We might arrange that after dinner. Oh, shush, Peter. Now, you'd better wear my Molyneux this evening. Oh, I don't like this. Milady, it doesn't feel right somehow. I don't like it at all. And we'll discuss other clothes in the morning. Oh, um, I think Mr. Peter has some ideas about your hair. Oh, you'd better listen to him. He's quite good at that sort of thing. Very well, Milady, but... <laughs> good. I think uh, Moxie had better have the chintz room pressed to her. You might see that her things are moved, will Very you? good, Milady. I gather to find a phrase. They're off. We certainly are. Go along, Moxie. Good heavens! They're arriving! Fly, Moxie! Quickly! Oh, my lady. My, my lady, I don't think I can. I, I, I really don't... Courage, Moxie, courage! Oh. Oh. Christwell? Christwell? Tell Alice to run a bath for me, will you, please? Uh, very good, Mrs. Moxton. And you wipe that grin off your face while you're at it. But I still don't quite understand, Mother. Well, I should have thought it was quite simple enough. Well, I'm fond of Moxie, as you know. I always have been. But I can't help feeling that this, this sudden transformation is a little drastic. Is it absolutely necessary for you to go wherever she goes, to be clamped to her side for the rest of your days? Absolutely. I'm devoted to her, and she's devoted to me. Yes, but surely if she's financially independent and no longer your maid, you can't expect her to fetch and carry for you and look after you. Moxie would continue to look after me if she were a millionaireess. Well, if you ask me, I think the whole thing's absurd. And I don't see why you're making such a dreadful fuss. Why shouldn't she have meals with us and call us by our Christian names? Why shouldn't she? Oh, really, Mother, I don't approve of it, and I never shall. But you promise me that you won't tell anyone. Even Miranda... Oh, how can you be so silly, Mother? Everybody's bound to know sooner or later. But will you promise? <sighs> oh, all right, I promise. Uh. Do you like Miranda, Mother? Really? Well, I only had a few words with her, and then she said she wanted to go to sleep. Oh, she was exhausted after the drive down. She always sleeps in the afternoon, anyhow. Oh, how sensible. Do you think you're going to like her? Oh, I hope so, darling. She seemed very charming. Of course, she has no eyebrows. Uh, mother, must you harp on anatomical defects? I didn't say it was a defect. I merely said that she hasn't got any. Well, she's awfully simple and sweet, really, you know. Quite unlike what you'd think she'd be from seeing her on the screen. I've only seen her as a hospital nurse, a gangster's moll, a nun, and Catherine the Great. So it's a little difficult to form any definite opinion. You're prejudiced against oh, her. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Nigel. I know nothing whatever about her beyond the fact that she sleeps every afternoon and can swim. She's a remarkable character. She, she's honest and unaffected, and she's never allowed her success to spoil her. She loves the ordinary, simple things of life, like living in the country and sewing and reading. She also adores children. Oh, has she ever had any? No, she hasn't. Uh, but that's beside the point. But she'd been married before, hasn't she? Yes. To a man called Greenberg. He was foul to her. Oh, in what way? In every way. He was cruel. He used to go away and leave her alone for weeks at a time. Well, that at least gave her an opportunity to catch up on her sewing and reading. Mm, it's quite clear that you've hardened your heart against her, so I won't say any more. Uh, I saw in the paper that uh, Mr. Don Lucas had arrived in England. What are you getting at now, Mother? Well, um, mightn't that be a little awkward for Miranda? She's never attempted to conceal anything from me. I know all about her love affair with Don Lucas. It was finished and done with ages ago. Three quarters of it was studio publicity anyway. Oh, I'm so glad, darling. Studio publicity agents are absolutely unscrupulous. Their job is to get the stars talked about at all costs. 
Miss Vander and John Lucas were teamed together in three pictures. That was quite enough to start the whole business. Oh, I remember him in the one about the nun. Oh, yes, he was very good. Hmm. He's a terrible drunk, you know. Oh, how horrid for her. Uh, when do you intend to get married? As soon as possible. Ah, I see. Why hasn't Cresswell brought in the cocktail things? I'll ring. There. Oh, hello, Peter. There are two girl guides in the shrubbery. What are they doing there? They weren't doing anything. They were just there. If they're autograph hunters, they must be sent away. Miranda is driven mad by autograph oh, hunters. Oh, poor dear. Cocktails, my lady. Ah, Cresswell. There are apparently some girl guides in the shrubbery. I know, my lady. They've been hanging about all the afternoon. I think one of them is the little Mumby girl. They have them sent away, whoever they are. If it's Elsie Mumby, we can't possibly send her away. The whole village would be up in arms. Why? She pulled her little brother out of a well. Oh, she's a local heroine. The ice bucket down, Alice, and go and see what they want. They want Miss Frail's autograph, oh. Mr. Cresswell. So does Miss Luton at the post office. She sent Billy down for it on his bike. We'll collect the books from them, Alice, and tell them to call for them in the morning. Yes, Mr. Crestwell. And don't stand about giggling with them, either. No, Mr. Crestwell. Thank you, Crestwell. I expect we shall have a lot of this sort of thing to deal with. There's the question of press reporters also, my lady. Get rid of them. Young Willis of the Kentish Times has been particularly persistent, my lord. He's rung up seven times and called twice. Tell him to go to hell. Oh, don't be silly, Nigel. We can't possibly tell old Mrs. Willis's son to go to hell. She's one of the staunchest supporters of the Cottage Hospital Committee, and she's made us all those wool mats for the sale of work. Tell young Willis to come and see me tomorrow morning, Cresswell. Very good, my lady. Really, Mother, I do think it's very inconsiderate of her. Oh, you. nonsense, dear. Miranda has decided to come and live in a small English village. She must be prepared for publicity. Will you make the cocktails, or shall I? You, please, Nigel. Felicity never puts enough gin in. Oh, all right. Uh, martini for everybody. Yes, please, dear. It's quite a festive occasion, after all, isn't it? What with one thing and another. Ah, there you are, Miranda. I do hope you had a good rest. I went to sleep in one world, and I woke up in another. <laughs> How confusing. I was tired and edgy after the drive down, and nervous, too, about meeting you and Nigel's friends and wondering what you'd all think of me. But when I woke up, everything was different. I felt smooth and peaceful for the first time in weeks. <laughs> now come and sit down, my dear. Uh, martini, darling. No, thank you, dear. I'd like a soft drink, if there is one. Huh. Lemon juice with a little soda. Perfect. Uh, Peter, come and help. Right you are. I didn't think you'd want to meet many strangers on your first evening here. So apart from us, there will only be Admiral and Lady Hailing at dinner. Oh, they're very old friends and our closest neighbours. Is there anyone else staying in the house? Only Peter here and... and uh, Moxie. Is that a nickname? Yes. Yes, I suppose it is. Her name is Mrs. Moxton. Oh. Oh, we've known her for so many years. She's practically one of the family. I do hope she'll approve of me. Well, why the hell shouldn't she? Well, old family friends are liable to resent intruders even more than the family itself. Oh. <laughs> ah, here she is. I hope I'm not late. Well, of course not, Moxie, dear. Ah, uh, <laughs> Hello, Moxie. Welcome home, my love. Uh, my, uh, my, my goodness. My, my goodness, how well you look. <laughs> uh, Miss Miranda Frail, <laughs> Mrs. Moxton. How do you do? <clears throat> I've heard so much about you. I really do hope we're going to be friends. I feel I already know you well, Miss Frail. Won't you call me Miranda? Certainly, if you wish. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Be an angel, Peter, and get me a drink. I'm positively gasping. <laughs> yes. Um, well, you'd better make a fresh brew, Peter. There's only iced water in the shaker. I presume you do want a martini, Moxie. Oh, yes, please, my, uh, uh, uh dear. <laughs> no idea how wonderful it is to be able to relax and pop on my old glasses and not to worry what I look like. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they're very becoming. Thank you, sweet. <laughs> An embroidery frame. Are you a keen needlewoman, Miranda? Yes, I always have been, ever since I was a child. 
I used to have to do most of the sewing and mending at home. We were terribly poor, you know. I remember Mother was always calling me in from playing in the street to darn stockings or put a hem on something or other. We couldn't afford a machine. Playing in the street? Oh, yes. I was a regular little gutter child. <laughs> Where did you live? Oh, it was an awful slum, really. Not far from Bixton High Road. An awful slum? Oh, yes. I can see it now. On a Saturday night with the crowds and the lights. I used to go down and get Mother her pint of beer at the pub <coughs> and bring it home in a jug. <coughs> One night there was a barrel organ and I danced to it. How old were you? About five, I suppose. You danced to a barrel organ outside a pub when you were five? Oh, yes. That's how I first learned to dance, really. <laughs> oh, I do hope these sordid disclosures about my childhood aren't shocking you. <laughs> don't be silly, darling. Of course they're not. On the contrary. I find them absolutely fascinating. Uh, don't you, Moxie? I certainly do. I was born in the gutter within the sound of bow bells. I'm a London Cockney, and I am proud of it. I'm sure you are. <laughs> it must be lovely. <laughs> Yesterday, without even telling Nigel, I put on some old clothes and a veil, and I went in a tram to Brixton, all by myself. How did it look? Uh, the slum? Very changed. The house was still there, though. It gave me a dreadful pang to see the window of Mother's room, the one she died in. Well, I expect you nursed her devotedly, didn't you? I did the best I could, which wasn't much. And you were all alone, with no father or brother or sister? My father died soon after I was born. I did have a sister. She was a good deal older than me. Poor old Dora. Why? What happened to her? Oh, what always happens to people when they allow life to get the better of them. In what way did life get the better of her? In every way, really. I was the lucky one. I always had a conviction deep down inside me that somehow or other I should get on and hoist myself out of the mire, escape from the poverty and squalor of my surroundings. <coughs> That's what's so unfair, isn't it? I mean, that some people should feel like that from the beginning and that other people shouldn't. I think that's why Dora hated me, really. Was she cruel to you? Did she uh, beat you or knock you about? Never. When she was sober. I think I'd like another martini, please. I expect we all would. You haven't told us yet what happened to her. Um, is she still alive? No. She died some years ago. The news came to me in quite a roundabout way. I hadn't heard from her for ages. I'd been sending her pennies every now and then, you know, just to help out, and food parcels and things like that, but she never acknowledged them. I'm afraid all the pennies went on drink. I expect the food parcels came in handy as blotting paper. Oh. Does your drink, Moxie. Thank you. Felicity? Oh, it looks very pale, dear. After all, the vermus is there to be used, you know. I think it's only right and proper that you should be warned about your future mother-in-law, Miranda. Oh. She's famous for her meanness over inessential. I wouldn't call Jill an inessential. Of course, over the major issues, she's generous to a fault. Why, she'd give you the dress off her back, wouldn't she, Moxie? Certainly she would, Mr. P uh, Bagshot. Uh, Mr. Bagshot, we well, were saying so. Only the other day. Who is Mr. Bagshot? Oh, uh, Mr. Bagshot is the new curate, Peter. <laughs> new curate, mother? Oh, what's happened to Eustace Parker, then? Has he left? Uh, uh, yes, dear. Yes, yes. Oh, under a cloud. Well, you never said anything about it in your letters. Well, I couldn't, darling. I mean, there are some things you just can't put in letters. But he was such a mild, inoffensive little chap. What on earth did he do? No, well, we have no proof that he actually did anything. I mean, it, 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 it was just one of those things. I, I tell you about it all later, Nigel. I really would rather not go on about it now. Miranda, dear, surely it's time you had a proper drink. I mean, that lemonade looks so dreary. No, thank you. I hardly ever do, you know. Funnily enough, it's Hollywood that taught me not to drink. And mm. one sort of gets into the habit of disciplining oneself. I hope for all our sakes and for the sake of the world at large that you haven't decided to give up acting for good. I'm afraid I have. Oh. I think being married to Pete will be a whole time job. Pete? Oh dear, it slipped out. I always called him Pete. It's a silly sort of habit. 
He even calls me Pete sometimes. Oh, isn't that rather muddling? We manage to understand each other, don't we, darling? <laughs> Admiral Sir John and Lady Haley. Oh my God, I forgot to warn them. <gasps> oh, yeah. I'm so sorry we're late, Felicity. Poor Eustace Parker arrived just as we were leaving and went on for hours about the church fete. Uh, Eustace Parker? Oh, oh, I'm so glad he's back. It, it, must, it must all have blown over. <laughs> what are you talking about, Oh, nothing, dear, nothing. I, I'll tell you all about it later. Uh, hello, hello, Nigel. Uh, uh, Admiral. Welcome home, Lady my Hedick. dear. Cynthia, John, this is Miranda. Miranda Frail, Sir John, and Lady Helling. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Oh, we've so often admired you from afar. Thank you. Moxie, you look very dressy. If you have time while we're at dinner, you might be a dear and put a few stitches in my bag. It's gaping at the side. I meant to ask Saunders to do it before I left the house, but I forgot. Really, Cynthia, you'll be forgetting your head next. What did you say? <laughs> Cynthia <laughs> and John, too. Uh, I simply must talk to you both about the cottage hospital. Oh, oh there's a most awful crisis on about the matron. Oh, I'm at my wit's end. She really has gone too far this time. Oh, oh, Come into the study. I can't talk about it in front of everyone. And you're both so sane about that sort of thing. Please come. Make another cocktail, Peter. We shan't be a minute. Right, oh. <laughs> Peter? Mm-hmm. What on earth's the matter with Mother this evening? She's quite hysterical. Oh, that matron is enough to make anyone hysterical. She's a fiend incarnate. If you're referring to Mrs. Gaskin, Peter, she is adored by the whole district. Oh, this isn't Mrs. Gaskin. It's a new one. Since when? Since Mrs. Gaskin died, of course. Well, I never knew the poor old girl had died. When did it happen? Oh, about three weeks ago, I believe. What did she die of? Oh, it's no good cross-questioning me. I wasn't here. Anyhow, I feel sure that all these local incidents cannot be of the slightest interest to Miranda. But of course they are. They're part of my new life. I want to know everything. I want to learn step by step all about this funny, dear English world that's going to be my home. It's terribly important to me. It is, really. Oh, darling. I don't suppose it'll be easy just at first, in the village, I mean. Getting the people to trust me and look upon me as a friend... But I'll win them round in the end. Just you see. <laughs> Most extraordinary idea. Uh, thank you for putting me in the picture, Felicity. Uh, even at this late hour. <laughs> uh, dinner is served, uh, Milo. Oh, oh, dear. Well, and I snatched you two away before you even had a cocktail. Well, we could take them in with us. Oh, yes, idea. I think that would be the best if you really don't mind. We are starting with a souffle. I'll carry them in for you. Come along, then, everybody. Miranda. Come on, darling. Please go in. I'll uh, be here in a moment. It's my bag now. Where did I put it? Nora. Uh... I can't do it. I know I can't. I... Pull yourself together. I can't sit here and listen to her talking about Mum like that, saying she took her jugs of beer from pubs. I will never forgive her. Never, never, never. Oh, come on. Come oh, on. Fred. No, no, none of that. Here. Here. <gasps> Knock this back. Oh, no. No, I'd better not, really. <laughs> Drink it. It won't hurt an old silk like you. Oh, <laughs> That's better. Oh. Now, <laughs> now, now, they're waiting in there. Chin up. Get cracking. Oh, Fred. <laughs> Better move on now, Alice. Mrs. Crabb will be wanting you in the kitchen. Oh, yes, Mr. Crestwell. And might I suggest, Alice, that in these few brief moments of intimacy that have been vouchsafed to us, that although understandably overwhelmed by the honour of being allowed to wait at table, there is no necessity to breathe quite so heavily while doing oh, I'm it. I'm sorry, Mr. Crestwell. When you approached the future Countess of Marshwood just now with the clean carrots, you sounded like a good strain, coming round a curve. I couldn't help it. Really, I couldn't. Well, seeing her tortured by the Japanese on Thursday and handing her carrots on Saturday sort of 
took my breath away. If it had really done that, Alice, there would be no cause for complaint. Yes, Mr. Crestwell. Nor was it entirely in accord with the highest traditions of domestic service for you to stare at Mrs. Moxton with your eyes bolting from your head and your mouth open. It was such a surprise, seeing her seated at table like that, dressed up to kill me. I nearly had a fit. What does it all mean, Mr. Crestwell? It is a social experiment based on the ancient and inaccurate assumption that, as we are all equal in the eyes of God, we should therefore be equally equal in the eyes of our fellow creatures. Oh. The fact that it doesn't work like that and never will in no way deters the idealists from pressing on valiantly towards utopia. What's utopia? A spiritually hygienic abstraction, Alice where everyone is hail fellow well met and there is no waiting at table. Oh, I see. Pork lunches. The front door. Who the devil can that be? Finish up quickly now, Alison. Oh. Get back to the Mrs. Crown. Yes, Mr. Cresswell. his lordship that you are here. Well, hey, wait a minute. Don't do that. Uh, it's uh, Miss Frail I want to see. Miss Miranda Frail. Very good, sir. Yeah, I'm Don Lucas. Yes, sir. I recognized you immediately. Oh. I gather, sir, that you wish to speak to Miss Frail privately. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I do. Miss Frail and me, well, we are, we are very old friends. It, it is the awareness of that fact, sir, that tinctured my spontaneous pleasure at seeing you with a modicum of apprehension. Come again? Sequestered as we are, sir, in our remote Kentish vacuum, we are not entirely out of touch with the larger world beyond. We have been privileged to follow both your public and private affairs uh, with the keenest interest. You are a very popular figure in these parts, Mr. Lucas. Oh, well, thanks a lot. I, you know, I could do with a scotch if you've got one handy. Certainly, sir. What's your name? Uh, Creswell, sir. Frederick Creswell. Ah. Well, now, see here, Fred. I want your help. So, uh, thank you. Ah, I want to talk to you as man to man. Any other approach, sir, would be curious, to say the least of it. Yeah, well, this Earl of yours, is he really planning to marry Miranda, Miss Frail? I heard the news on the radio three days ago and hopped on a plane right away. I've got to know whether it's the real McCoy, this marriage, or whether it's just the studio publicity department pulling a fast one. Uh, the real McCoy, I'm afraid, or so. <laughs> she can't do this to me. She just can't. Look, I've got to see her, Fred. I've got to see her alone now. And you've got to fix it. Say it's a reporter from Life magazine. That'll fetch her. Uh, in the middle of dinner, sir, but I'll do my best, Fred. You're a pal. Here. Twenty dollars, sir. If the government knew I had this, I'd get a knighthood. <laughs> oh, man, the baby. Pete! Pete! You son of a bitch! Pete! Low down mean tricks. I'll never forgive you for this. Never, never, never. Now, honey, I've got to talk to you. I've got to. I'm, I'm going out of my mind. Don't you come near me, you, you snake. I've flown all across the Atlantic in a straddle without even a sleeping berth on account of they were all full, and you call me a snake? You are too, a snake. I never want to see you again. I told you that when I left, and it still goes. You don't mean that, Pete. Not in your heart, you don't. I've cut you out of my life like... A withered limb. Pete. Oh, shut up calling me Pete. That's all over. Look at me. Let me alone. Mm. <gasps> now then, am I a withered limb? How could you? Oh, how could you? I'm crazy about you. I've been crazy about you for three whole years. Crazy about me? What about Benji Le Maire? And Zender Hicks. Oh, and God. that phony Polish princess that Daryl Zanuck gave the party for? They didn't mean a thing to me. They were just ships that pass in the night. Then they certainly passed through your beach house in Santa Monica on their way to the open sea. Yes, and we're back at that again, are we? You bet your life we're back at that. I gave you all I had to give. 
My heart, my dreams, my tenderness. Everything but equal billing. Remember, be still foolish heart. You were featured under the title, which, considering it was your first picture, was more than you had a right to expect. I got the notices anyway. You got a rave in The Hollywood Reporter. And your pants torn off you in The New Yorker. If you call that getting the notices, I'll take vanilla. Yeah? I'm bigger box office now than you ever were, even before you started slipping. Started slipping? Do you think I don't know why you're marrying this title guy? Do you think the whole world doesn't know? It's because you've been on the skids ever since Catherine the Great. Get out! Get out! I'm not getting out of anywhere until I'm good and ready. There are a few things I'd like to say to this Earl of yours. Oh, Don, please go. Please. For, all, for the sake of all we've meant to each other, for the sake of all the good times we've had, don't come busting in here and making a scene and spoiling everything. Please. Do you love this guy? Yes, of course I do. Uh, I really love him as much as you love me. Please, please go, Don. They'll be here any minute. As much as you love me. Oh, it's different. I mean, no people love other people in the same way. I'm crazy about you, Pete. I, I've fought against it. I've tried to forget you. Don't. Please don't say any more. Oh, Pete. Go away. You've got to go away. Oh, okay, I'll go. I know we're all washed up. I know now that there isn't any more hope for me. I... I only just wanted to make sure. Goodbye, Pete. It was swell while it lasted. Oh, Goodbye, Pete. Oh. Well, oh, Lady Mary, I came to rescue you, Miranda. But I see that it was unnecessary. This is one of my very old friends. We were just saying goodbye. Surely he's only just arrived. Uh, I've got to get back to London. Uh, this is Don Lucas. Don? This is Lady Marshwood. Oh, I thought I recognized you, but I simply couldn't believe my eyes. Oh, this is the most delightful surprise. Well, thank you, ma'am. Well, you're surely not intending to drive all the way back to London now. Well, I'm afraid I must... Oh, uh... nonsense. I won't hear of it. That long, dreary road at this time of night in the pouring rain. It isn't raining. No, it will be by the time it gets to Canterbury. I've never known it to fail. Besides, I couldn't dream of allowing Mr. Don Lucas to creep into the house and out again. Insist on you staying until tomorrow, at least. But Lady Marsh would really... Yes, I'll, I'll just ring for Crespo. Dear Miranda, you really must allow me to have my own way. You're not married to Nigel yet, you but know. But Lady Marshwood, uh, Crespo can supply everything you want in the way of pyjamas and razors and toothbrushes. Please, <laughs> Mr. Lucas. Oh, I shall be terribly hurt if you but, refuse. Oh, thanks a lot, Lady Marsh. I, I'd like to. Darn. Uh, you rang, lady. Oh, Crestwell, Mr. Don Lucas will be staying the night. The Japanese room, my lady? And tell his lordship that Mr. Lucas has arrived, will you, Crestwell? Oh, and ask them all to hurry up. We'll have coffee in here. Very good, my lady. <laughs> How extraordinary to think that the last time I saw you and dear Miranda together, you were carrying her practically naked through a burning village. <laughs> Wouldn't you like a drink? Oh, thank you. Thank, th thanks a lot. <laughs> well, do help yourself. You don't want to go back into the dining room, do you, Miranda, and have any more of that disgusting sweet? No, uh, thank you. Then sit down, dear, and relax. Ah, there you are, Nigel. This is Mr. Don Lucas, my son, Lord Marshwood. Hello there. How do you do? He'd driven all the way from London to say goodbye to Miranda. They're old friends, you know. Yes, I do know. And believe it or not, he intended to drive all the way back again immediately. Oh, have you ever heard of anything so absurd? Fortunately, I was able to persuade him to stay the night, at least. Stay the night? Yes. Oh, don't worry. Crestwell has everything under control. We've decided on the Japanese room. Oh, of course. A very good idea. How thoughtful of you, Mother. Ah, Cynthia. Cynthia, this is Mr. Don Lucas. He obviously doesn't need any introduction, really, does he? <laughs> Lady Hailing. How do you do? Hi. Mrs. Moxton. How do you do? Mr. Hi. Lucas. Yes. Admiral Hailing. How do you do, though? And my Hello. nephew, Peter Ennington. How do you do? Hi. <laughs> well, well, is this the first time you've ever been in England, Mr. Lucas? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. Oh, <laughs> imagine. Oh, how extraordinary. I, I, I do hope you're enjoying it. Oh, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, I was in America once in 1922, Norfolk, Virginia. Did you know it? No, sir. Well, I was commanding a light cruiser squadron in the West Indies. Uh, we had to put in at Norfolk because of boiler trouble. It was damned hot. 
Boiler trouble sounds hot anyway, doesn't it? Oh, coffee. Thank you, Cresswell. Uh, Nigel and Peter, you can hand things round. Mm, yes. Are you going to be in England long, Mr. Lucas? No, I've got to get back. I've got to start in a new picture. Oh, how exciting. What is it to be about? Oh, it's an old story. The oldest story in the world. It's about a bum. What an odd subject for a moving picture. Felicity, dear. A bum doesn't mean quite the same in America as it does in England. A bum is a guy who hasn't any place to go, who hasn't got anything to live for. Just bums around wishing he was dead. Darn. Oh, it sounds very sad. Will it have a happy ending? No, ma'am. That's not the way it goes. It's not the way it goes at all. Excuse me. Oh, oh dear, poor Mr. Lucas. He seems upset about something. You'd better go after him, Peter, and for heaven's sake, keep him away from the shrubbery. If Elsie Mumby sees him, she'll give a wolf call. All right, I'm going. Did you know he was coming, Miranda? Of course I didn't. I think it was very inconsiderate of you to ask him to stay, Mother. It would have been far more inconsiderate to have let him go all the way to London in the middle of the night. Have you finished your coffee, Moxie? Nigel, take her cup, dear. <sighs> you asked me before dinner, Mother, when Miranda and I were going to be married. Well, of course I did, darling. We're all dying to know. And I replied, if you remember, as soon as possible. Oh, certainly I remember. Well, I've changed my mind. Nigel. It's going to be sooner than possible. It's going to be on Monday. I have the license already. We shall drive up to London in the morning and be married in the afternoon. Oh, isn't that a little impulsive, dear? I don't care how impulsive it is. That's how it's going to be. That's not how it's going to be. But, Moxie, Moxie, did I fail to see that this is any business of yours. I'm sorry, my lady. I can't bear it any more. I really can't. What are you talking about? About you and Miss Miranda Frail, my lord. You're not going to marry her on Monday, uh, nor any other what? day of the week. You're not going to marry her at all. What's dear. the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind? Moxie, dear, for heaven's sake, don't say any more. It won't do any good. Oh, let her go on, Felicity. She might just as well now that she's started. It will at least clear the air. Clear the air? I'm sorry if you think I'm letting you down, milady, but I can't go through with it any longer. I would like his lordship to know a few facts before he marries my sister. Moxie! Oh, my God! Dora! That's right, dear. Dora. The one who ill-treated you when she was drunk and died in sordid circumstances. Oh, dear. It has really got out of control. What are you doing here? I don't understand. I thought you were dead. You never thought any such thing, Frida. Frida. You never cared whether I was dead or alive. Oh, God. Who's and if Frida? you think you are going to flounce about as mistress of this house, which has been my home for 19 years, you've got another thing coming. Really, Please, Moxie. Nigel. I'd like to go to my room. This is all too insufferable. Oh, dead right, it's insufferable. It all sounded very touching. You standing in a slum, gazing up at the window of the room your mother died in. Well, it may interest you to know, miss, that your mum died in St. Thomas's Hospital. And ten to one she wouldn't have died at all if you hadn't broken her heart, running off to America with that greasy little agent, behaving like a tart. Oh, how dare you speak to me like that. Don't listen to her. Don't listen to her. Poverty and squalor indeed. A London cockney born within the sound of bow bells. You were born at number three station road, Sidcup. And if you can hear the sound of bow bells from Sidcup, you must have the ears of an elk hound. I can't bear any more. I can't. I can't. Take me away, Nigel. Take me away. Oh, Lord. If his lordship takes you away and marries you three times over... It won't alter the fact that I am your sister. I really think, Moxie, that you've said enough, dear. Right. Not quite, my lady. I've got to leave this house for good. First thing in the morning. Uh, Moxie. Mm. <clears throat> I can't be your ladyship's maid any longer. What? Not with the best will in the world, I can't. It's all over. Done with. <laughs> Goodbye, my <laughs> lady. <laughs>
Who rang, sir? Yes, Cresswell, I'm feeling lonely. The house is like a tomb. Where is everybody? Well, his lordship went out very early, sir. He said he was going for a long ride. Her ladyship was called at the usual time, mm -hmm. but she hasn't come down yet. Miss Frail hasn't rung for her breakfast. Now there's Mr. Lucas. What about Moxie? Oh, very low-spirited, sir. She's packing. She's really going? Yes, to Bexhill, sir. She says she has friends there. She's catching the 11.15 from Deal. Being a Sunday, it means three changes, sir, but she's adamant. Oh, Lord. Poor Moxie. It seems so damned unfair. Hi. Hello, how are you? Oh, terrible. Hung over. A horse's neck will soon put you right, sir. It'll take a giraffe's neck to make me even able to walk, let alone drive a car. <laughs> You're not thinking of leaving, sir? You bet I am. I'm getting the hell out of here as soon as I can see out of my eyes. Leave it to me, sir. We'll have you ticking over in no time. Excuse me. Look, why don't you sit down? Because if I did, I'd stay down. Last night in the garden, you promised me that you'd pull yourself together and face the future with a smile, remember? Yeah, that was last night. This is today. Ah, good morning, Mr. Lucas. Oh, hi. <laughs> You're just the one I wanted to see. <laughs> Peter, be a darling and go into the garden for a minute, will you? I'm getting rather sick of the garden. Oh, well, the study, then. Anywhere. I want to talk to Mr. Lucas. Okay, pal. Privately. <laughs> now, oh, do sit down, Mr. Lucas. Don, oh. you don't mind if I call you Don, do you? Uh, no. I feel somehow as if we were old friends. Oh, well, thank you, ma'am. And you must call me Felicity. Ma'am sounds so royal. <laughs> it makes me feel as though I were opening something. <laughs> Excuse me, your horse is next, sir. Oh, thanks, Fred. Uh, swallow the three aspirins first, sir, uh, then sip the drink slowly. Yeah. Quite like old times, isn't it, Crestwell? Except that the late Lord Marsh would always chewed the aspirin. Ah. Young Willis is here, my lady. He's been here since 8.15. Oh, tell him to wait, Crestwell. We, we might have a splendid scoop for him later. Uh, very good, my lady. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Felicity, I guess I got a bit high last night and acted like a heel. I'm sorry. Well, we were all washed up, Miranda and me, a long while ago, only I was just too dumb to believe it. But are you so sure? How do you mean? I am Nigel's mother, and therefore what I am going to say is doubly difficult. Now, can I trust you? I mean, really trust you? Well, sure you can. This proposed marriage between Miranda and my son is a mistake. A tragic, ghastly mistake. Because you are the one she loves. The only one she will ever truly love. What? Oh, she told me so. Hey, told you so? Well, not in so many words, but I am a woman, Don. And I knew at once when I saw you together, from the expression in her eyes, the, the tone of her voice, that her heart, her obstinate, capricious heart, belonged to you. Well, she told me I was a snake. That she never wanted to see me again. Well, she said I was a withered limb. Well, people never say things like that unless they are passionately in love. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Don. <laughs> I am really. Uh, what can I do? Oh, just don't do anything. Just... Just wait, and above all, keep up your courage and don't admit defeat. <clears throat> ah, good morning, darling. Did you enjoy your ride? No. Oh, excuse me. Peter. Good morning. I hope you slept all right. Oh, yeah, thanks. What's happening? You ought to know better than to ask that, Peter. Nothing whatever happens on Sunday mornings. Don wants to see the church, don't you, Don? Uh, I thought that you might like to show it to him. Mm -hmm. The tower is Norman, but the rest of it's a good deal later. Later? Oh, you might also show him Mrs. Dunlop's house while you're at it. It isn't far. I don't mind the church, but I draw the line at old Mrs. Dunlop. Oh, she's much better. She's been as happy as a sandboy since her husband died. Now, run along, both of you. Come on, then, Don. Okay, ma'am. Felicity. Ma'am, Felicity. <laughs> Sounds so domestically American, doesn't it? Like Grandma Moses. <laughs> I want to talk to you, Mother. Oh, not just now, darling. I, I've got a million things to do before church. Oh, this desk. Mrs. Crabbe is waiting for the menus, and young Willis has been here since 8.15. Young Willis? Uh, yes, dear. Um, if neither you nor Miranda will give him an interview, I should have to. Oh, you needn't be afraid I should be indiscreet. I'll just fob him off with one of those stories about Miranda's early life. The fact that they're not strictly accurate won't matter at least. Um, they'll just give him something to go on. You're not to say a word to young Willis about Miranda's early life. I absolutely forbid it. But it can't possibly affect you, darling. I mean, the interview won't be until the middle of next week, and you and Miranda will be away on your honeymoon. 
I presume you are going to have a honeymoon somewhere, aren't you? You don't like Miranda, do you? Well, of course I don't. I think she's a perfect ass. Mother! Well, what could be more asinine than that inventing all that nonsense about slums and pubs and gutters, when all the time she was born perfectly respectably at Sidcup? She was only romanticising herself. She was naturally a bit nervous and ill at ease. She probably wasn't thinking what she was saying. She seemed quite at ease to me, sitting there sipping away at that dreadful lemonade. <sighs> well, perhaps you can think of a way out of this situation. I'm damned if I can. Is Moxie going? Yes, to Bex Hill. She's catching the 11.15 from Deal. Oh, I shall join her there in a few days when all this fuss is over. You can't go and live at Bex Hill. I didn't say I was going to live there. I shall just stay in a hotel for a few days while I decide where I'm going to lay my old bones permanently. Oh, old bones, indeed. You haven't the slightest intention of leaving this house, and you never have. Now, there, you're wrong. When you marry Miranda, I shall certainly leave this house. Watching her doing all that embroidery would give me a nervous collapse in a week. How can I marry her now? Well, you can't not marry somebody just because they didn't dance to a barrel organ when they were five. I think your flippancy is unforgivable, Mother, and in the worst possible taste. Oh, it's no oh, use abusing her, darling. Ah, good heavens, back so soon. We couldn't get through the gates, Felicity, the whole village outside. Oh, why, Don, what have you done to your hands? It's oh, red ink from Elsie Mumby's pen. Oh, show him where to wash, Peter. This way, if it dries in, it'll never come off. Really oh, dear, I had a feeling when I woke up this morning that today was going to be difficult, and I was quite right. Is that lachrymose oaf going to stay with us indefinitely? He's not an oaf. He's perfectly charming. And if you had any sense of noblesse oblige, you'd ask him to be your best man. Thank you for everything, Mother. You've been a great comfort to me. Oh, dear. Uh, more autograph books, my lady. Shall I put this lot with the other? Yes, please, Crestwell. Oh, and you'd better tell young Willis to go away. I fear we shall have no definite news until later in the day. Yes, my lady. Oh, and Cresswell, you might have Mr. Lucas's card brought round. We may be needing it. Oh, and did you give Miss Frail my message? Yes, my lady. She should be down soon. Uh, how did she look? Uh, a bit papery, my lady. I don't oh. think she slept very well. She inquired about trains to London. Lady uh, Marshall? Uh, well, that'll be all for the moment, my lady. Yes, thank you, Cresswell. Oh, good morning, Miranda, dear. I do hope you slept well. I hardly slept at all. Oh, you poor dear. Well, you must be exhausted. Would you like some coffee or bovril or... No, thank, thank you. you. Huh. Your butler said you wanted to speak to me urgently. Yes, I wanted to ask you a favor. A favor? You see, I want uh, you to grant an exclusive interview to our local paper. Oh, I know you've been battered to death by this sort of thing as a rule, but Willis is a special protégé, and it would mean so much to him. I'm afraid I can't, Lady Marshwood. I'm going away. Going away? I don't feel that I could possibly stay, not as long as my sister's in the house. Oh, but she lives here. She's lived here for 19 years. I don't care where she lives. I never want to set eyes on her again. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. I couldn't move without her. You see, I'm devoted to her. Uh, but Moxie and I won't be in the house all the time, you know. I mean, well, we shall go away sometimes on on little visits. You mean that you're going on living here after we're married? Mm, naturally, my dear. It happens to be my home, you know. I lived here steadily through Nigel's first marriage. Of course, it didn't last very long, but that wasn't my fault. At least, well, I don't think it was. And Dora? Moxie, or whatever you call her? Is she going to live here too? But of course. We shall all doubtless jog along together all right after a while. But it's quite out of the question. It would be intolerable. Well, it would be much more intolerable for me if she went away. But you must see. Oh, I'd be absolutely helpless without her. I'd never be in time for a single meal. My hair would be all over the place, and I should be covered in safety pins from head to toe. Now, look here, Lady Marshwood. I admit that I haven't behaved very well to Dora, and I'm sorry for it. But before I set foot in this house as Nigel's wife, she's going to be out of it for good. On the contrary. She will receive you at the front door. We might even prevail upon her to drop you a curtsy. The press photographers would love it. You forget one thing. Nigel happens to be in love with me. He won't stand by and allow me to be publicly humiliated. Are you so sure? What do you mean by that? Nigel is my son, Miranda. And like his father before him, he has one ingrained temperamental defect. He detests scenes and runs like a stag at the very first sign of a domestic crisis. Are you trying to suggest that owing to all this, this business of Dora being your maid, that he won't marry me? Certainly not. Nigel is a man of his word. I'm merely giving you a word of warning. 
Well, as it seems fairly obvious that we are destined to have an endless series of unpleasant scenes during the next few years, I think we might curtail this one now. <laughs> Don't you? <sighs> we usually leave for church just before 11. Oh! Oh! oh. Miranda! <laughs> Nigel! Why, well, I thought you were asleep. Asleep? I haven't closed my eyes all night. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I'm going away. Now, this morning... I'm catching the 11.15 from Deal. You can't possibly. And why not, I should like to know? It's an awful train. You'll have to change twice. Ashford and Maidstone. Your mother has insulted me. Oh, I'm sure she didn't mean to. You really mustn't take Mother seriously. She just rattles on, you know. She doesn't mean half, she says. She says she's going to live in this house with us. Is that true? Of course it is. She's always lived here. Nigel! Oh, now do calm down, darling. You won't have to see much of her. Except in the evenings. She has a tremendous amount to do during the day. She runs the whole place, and the village, too. She's on God knows how many committees. She's practically an institution. She hates me. Don't you understand? She hates me. Nonsense. You're imagining things. She's probably a bit irritable this morning. She has a lot to try her. She has a lot to try her. What about me? Now, look here, Miranda. You don't love me. That's clear enough, at any rate. You never came near me last night. Well, you slammed the door in my face. And this morning, without a word of sympathy or understanding, you went out horseback riding. We just say riding in England. The horseback is taken for granted. I'm not going to live in this house with your mother, and that is final. As my wife, Miranda, I should expect you to live where I live and do what I ask you to do and make every effort to be on good terms with my mother. Hmm. I loathe and detest family scenes, and what is more, I have no intention of putting up with them. And I can see no earthly reason, with goodwill on both sides, why you and mother shouldn't jog along perfectly happily together. Oh! 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 Hey. Go away. Oh, don't cry. You know it always ties me up in knots to see you cry. I can't bear any more. I can't. Well, what's happened, kid? That stuffed shirt said it's only going to upset you. No, Don, it's nothing. Please go away. I shall be all right in a minute. Well, how can I go away and leave you like this? You must, Don. You really must. There isn't anything you can do. Well, why were you crying? A moment of weakness, that's all. I just felt suddenly lonely and sort of bewildered. Oh, Pete. Life can be very cruel sometimes, Don. Especially to oversensitive, trusting fools like me. You're no fool, Pete. You're smart as a whip. You always have been. You're not going to let this this bunch of copy society bit players give you the runaround, are you? You, Miranda Frail. What's the use of talking? I can't walk out now. I've signed the contract. You walked out of dreams cannot lie after they've been shooting for two weeks. Now, where's your spirit? Why, they even suspended you for three months and you laughed in their faces. At least they can't suspend you here. They can do worse than that. They can torture me and humiliate me. They can. They can break my heart. Not while I'm around, they can. Oh. I'm the guy that loves you. Oh. Remember? He. Oh. Do hurry up, everyone. Very well, Mother. Oh, really, Miranda, this is becoming monotonous. I feel that you and I have nothing further to say to each other, Lady Marshwood. Oh, dear, I'm afraid that will make our long winter evenings together rather insipid. Hmm, it looks as though I shall have to have a television after all. What does this mean, Miranda? It means that I'm going away. I know you are. You said so a little while ago. I'll drive you up after lunch. You can't possibly go by train. Don is going to drive me up before lunch. Aren't you, Don? You bet I am. Well, we really can't stand about arguing as to who drives who. We should be late for church. Mr. Don Lucas's car is at the door from the radio. Okay, come on, Pete. Pete, I would rather you didn't drive to London with Mr. Lucas, Miranda. You can just quit ordering her about from now on. See, she's coming with me now. Please don't be belligerent, Don. It's quite unnecessary. You're not rescuing anybody from the Japanese now, you know. I'm sorry, ma'am, Felicity, but she's coming with me right away. She's not going to stay here and be tortured and humiliated anymore. You insist on leaving with Mr. Lucas, Miranda? Yes, I do. I couldn't stay here. I couldn't live in this house, not with things as they are. I was a fool ever to think I could. I'm walking out on you, Nigel. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. And you can tell my sister from me that she can go on doing your mother's hair for as long as she has any to do. Come on, Don. Sorry, ma'am, but there it is. Oh, poor Miranda. She's been on edge all the morning. 
This is all you're doing, Mother. I hope you're satisfied. You engineered the whole thing. You deliberately drove her into the arms of that lout. I did not. She's been in and out of his arms like a jack-in-the-box ever since he set foot in this house. You wanted to get rid of her and you succeeded. You're absolutely delighted. And you? Are you going to stand there and pretend that you're heartbroken? <laughs> you seem to forget that I'm your mother, dear. I brought you into the world in the middle of Ascot Week, and I know you through and through. You never really love Miranda any more than you really love any of the others. Of course I'm delighted. We're all delighted. And now, for heaven's sake, let's go. We're terribly late, and the last bell must have gone ages ago. Ah, there you are, Moxie. I couldn't think what had happened to you. I've come to say goodbye, milady. Oh, rubbish. Take off your hat and don't be so silly. But, milady... Now, do as I tell you. And for heaven's sake, somebody give me some money for the collection. But, uh... There's nothing more to worry about. I haven't time to go on about it now, but Cresswell will explain. <laughs> but, but, milady... Now, come along, everybody. Cresswell, give Moxie a glass of sherry. She looks as if she's going to fall down. Come, Nigel. It's your first Sunday at home, and you must try to look as if nothing had happened. After all, when you analyse it, nothing much has, has it? Oh. Cheer up, Moxie. Everything's all right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Peter. Oh, dear. Oh, snap out of it now, Dora. You heard what he said. It's all very fine for you. You have made a public exhibition of yourself. You haven't been humiliated by your own flesh and blood. Oh, I shall never be able to hold my head up again. In that case, we shall have to settle for it hanging down, shan't we? <laughs> Here. Away with melancholy. Have a swig of this. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Fred. As I see the situation, Dora, you're not the one who's been humiliated. Your only mistake, if I might be permitted to venture a slight criticism, is that you didn't take the golden opportunity when you had it to give your own flesh and blood a nice, healthy slap in the chops. Oh, Fred. I give you a toast, Dora. I drink solemnly to you and me in our humble but on the whole honourable calling. I drink also to her ladyship and his lordship, groaning beneath the weight of privilege but managing to keep their peckers up all the same. Above all, I drink to the final, inglorious disintegration of the most unlikely dream that ever troubled the foolish heart of man, social equality. Nobody's ever going to stop you talking, are they? <laughs> it would, I admit, be a Herculean task, but should you at any time feel disposed to have a whack at it, you have only to say the word. <laughs> That'll be the day, it's no mistake. <laughs> what about another nip at the Amontillado? <laughs> I don't mind if I do. <laughs> In Relative Values by Noel Coward, Moxie was played by Gwen Cheryl, Crestwell by Bill Fraser, Felicity by Joyce Redman, Nigel by John Rye, Miranda by Joanna Wake, and Don Lucas by John Rowe. Charles Hodgson played Peter, Deborah Page, Alice, Garrard Green, the Admiral, and Gladys Spencer, Lady Hailing. The play was produced and directed by John Cardy. This Happy Breed by Noel Coward with John Moffat as Frank Gibbons, Rosemary Leach as Ethel, Doris Hare as Mrs. Flint, and Robert Lang as Bob Mitchell. The action of the play takes place in the dining room of number 17, Sycamore Road, Clapham Common, in the years between the two world wars. It begins on a June evening in 1919. The Gibbons family have just moved in. Oh, 
What is Frank doing, Ethel? Putting up the curtains in the front bedroom. He'll have the house down in a minute. Well, they've got to go up before we go to bed tonight. We can't have the whole neighbourhood watching us undress, can we? Nobody's thought to put any in my room. I suppose I don't matter. Oh, do shut up, grumbling mother. Your room is at the back. And I was thinking Mr. Watson's there next door. Happens to go out into the garden and looks up. I don't know what is the matter with you today, Mother. Really, I don't. Moving in's no picnic anyhow, and it only makes things worse to keep complaining all the time. Me complain? Oh, I like that, I must say. I've had a splitting headache ever since two o'clock, and I haven't so much as mentioned it. Cheer up. You'll feel better when you've had a nice cup of tea. If I ever have a nice cup of tea. Well, the kettle's on, but Sylvia isn't back yet. Oh, Sylvia. She had to go to the UK stores, and that's quite a way. She wouldn't have had to do that if she hadn't forgotten to get half the things you told her to order. That girl's getting sillier and sillier every breath she takes. Her and her anemia. <laughs> I don't know how you and Frank put up with it, and that's a fact. But I couldn't let my own sister-in-law live all by herself, now could I? Especially after all she's been through. Oh, she's been through indeed. I suppose you'd be saying that she wasn't engaged to Bertie and he wasn't killed and they lived happy ever after. Sylvia hasn't been through no more than anyone else has. Not so much of the truth, but no. What she needs is a job of work. She's too delicate. You know what the doctor said. Oh, that doctor say anything. Look how he went on over Queenie's whooping cough, frightening us all to death. Isn't that the front door? Yes, I gave Sylvia a key. She's probably lost it. Perhaps she's been run over. And it's the police come to tell us. Well, you've taken your time, Sylvia, I must say. Well, I'd like to see you any quicker with this lot to carry. Oh, my poor back. It was your feet this afternoon. Well, it's my back now, so there. What's that hammering? Frank, he's putting up the curtains in the front bedroom. I shall be glad when we're settled in, and no mistake. Here's Sil, go and fix the food. There's a dear. Oh. I've got to get this room straight. No peace for the wicked. Mother, you might go and help us. Oh. Now, go on, Mother. You've sat there quite long enough. Now, it's all very fine for you. You're a young woman. Where do you get to my age? Oh. I just tacked them for the time being. Supper will be ready soon. You look tired. <laughs> I've been doing too much. The docs are silly. I mean, you've been at it all day. Well, what do you expect me to do? Sit down by the fire and read a nice book? All right, snappy. Oh, they haven't half left that garden in a mess. Wait till I get after it. Here, bit of luck about that may tree, isn't it? I never noticed it. Well, you wouldn't. Well, a fat lot of time I've had to stand around looking at may trees through the French windows. Do you like it? Like what? The house, silly. You haven't said a word. Of course I like it. Oh, I can't hardly believe it, you know, not really. It's all been so quick. <laughs> You've been demobbed and coming home and getting the job through Mr Baxter. Now here we are, moved in, all inside of six weeks. Good old Baxter. We ought to drink his health. We haven't got anything to drink it in except Sylvia's wing car. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll have to take the will for the deed. Oh. What's up? I don't know. I just can't get over not having that awful weight on my mind all the time. How do you mean? Oh, you know. What, me perishing on a field of slaughter? <laughs> oh, what a chance. There was a chance every minute of every day for four years, and don't you forget it. I used to feel sick every time the postman came. Well, there's no sense in going on about it now. It's all over and done with. Oh, we're lucky. It isn't so over and done with for some people. I mean, look at poor old Mrs Worsley. I mean, two sons gone and her husband. And Mrs Cross with that boy she was so proud of, done in for life. Can't even feed himself properly. We're lucky, all right. We ought to be grateful. Who too? Now then, Frank. All right, all right, I won't start any arguments. You can say your prayers till kingdom come if you like, but you can't expect me to. Not after all I've seen. I don't hold with a god who just singles a few out to be nice to and lets all the others rot. He can get on with it for all I care. Look, it's wrong to talk like that, Frank. It's blasphemy. Sorry, old girl, I've got to talk the way I feel. Anyhow, I'm back, aren't I? That's a fact. Instead of lying out there dead in a shell hole, I'm sitting here alive in number 17, Sycamore Road, Clapham Common. That's another fact. It's nobody's fault, not mine or yours or God's or anyone's. It's just happened like that. 
You went to the war because it was your duty. I went to the and... war because I wanted to. Would you go again? I expect so. Well, I wouldn't let you, see? Not again. I'd rather kill you with my own hands. Now, what's the use of upsetting yourself? There isn't going to be another war. There'll always be wars as long as men are such fools as to want to go to well, them. Well, let's stop talking about it, shall we? Everything's all right. You're here, I'm here, children are fine, except for Queenie's tonsils, and we've got a home of our own at last. Yeah. Everything is more than all right. It's wonderful. Oh, Frank. <laughs> Poor old girl. <laughs> Living four years with your mother can't have been all jam, I will say. I think I was better <laughs> off in the trenches. You ought to be ashamed saying such things. Oh, well, yeah, your mother's all right, no way, but that house in Battersea, oh, dear, oh, dear, gave me the willies after five weeks, let alone four years. I must go and help her and seal with the supper. Yeah, wait. Let's have a look at you. What for? Well, just to see what's happened to your face. I don't seem to have had time for a really good look since I've been back. Now, stop it. Leave no, me. Oh, no, oh, oh, still... Well, hmm, it's not a bad face as far as faces go, I will say. Well, thanks very much, I'm sure. Of course, it's not quite as young as it was when I married it. But, no, leave no, no, but still, taken by and large, I wouldn't change it. Now then. Now then what? Give us a kiss. I'll do no such thing. Why not, may I ask? Because we haven't got no time for fooling about. Oh, turning nasty, are we? We'll soon see about that. Now, yeah, thank you, <laughs> Oh, just in time, old born in the vestry. Oh, I, uh, I hope I don't intrude. I lived next door. Came through the garden. To say my missus and I thought, if you needed anything in the way of groceries or whatnot... Well, I'll be damned. Frank! Mitchell. Bob Mitchell. Uh, that's right. Well, don't you remember me? Frank Gibbons, the Buffs B Company, Festival, 1915. My God! It's old Gibbo! <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Oh, you old son of a gun. Well, I <laughs> My God, I thought you was dead as mutton after that night attack. When we'd gone on to Givenchy and left your lot in the mud. Uh, me, dead as mutton? I'm tougher than that. Only one small hole through my leg in four years. <laughs> How did you make out? Well, not so bad. Got gassed in 1917, but I'm all right now. Made me chest a bit weak, that's all. <laughs> it's a small world and no mistake. <laughs> Um, uh, don't you think you'd better introduce me, Frank? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, uh, this is my wife, Ethel, uh, Bob Mitchell. Pleased to meet you, Mrs Gibbons. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. How long have you been here? Over a year now. We took the house when I got my discharge in March 1918. Oh. I couldn't do any work for a while, but I had my pension, and Nora had a little put by. Now I'm doing fine, in the insurance business. Oh. Nora would have come herself, Mrs Gibbons, but she's... A bit under the weather this evening. You see, we're expecting a little stranger almost any day now. Oh, her first. Oh, no. We've got a boy of 14. Wants to be a sailor. What a coincidence. After four bloody years. Frank. Well, if they weren't bloody, nothing was. I'm afraid we haven't anything to offer you, Mr Mitchell. You, you see, everything's upside down. You can stay and have whatever we're having. No, thanks. All the same. I'll have to be getting back to Nora. I'll go and fetch Sylvia's wind harness. Oh, dear. <laughs> have uh, you got a job yet? Yes, yes, I had a bit of luck. A uh, chap called Baxter in my regiment. Before the war, he was running a sort of uh, travel agency in Oxford Street. Well, he got a blighty one, was invalided home, and believe it or not, he was the first one I ran into when I got back last April. Oh. He'd started his business again, things were beginning to pick up. So he gave me a job. Travel agency? Phew! Tours of the battlefields, oh, thank you. <laughs> well, that's a good one. Uh, some people certainly do have queer ways of enjoying themselves. You've got kids, haven't you? I remember you talking about them. Yes, three. Two girls and a boy. They're with Ethel's aunt in Broadstairs. We oh. didn't want them under our feet while we were moving in. How old are they? Well, Reg, that's the boy, uh, he's 12. Queenie's 13, Vi's 14. My Billy's getting old for 15. <laughs> oh, it seems funny, this, doesn't it? <laughs> When you think of the last time we had a jaw. Here you are. Are you sure you won't stay and take pot luck with us, Mr Mitchell? Thanks very much, Mrs Gibbons, but I really must get back. Well, will you ask your wife when it would be convenient for me to pop in and see her? Any time. Any time at all. Thank you very much, I'm sure. Good night. Good night. Here you are, old man. Thanks. Tastes a bit funny, but it's better than nothing. Happy days. Happy days.
Six years have passed. It's Christmas afternoon, 1925. I'll now propose a toast to the two strangers within our gates this Christmas day. <laughs> Welcome. Thrice welcome, oh, Sam Ledbitter and Phyllis Blake. Oh, thank you. You ought to mention the lady first. Sweeping aside the annoying interruptions of my sister, who is being far too bossy, as usual, oh, oh. I will now call upon my old and valued friend, <laughs> Sam Ledbitter, to say a few words. Yes, oh, big valued friend. <laughs> yeah. I know come, come on, Sam, Sam. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, comrades. Make that your mind. Comrades. In thanking you for your kind hospitality on this festive day, ah. I would like to say that it is both a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Oh, here, here. <laughs> Though, as you know, holding the views I do, it's really against my principles to hobnob to any great extent with the bourgeoisie. Mm. What's that? I think it means common in a nice way. Order! Oh, oh, right. I cannot but feel that today, what with being Christmas and one thing and another, it would be but right and proper to put aside all prejudice and class hatred. Oh, very nice of you, I'm sure. <laughs> As you well know, there are millions and millions of homes in this country today where Christmas is naught but a mockery, where there is neither warmth nor food nor even the bare necessities of life, mm. where little children, old before their time, huddle round a fireless grate... Oh, they'd be just as well off if they stayed in the middle of the room then, wouldn't they? Shut up, Queenie. <laughs> that sort of remark, Queenie, springs from complacency, arrogance and a full stomach. You man. leave my stomach out of it. It is people like you, apathetic, unthinking, docile supporters of a capitalistic system, which is a disgrace to civilization, who are responsible for at least three-quarters of the cruel suffering of the world. Here, yeah, yeah. here. Huh. It doesn't matter to you that the greatest struggle for the betterment of mankind that has ever been in the history of the world is going on under your noses. <sighs> oh, no! You haven't even noticed it. You're too busy getting all weepy about Rudolf Valentino to spare any tears for the workers of the world whose whole lives are made hideous by oppression, injustice and capitalistic greed. Don't get excited, Sam. Queenie didn't mean it. I am not excited! Queenie doesn't mean anything to me anyway. Oh, pardon me all while I go and commit suicide. But what she represents, what she symbolises, means a great deal. She is only one of the millions who, when the great day comes, will be swept out of existence like so much chaff on the wind. Well, it's nice to know, isn't it? I've said my say. Thank you very much. Here, here. Bravo. I don't know what you're saying bravo about, I'm sure. I think Sam's been very rude. You don't understand, Queenie. If you did, you wouldn't have kept interrupting all the time and trying to be funny. I suppose you understand all of it. No, I don't, but I'm trying to. I suppose we should soon be having you standing up on a soapbox in Hyde Park and making a fat head of yourself. Oh. It's time we were clearing up. The boys can go into the front room. We left Mum and Dad and Granny alone quite long enough. Come on, Sam. Come to my room for a minute and have a cigarette. Better not let your father catch you. I'm sorry if I was rude, Vi. Doesn't matter, Sam. And you can't expect everybody in the world to feel just the same as you do, you know? Sam's got more knowledge and intelligence than all of us put together. If that's the case, it wouldn't do him any harm to remember it once in a while and not shout so much. Oh, come on, Sam. Right. Can I help, Vi? Yes, Phil. You might put the preserved fruits in the sideboard cupboard. The sweets can go in there too, but leave one dish out to take into the front room. Sam got quite upset, didn't he? <laughs> He's a bit bolshy, that's all that's the matter with him. I didn't understand Arthur what he was talking about. I don't expect he understood much of it himself. Reg thinks he's wonderful. Reg thinks anybody who can use a few long words is wonderful. He'll soon get over it. It has been nice you letting me spend Christmas Day with you. I don't know what I'd have done all by myself in that house in Wandsworth with Auntie Hill and everything. Oh, good heavens, who's that? I'll go. Billy! What a surprise! I thought you was going back to your ship this morning. No, no, not till tonight. Hello, Queenie. Hello. Oh, oh I better leave the window on the latch. Dad will be over in a minute. OK. Do you know Miss Blake? Mr Mitchell. Oh, uh, pleased to meet you. Oh, likewise. <laughs> Where's Reg? Upstairs with Sam. Oh, he's here, is he? I'll say he is. I wonder you didn't hear him. He's been bellowing like a bull. Down with the dirty capitalists. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I know all that stuff by heart. We've got a couple of them in my ship. Not bad chaps, really, you know. Just got everything a bit cock-eyed, that's all. <laughs> it must be lovely being a sailor. 
Well, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say lovely exactly, but it's not bad and you do get about. Join the Navy and see the world, you know. Go on, you've never been further than South Sea. Oh, lots of time. Next year I'll probably be sent to the China Station. Think of that. The China Station sounds funny, doesn't it? Like as though it was on the underground. Oh. <laughs> we ought to go into the front room now. Mum will be wondering what's happened to us. I'll be a sport and going in then. I, I want to talk to Queenie a minute. Oh, so that's how it is, is it? I don't know what you're talking about, I'm sure. Come on, Phil. We know when we're not wanted. Well, I, I don't see why we don't all go. Oh, I want to talk to you a minute. I just said so, didn't I? Come on, Phil. Right. Well, maybe I don't want to talk to you. Well, if you're going to be high and mighty about it, it's all right with me. I only thought that as I was going back on duty tonight... Well, that... fancy asking By and Phil to go out and leave us alone. You ought to have known better. I shall never hear the last of it. Oh, so that's what's worrying you, is it? It's not worrying me at all. I just thought it sounded sort of silly, that's all. I don't see what's so silly about it. Fi knows we went to the Majestic on Friday night and she saw us with her own eyes walking down Elm Park Road on Sunday. She must guess there's something doing. Well, if she does, she's wrong, so there. There isn't. Here, half a minute. What's got into you, anyway? I haven't done anything wrong, have I? I don't like being taken for granted. No girl does. How do you mean, taken for granted? You can't hold hands with someone all through desert love and the next minute expect them to treat you like the Empress of Russia. Oh, don't talk so silly. Aren't you going to kiss me goodbye? Oh, look here, Queenie. If you think I ought to have said that about wanting to talk to you alone in front of Vi, I'm sorry. See, I, I can't say more than that. Now, can I? No, I suppose not. Well, then? Oh, all right. I do love you, Queenie. You know that, don't you? Yes. I, I wouldn't do anything to upset you. You know that, don't you? Oh, Billy. I wish you weren't going back so soon. Will you write to me every now and again? Even if it's only a postcard? If you'll write to me. Oh, that's easy. Promise? Yes. Cross my heart. You're the sweetest girl I ever met in all my life, or ever will meet, either. Oh, that's easy to say, but how do you know? Oh, never you mind. It's true. A little later on, when I'm earning a bit more, do you think we might have a shot at getting married? Oh, Bill, how do I know? You might be in China or anywhere. You might have forgotten all about me by then. Oh, more likely to be the other way round. Pretty kid like you, working at being a manicurist, talking to all sorts of different fellas all day long. And... Oh. It isn't all jam being a sailor's wife, is it? I wouldn't be so bad. If I get my promotion and get on... Don't say anything now. Just think it over. Oh, Billy, I wouldn't be the right sort of wife for you. Really, I wouldn't. I want too much. How do you mean? I know it sounds silly, but I'm not like Vi. She's a quiet one. I'm different. Mum sometimes says that all I think of is having a good time, but it isn't only that. Oh, I it's... don't see no harm in wanting to have a good time. That's what everybody wants in one way or another. <laughs> I'll tell you something awful. I hate living here. I hate living in a house that's exactly like hundreds of other houses. I hate coming home from work in the tube. I hate washing up and listening to Aunt Sylvia keeping on about how ill she is all the time. And, and what's more, I know why I hate it too. It's because it's all so common. There. I expect you'll think I'm getting above myself and I wouldn't blame you. Maybe I am. I can't help it. That's why I don't think I'd be a good wife for you. However much I loved you. And I do. I really do. Oh, Benny. Come on now. Cheer up. You don't want to have red eyes on Christmas Day, do you? I'm sorry, Bill. Please. Forgive me. Oh. oh, Billy. What are you doing here all by yourself? I've been talking to Queenie. Was that uh, her rushing upstairs just now? Yes. Oh. I see. 
I just popped in to say goodbye. And a bit miserable having to go back to work on Christmas night, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. It, it's all right once you're there. Mr. Gibbons. Yes, son. If in two or three years' time, when I've worked my way up a bit, Queenie and me got married, would you mind? If Queenie wanted to, it wouldn't matter whether I minded or not. She'd get her own way. She always does. Well, she's certainly got a will of her own, all right. And what does she think about it? Well, that's the trouble. I, I, I think she thinks that being a sailor's wife might be rather hard going. Mm. She likes having a good time, our Queenie. But maybe she'll calm down later on. Here's hoping, anyhow. Oh, thanks, Mr Gibbons. I, I think I'll be getting along now. Mother always gets a bit depressed on my last day of leave. How is she? Uh, as well as can be expected. No. Oh. Hmm. Well, thank you again, Mr Gibbons. Good luck. <sighs> Frank, you are awful creeping out like that. You knew Sylvia was waiting to sing. And what about you? I came to find you. No, yes, we know all about that. <laughs> Do you want the light on? No, it's all right like this. Is Reg in there? Yes, he came in a minute ago with that Sam Lead bitter. <laughs> What's the betting they've been smoking themselves silly up in Reggie's room? Well, it is Christmas. Yeah. I don't think much of that Sam Lead bitter taken all round. Seems a bit soft to me. Mm, I wouldn't call him soft exactly. Well, you know what I mean. All that talking big. He'll get himself into trouble one of these days, you mark my words. No, he'll grow out of it. I used to shoot me neck off to beat the band when I was his age. Oh, not like he does, though. I mean, all that stuff about world revolution and the great day and down with everything. You had more sense than that. Anyhow, I wouldn't mind so much if it wasn't for Reg taking every word he says as gospel. No, I shouldn't say a word if I was you. Let them get it out of their systems. It is wrong, isn't it? All that bullshit business. Oh, there's something to be said for it. There's always something to be said for everything. And where they go wrong is trying to get things done too quickly. We don't like doing things quickly in this country. It's like gardening. Someone once said we was a nation of gardeners and they weren't far wrong. We're used to planting things, watching them grow, looking out for changes in the weather. Tell me you and your garden. Oh, well, it's true. I mean, think of what a mess it'd be if all the flowers and vegetables and crops came popping up all in a minute. <laughs> Well, that's what all these social reformers are trying to do. Try to alter the way of things all at once. Now, what works in other countries won't work in this one. We've got our own way of settling things. Maybe slow, maybe a bit dull, but it suits us all right, and it always will. <sighs> we ought to go back, really. It'll be tea time in a minute. It's cosy in here. <laughs> Oh, it's getting quite dark, isn't it? <laughs> Five months pass. It is a late evening in May. The year, 1926. Dad ought to be home soon. It's getting on for eleven. You going to wait up for him, Mum? Yes. I'm all right. It feels sort of flat now, doesn't it? It's all been over, I mean. It's wicked. That's what it is. Down out wicked. Those strikers upsetting the old country like this. I wish Reg had come home. I wish I knew where he was. I'll give that Sam Ledbetter a piece of my mind when I see him. Encouraging Reg to make a fool of himself. I was talking to Mr Rogers only a couple of weeks ago. His brother works up north, you know, and he said that conditions were something terrible. Oh, you and your Mr Rogers. He's been very kind to me and I like him so there. You give me a pain, Sylvia. Really, you do the way you keep on about that man. Just because he pays you a few shillings for designing those Christmas cards and calendars. 
You're doing nothing more or less than throwing yourself at his head. Mrs Flint, how can you? Oh, do shut up, you two. I've got enough to think about without listening to you two snapping at each I'm other. I'm sure I haven't said anything. Oh, yes, you have. You're always giving Sylvia sly digs about Mr Rogers. If he's taken a fancy to her, so much the better. She's oh. old enough to look after herself, heavens knows. <laughs> and if he'd murdered his wife and strangled his children and run off to Australia with her, it still wouldn't be anything to do with you, so shut up. Oh, help me up. Help me up. I am not going to stay here and be insulted by my own daughter. You're not being insulted by anyone. Be quiet. It's all my fault. I'm in the way in this house. I always have been. Well, it's a pity you stayed so long, then, isn't it? Oh, Ethel, how can you? I'll leave tomorrow. I'll never set foot in this house again. Mm, and a good job, oh, too. Oh, my oh, oh, oh. Your mother didn't mean it. She's nervy tonight. We all are. Don't care how nervous she is. If only I had my health and strength, I'm sure I wouldn't have to be beholden to anybody. Health and strength, indeed. You're as strong as a cart. Oh. Take your grandmother up to bed, by for God's sake. Come on, Granny, come I'll on. Stop. It's all, all right, it's all right. I can manage it. You're not going to sell one on your head, I've got a strike as I've got it. It's only answer me and Granny as usual. Oh, that's right, blame me. Everything's always my I'm fault. An then, I'm an old yeah. woman. And the sooner I'm dead, the better. Oh, I know you're all waiting to see me in my car. Don't toss a silly, Gran. Come on. Mom. Have another cup of tea, Mum. It'll buck you up. Oh, no, I'm all right. Oh, you slip along up to bed. There's a good girl. No, I'd rather wait till Dad comes. Would you like me to wait up for Frank Ethel and you go to bed? No, thanks, Sylvia. I couldn't sleep anyway. Oh, I've been sleeping terribly badly lately, what with all the upset and the heat of everything. Dr Morgan gave me some tablets, but I'm afraid they're not much good. I'll take two tonight just to see what happens. I shouldn't overdo it if I was you. They're quite harmless. Good night, Ethel. Good night, Queen. Good, Good night, night Sylvia. Sylvia. Sleep well. Poor Sylvia. She's a bit of a trial sometimes. I don't know how you stand her, Mum. Well, if it hadn't been for Bertie getting killed, she'd have been all right, I expect. How awful to be so dependent on a man living or dying that he could ruin your whole life. I don't think I ever would be. Well, don't be too sure. If your dad had gone, I wouldn't have been the woman I am today. No, well, you wouldn't have gone on moping about it always, though, would you? I don't rightly know. My heart would have broke. And I suppose I should have had to put it together again as best I could. Oh, Mum. What is it? You do make me feel awful sometimes. Oh, good heavens, child. Why? Oh, you just do. Heard from Billy since he went? Oh, yeah. Just a postcard with a camel on it. A camel? Yeah, his ship stopped somewhere where there was camels, and so he sent me a picture of one. <laughs> his poor mother misses him something dreadful. We all miss him, really, don't we? Yeah. I suppose we do. <gasps> oh, there's the bell. Yeah, it's all right, I'll go. I'll get it. Oh, OK. Oh, hello, Phil. Hello, boy. Oh, hello. Hello. Please forgive me for calling so late, Mrs That's Gibbons. All right, but I just popped over on my bike to see if Reggie'd come back yet. Yeah, well, he hasn't. Dad's not back either, but he's due any minute. Him and Mr Mitchell next door have been driving a bus. Both of them? <laughs> Mr Mitchell's a conductor. Have you heard from Reg, Mrs Gibbons? No, I'm afraid not, dear. He's off somewhere with Sam Ledbitter and those men at that club they belong to. I went to Sam's bookshop in the Tottenham Court Road two days ago. Day Reg had a row with Dad and slammed out and said he wasn't coming back. And Sam said he was all right, but he promised not to tell where he was until the strike was over. He'll be all right, Mrs Gibbons. Don't you worry. Oh, I can't help it, I'm afraid. You read in those nasty bits of newspaper they hand around about there being riots and people being arrested and houses being burnt down and soldiers charging the crowd and all believe sorts. what you read in the paper. If you ask me, I shouldn't think he's been doing anything at all but run round the streets hollering. That's all any of them seem to do. I wish he'd come back, whatever he's been doing. I wish your dad hadn't gone on at him like that. I shan't have a moment's peace till I know he's safe. What on earth? Never, never <laughs> <been saved. laughs> Hold your noise, Frank Gibbons. You'll wake up the whole street. Who cares? We have come unscathed, my friend and I, <laughs> through untold perils, <sighs> and you grumble about a bit of noise. You come unscathed through a few public houses, too, or I'm no judge. Uh. You better go and wash while I dish up your supper. Have a drink, Bob. Yeah, you have had quite enough to drink, Frank, and well you know it. Better not, old man. Ethel's right. 
The women are always right. That's why we cherish them, isn't it, Queenie? And you'd mm. better cherish yourself next door, uh, Bob Mitchell. Yeah. Nora'll be having one of her upsets if she's got something hot ready for you and you're not there to eat it. Yeah, all right, all right. I thought I'd just deliver your old man safe and sound into your loving arms. Toodaloo, everybody. Oh, 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 here, Queenie, run into the kitchen and make your dad a bit of toast. Oh, all right, Mum. I'll, uh, I'll give you a hand. I'll get you soup. Mother, you say you're tired. Thanks, love. Mr Gibbons and Mr Mitchell were in the war together, weren't they? <laughs> yes, and to hear them talk, you'd think they were the only two that was. <gasps> oh, I'll go, Mrs Gibbons. Oh, dear. Hello, Sam. Sam, oh, Reg. Let's get him inside. This way, old Sam. Reg. Oh, your head. What happened He's here? all right, Mrs Gibbons. Here, Reg. Now you sit down here, dear. Don't fuss, Mother. I'm all right. There was some trouble in the Whitechapel Road and he got hit by a stone. That was yesterday. What was he doing in the Whitechapel Road yesterday or any other time? What are you doing here, Phil? I came over to find out where you were. I see. Thanks. I've been worrying my heart out about you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Hello, what's up? It's Reg. He's been hurt. It's nothing serious. I took him to the hospital last night. The doctor said it was only a graze. This is all your fault, Sam. Now, shut up a minute, bye. You feel all right, son? Of course I feel all right. Don't go for him tonight, Frank. He looks worn out. I'm not going for anybody. I want my supper. Here's your soup, Dad. Top. <laughs> I think I'll be getting along now. Not till you've heard what I've got to say, you're not. Oh, shut up, Vi. What's it got to do with you? It's all very fine for you to say that nothing serious has happened, Sam, but I should like to remark here and now that it's small thanks to you that it hasn't. Reg thinks you're wonderful, but I don't think you're wonderful. I'd think more of you if you did a bit more and talked a bit less. And the next time you come here on a Sunday evening and start pawing me about and saying that love's the most glorious thing in the world for rich and poor alike, you'll get such a smack in the face that'll make you wish you'd never been born. You get out of this house once and for all, and don't you show your nose in it again till you've changed your way of thinking. Go on, get out. I don't ever want to see you again as long as I live. Well, if that's what you want. Good night, all. <laughs> oh, dear. I'd better go after No, much better leave her alone. I think I'd better be getting back now, Mrs Gibbons. I hope your head will be better in the morning, Reg. Thanks for coming round. See you tomorrow. Oh, all right. Good night, all. Good night, Good night Phil. Good night. It's time we was all in bed. Uh, go on up, Ethel. I'll turn out. Well, you promise me you won't be hard on him tonight, Frank. He looks as white as a sheet. I feel fine, Mum. Don't worry about me. And come in and say good night to me on your way to bed, Reg. All right. Well, Dad, let's have it and get it over with. Easier said than done, isn't it? You and me don't quite see things the same way, do we? I know you think all the things I believe in are wrong. No, that's where you make a mistake, son. I don't think any such thing. You've got a right to your opinions the same as I've got a right to mine. The only thing that worries me is that you should get it into your head that all these ideas you've picked up from Sam and Sam's friends are new. They're not new. They're as old as the hills. Anybody with any sense has always known about the injustice of some people having a lot and other people having nothing at all. But where I think you go wrong is to blame it all on systems and governments. Now, you've got to go deeper than that to find out the cause of most of the troubles of this world. And when you've had a good look, you'll see, likely as not, that good old human nature's at the bottom of the whole thing. If everybody had the same chance as everybody else, human nature would be better, wouldn't it? Well, it doesn't seem as though we were ever going to find that out, does it? Looks like a bit of a deadlock to me. As long as we go on admitting that, the workers of the world will go on being ground down and the capitalists will go on fattening on their blood and oh, sweat. don't let's start all that now. Let's use our own words, not other people's. I don't know what you mean. Oh, come off it, Reg. Kid of your age talking about blood and sweat and capitalism. When I was rising 20, I had a damn sight more cheerful things to think about than that, I can tell you. Old people always think that all young people want to do is to enjoy themselves. Now, don't you sit there and tell me you haven't been enjoying yourself tip-top these last few days, running about the streets and throwing stones and yelling your head it's off. It's no use talking, Dad. You don't understand it. You never will. No, you're quite right. Arguing never got anybody anywhere. I'll just give you one bit of advice, and then we'll call it a day. What is it? It's this, son. I belong to a generation of men, most of which aren't here anymore. And we all did the same thing for the same reason, no matter what we thought about politics. Now all that's over and we're all going on as best we can as though nothing had happened, but as a matter of fact, several things did happen. And one of them was that the country suddenly got tired. 
looked tired now. But the old girl's got stamina. And don't you make any mistake about it. And it's up to us ordinary people to keep things steady. And that's your job, my son, and just you remember it. Yes, Dad. And the next time you slam out of the house without a word, never let your mother know where you are and worry her to death, I'll lava the living daylight out of you. Right, now cut along upstairs and get a bit of sleep. All right, Dad. And don't forget to go in and say good night to your mum. All right, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Hmm. Five years pass. It is ten o'clock on an October morning in 1931. Well, we've got a nice day for it. Oh, morning, Bob. Um, what a cup of tea? No, thanks. How's Nora? A bit more cheerful. She always is when Billy's home. It was that last miscarriage six years ago that did her in, you know. She'd probably have been all right if it hadn't been for that. Poor old Nora. Well, this is a nice conversation for us to be having on a wedding day, I will say. Mm -hmm. How's the happy bridegroom? Well, the happy bridegroom locked himself in the bathroom for nearly an hour this morning. You'd think he hadn't washed for a month. Natural anxiety, old man. Can't blame him. Funny to think of him starting off on a honeymoon, isn't it? Seems a hell of a long time ago since we did. Ridge is doing all right now, isn't he? Yes, he's got his rise. He's assistant clerk to one of the managers. No more of that bullshit nonsense. Oh, no, no, no. He's got uh, quite a lot of horse sense, you know, underneath. Yeah. He had a nice look at the Labour government, saw what a mess they were making of everything. <laughs> you should have heard him the other night when the election results came through. <laughs> Jumping up and down like a jack-in-the-box, he was. <laughs> oh, no, he's Britain forever now, all right. <laughs> well... That's good news. And Sam shook him up a bit too, you know, giving oh. up that old bombshell bookshop of his and marrying Vi and settling him down. Oh, yes, we've all gone back to being the backbone of the Empire. Dad. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Uncle Bob. Hello, Vince. Feeling nervous? <laughs> My legs feel a bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> Is Billy nearly ready? Yes. And he's got the ring all right oh. too. <laughs> I saw him put it in his pocket myself. Oh. He'll be here in a minute. Good. I'd better be getting along now and... Uh, Get myself spruced up. Yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> see you at the church, Ridge. Yeah, see you. Well, Sam. Well, Dad. I suppose I um, ought to be giving you a few bits of fatherly advice, my rights. What about Dad? Well, there's the facts of life, for instance. <laughs> I could probably tell you a few things about them. <laughs> yes, I bet you could at that. <laughs> um, Ridge. Yeah, Dad? Would you say, you know, taken by and large, that uh, you've been a good boy on the whole since you've uh, grown up? Well, I've had me bits of fun every now and again. Mm, well, marriage is a little different, you know, from just having a bit of fun. Yeah, I expect it is. Women aren't all the same by any manner of means. Some of them don't care what happens so long as they have a good time. Marriage isn't important to them beyond having the ring and being called Mrs. Whatever it is. But your mother wasn't that sort. And I don't think Phyllis is either. She's a nice girl and... She loves you a lot. I know that. And when a woman loves you that much, she's well, she's liable to be a bit oversensitive, you know? It's as well to remember that. I'll remember that. Just go carefully with her. Be gentle. You've got a long time to be together. All your lives, I hope. It's worthwhile to go easy and get to know each other gradual. And if later on, a long time later on, you ever get yourself... Caught up with someone else, what well, just see to it that Phyllis doesn't get hurt by it. Put your wife first always. Lots of little things can happen on the side without doing much harm, providing you don't make a fool of yourself and you keep quiet about it. But anything that's liable to bust up your home and your life with your wife and children is not worth it. Just remember that and you won't go far wrong. All right, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, good lad. <laughs> well... 
I'd better be um, getting myself dressed up. <laughs> All ready for the ball and chain? You're too bloody <laughs> cheerful by half. Oh, of course I am. I'm a sailor, aren't I? All sailors are bright and breezy. It's in the regulations. I'd better go and get my coat. We'll have to be starting in a minute. Right oh. You look where you're going. You nearly knocked me down. Sorry, old girl. Oh, it's you. Yes. Well, it's a nice day, anyhow, isn't it? Fine. I'm awfully sorry about last night, Billy. Really, I am. Well, no need to be sorry. It's not your fault. When you've gone back, they'll all be asking me questions. I don't know what to say. Tell them the truth. I love you and asked you to marry me. You don't love me and said no. It simple enough. Oh, it sounds horrid when you say it like that. There's no use pretending, is there? No, I suppose there isn't. I'm sorry, though, all the same. Oh. There's someone else, isn't there? I don't know what you mean. You're in love with someone else. It's no business of yours, if I am. Why couldn't you have told me last night, or a long time ago? Don't you trust me? You haven't got any right to ask me things like that. Oh, listen here, Queenie. You've been the only girl I've cared a damn about for getting on seven years now. We haven't seen much of each other on account of me being away at sea, but you've known all the time that I was thinking of you and hoping that as the years went by, you'd grow out of some of your highfalutin ideas and think me good enough to be your husband. All that gives me the right to ask you anything I like. Is there someone else or isn't there? Yes, there is, if you must know. So there. Are you going to marry him? If you say a word about this to anyone, I'll never speak to you as long as I live. Are you going to marry him? No. Why not? That's my affair. Is he married already? I wish you'd leave me alone. Is he? Yes, he is. Now are you satisfied? Oh, Queen. You're an awful fool. Who are you calling a fool? People can't help their feelings. No, but they can have enough sense not to let their feelings get the better of them. What you're doing's wrong, whichever way you look at it. There's your mother and father to start with. It'll break their hearts if ever they find out about it. And then there's the man's wife, whoever she is. Y you're laying up trouble there. But most important of all, there's you. You won't get much out of it in the long run, and don't you fool yourself. You're not that kind of girl, really, whatever you may think. Oh, thanks very much for the lecture. Oh, you're quite right. It's no good me saying any more. I'll go up and talk to Reg. Goodbye. And good luck. And Sam ought to be here by now. Oh, yeah, these boots are giving me what for, all right. Oh. If they're like this now, what are they going to be like by the evening? Well, a couple of weddings in one year is a bit too much of a good thing, if you ask me. Well, he's hoping you get off soon and make the third. I wish you wouldn't say things like that, Dad. It sounds so vulgar. You're very sorry, I'm sure. Well, I'll never be a bridesmaid again anyhow, as long as I live. Look at this dress and the hat. Oh, you've done something to it, haven't you? You bet I have. I wouldn't have worn it as it was. Oh, you'll look different from all the others. So I should hope. Marjorie will be upset. She and Phil took such a lot of trouble. Well, they don't know anything about about clothes, either of them. Oh. Thank heaven, none of the girls at the shop can see me looking such a sight. Seems to me they must be a pretty fancy lot, them girls at your shop. We're always being told what they like and what they don't oh, like. All right, Dad, there's no need to be sarcastic. I don't snap at your father, Queenie. I don't know what's come over you lately. Nothing's come over me. I just don't like looking common. Oh, I shouldn't worry about that if I was you. It can't be helped. After all, according to some people's standards, I suppose you are common. Frank, how can you say such a thing? She's nothing of the sort. No, it's your mother's fault, really, you know. She caught me on the op. I was all set to marry a duchess when along she came and busted up the whole thing with her fatal charm. You think you're very funny, don't you, Dad? No, I think you're the one that's funny, if you must know. Why? What have I done? It isn't what you've done, my girl. It's what you're trying to do. Oh, and what's that, may I you're ask? You're trying to be something you're not. There's nothing funnier than that. To see you flouncing about and pulling on ears just because you happen to have polished Lady Kiss Me Quick's nails is enough to make a cat laugh. You don't believe in people trying to better themselves, do you? Just because you're content to stick in the same place all your life and do your bit of gardening on Saturday afternoons in your shirt Don't please. you dare speak Living to your father, father like doing that. Doing your own cooking and washing up may be good enough for you, but it isn't good enough for me. I'm sick of this house and everybody in it. And I'm not going to stand it much longer. You, you see... You are a wicked, ungrateful girl and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, I'm not. 
not. So there. Well, a few years ago, we had Reg nagging at us because we were living on the fat of the land while the poor workers were starving. Now we have Queenie turning on us because we're not grand enough for her. I don't know what's wrong with our children, Ethel. Seems to me Bye's the only one who's got any real sense. Oh, Bye. Bye's different from me. Can't you see? She always has been. She doesn't like the things I like or want the things I want. <laughs> She's perfectly happy in that mangy little flat, doing her own housework and making her own clothes. She likes bossing Sam, too. Why, he's a changed man since he married her. So I should hope. Yeah. It seems to me that all the spirit's gone out of him. He's just like anybody else now. Just respectable. Well, what's the matter with that? Oh, nothing. What's the use of arguing? You don't understand what I'm talking about. Well, don't about. waste your breath on us then, Queenie. We're as we are, and that's how we're going to stay. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. And one of these days, when you know a bit more, you'll find out that there are worse things than being ordinary and respectable and living the way you've been brought up to live. In the meantime, as long as you're with us, I mean, your mum and me would be much obliged if you'd keep your tongue between your teeth and behave yourself. Now, you'd better go upstairs, slap some more paint on your face, make yourself look as much like a tart as possible, and do the girls at the shop credit. Now, go on, hop it. Oh, oh dear, no. She'll be snapping our heads off for the rest of the day. We spoiled her when she was little. We've always spoiled her. No, Frank, it isn't only that. She's upset about something. Sort of strung up. She has been for a long time. I wish I knew what it was. What, you mean you think she's in some sort of trouble? Well, I don't know what to think. I mean, when Billy came back last year and they went out together nearly every evening, I thought everything was going to be all right. Then they had words. I don't know what about it, I'm sure. And off he went. Well, don't worry, old girl. It'll all come out in the wash. The car's come. Oh. It looks ever so nice all done up with white ribbons. Oh, good, good. I suppose we ought to be starting then. Yeah, feeling nervous, son. Uh, yeah, a bit. Oh, <laughs> Cheer up, mother. <laughs> oh, I can hardly believe it. It seems only the other day. All oh, right, yeah. Mum, we know all about that. I was only a little toddler, cut me first teeth, and look at me now, great grown man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you at the church, Mum. <laughs> Cheerio, Dad. Cheerio, son. Come on, Billy. Right. Uh, d don't forget to send the car straight back. Oh, I'll, I'll see you to that. It'll be back in five minutes. Right, good. Well, five. Bye. Oh, come on now, come off it, Ethel. There's nothing to cry about. Well, he's our only son, isn't he? It's enough to make any woman cry. Well, they'll be back from the honeymoon in two weeks and living just round the corner. It's all very fine for you. You didn't bring him into the world and hold him at your breast. Well, I should have looked a proper fool if I had. Go oh, you impossible. If I could lay my hands on that cat, I'd kill it. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Half an hour it took me to pick the hairs off my outfit. Oh, dear, dear, and the front dear, dear, dear. of the skirt all creased too. It doesn't show. Oh, well. Oh. Is that the new hat we've heard so much about, Sylvia? Yes, it is. Ah. Morning, all. Oh, hello. Oh, oh hi. Hi. hello. Hello, hello. We've opened the Sam and me just came straight in. Why, Vi, how pretty you look, dear. Yes, you <laughs> and you finished it at 11 o'clock last night. The old flat's been covered in paper patterns and bits of staff and pins for the last ten days. Your dress looks nice, Queenie, doesn't it, Sam? Very nice indeed. I think it's awful. You always say that, Queen. It was exactly the same at my wedding. On my wedding day, there was a thunderstorm and a man got struck by lightning just opposite the church. Oh, that must have cheered things up. One side of his face was all twisted. <sighs> that car ought to be here soon. Oh, don't fuss at all. It seems only yesterday. What does, Mother? The day you and Frank was married. I can see him, poor Aunt Connie now, coughing her heart out in the vestry. Oh, it was only three months after that that she was taken. That's right, that's right. I'll be lucky if I lost out another year. On with the bloody motley. I don't suppose anybody'd mind much. <sighs> There's many as might say was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> now then, Mother, none of that. Dr. Spearman said my heart was thoroughly worn out ever oh. since that bronchitis I had in February. Dr. Spearman? <laughs> well, he's better than your Dr. Lewis any day of the week. If it hadn't been for him having presence of mind, Mrs. Spooner would be dead as a doornail at its very minute. That's what you say. Eleven o'clock she was doing her shopping and she was putting the joint in the oven at twelve. And nice little bit of leg of lamb it was too. And at our past one, 
She was in the hospital, mm-hmm. lying flat on her back on the operating table. And if it hadn't been for Dr. Spearman... I wonder what's she... happened to that car. The time's getting on. Well, if it comes to the pinch, we can walk anyway, can't we? It's only just up the road. Well, if I oughtn't to do much walking. Mm. Don't be silly, Sam. It's months of yet. All the same, it's silly to go taking risks. No, it's nearly ten to. I think I'd better go. Oh, I wish everybody had stopped fussing. It gives me the pip. It shouldn't have taken Reg and Billy more than three or four minutes to get there. I'm sure I hope nothing dreadful's happened to them. Oh, Granny, what could have? Accidents will happen. Well, they can't have been struck by lightning, anyhow. Some people oh. seem to think of nothing but horrors. It's morbid, that's what it is. Oh, thank you not to call me names, Sylvia Gibbons. You make me tired. Don't answer back, Sylvia. It'll only mean a row. Well, I'm sure I don't want to say anything to anybody, but really... Mm. Pity you don't keep quiet, then. Who are you to talk to me like that? Oh, I've no. had about enough of your Shut nagging. Up, you know, Sylvia. You no good arguing with her, Auntie Sue. don't know any such thing. I tell you, I'm sick of it. Morning, noon and night, it's the same thing. She's at me all all the time and I won't stand it. No, I've got as much right to be in this house as she has just because she's old and pretends her heart's weak. She thinks she can say what she no. likes. So I'll tell you one thing here and now and that is I've had enough trouble and sorrow and suffering in my life to put up with her eternal nagging and nasty insinuations. Oh. She's nothing but a spiteful, mischief-making old cat. And if I have any more of it, only she is, I'll stab her face and throw her teeth right off. Oh, really? Oh, it's here. It's here. The car's here. Right now, come on. Come on, mother. Come on. It's time to go to church. Take it to the outside one, by. There's no need to trail all the way upstairs. <laughs> Ready, old girl? Ready. <laughs> <laughs> One month later, it is now November, 1931, midnight. <laughs> God, our poor sailors on a night like this. Where's the light? Uh, it's out over by the door. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky the French window was open. We'd have woken up if we'd come in by the front. Here we are. <laughs> right. Now then. Now then what? <laughs> One more nightcap. You were not have a thick head in the morning. Well, what about you? I'm past caring, old man. That's right. Now, sit in. Yeah. Go easy. <laughs> Now, I would like to take this auspicious opportunity (laughs) of saying that my old regiment is the finest in the world. Next to the East Surreys, it is. (laughs) Here's to the buffs. Here's to the East Surreys. Bob, the East Surreys is the finest regiment in the world, too. That's right. (laughs) Heard from Billy lately? Yes, he writes once a week. He's in Malta now. Good old Billy, he's a fine boy. You know, I've never said much about it, but I always thought that maybe Billy and Queenie might uh, one day... Oh, uh, Queenie gives me a headache, all her airs and graces. Good hiding, that's what she needs. No, that wouldn't do any use. It's funny, isn't it? You know, about having children, seeing what they grow up like. Well, it's a strange world, and no mistake. Yeah. I was thinking that tonight. Mm. Looking at all those chaps in your regiment, mm. wondering what they were feeling like. Some of them looked all right, of course. Some looked a bit under the weather. Yeah, we've been lucky. You've said it. I wonder when the next war will be. Not in our time, nor in our son's time, thank mm, God. I wouldn't bank on that. How could that be? Everybody's disarmed. Well, we are. There's the good old League of Nations. Well, it doesn't seem able to stop Japan turning nasty. Japan? Who cares about Japan? It's a nice long way off, for one thing. Of course, uh, I know if they really start behaving badly, all we've got to do is send a couple of battleships along and scare the little sods out of their wits. That's right. All the same. We've got the finest navy in the world, and don't you forget it. And we've got a nice new government now, and everything in the garden's lovely. Here's hoping. Stanley Baldwin. Ramsay MacDonald. <laughs> ah. Well... <clears throat> I'll have to be pushing off home in a minute. No, no, have, have, have one more before you go. Now, listen, Frankie boy. We're, uh, we're up to the gills already. Just, uh, just, uh, just a little one for the road. The road? 
I only got about three yards to go. <laughs> That's enough. It's oh, oh, oh. oh, good. Now you've yeah. done it. Yeah. Quiet a minute. Listen. Come on. Pull yourself together. We're for it. Yeah, right. Chest out. Chin up. A ten. Shun! And what do you think you're doing, if I may make so bold? Uh, Bob was just going home. Oh, just going home, was he? Yes. Sorry we uh, woke you up, Ethel. What was that you dropped? Uh, the poor old John Hake. I suppose you know what the time is, don't you? Time was meant for sleep. Now, you go up to bed, Frank Gibbons. I'll have something to say to you later. Oh, it was God. my fault, Ethel. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, both of you men of your age, coming home drunk and waking up the whole house. Now, go on, Bob. It's time you went home. All right. I can take a hint. Good night, Mrs. G. <laughs> Good night, Sergeant. Good night, Hop. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Steady the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you go to a regimental dinner, you can go to a hotel afterwards and sleep it off. Now go on, get up to bed, and don't oh, make a noise oh. either. What's that? What's what? It's letter on the mantelpiece. I haven't written no letters. It's Queenie's writing. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you you can't read the girl's private letters. It's addressed to you and me. Well, I'll be damned. She's gone. Read it. Who's this man? You ever seen him? No. I'll fetch her back. I'll give her the hiding of her life. You can't find her. She doesn't say where she's gone. We love each other. His wife won't divorce him. Can't live without each other, so we're going away. It's our fault. We might have known something like this would happen. We let her have her own way too much ever since she was a child. Queenie. We'll trace her, all right. Don't you worry. We can find out who the man is through the shop. It must have been there she met him. We'll get her back. I don't want her back. She's no child of mine. I don't ever want to see her again as long as I live. Oh, no, don't say that, Ethel. I mean it. I've done my best to bring her up to behave respectable, to be a good girl, but it hasn't been any use. If she loves this man all that much, maybe it was too strong for her. Maybe she couldn't help herself. You don't see what she's done the same way as I do, do you? I don't know. You and me never have quite seen eye to eye about what's right and what's wrong. You'd have her back tomorrow if she'd come, wouldn't you? But I wouldn't. You've always encouraged her and told her how clever she was and let her twist you round her little finger. All I've done is try laughing at her instead of scolding. Well, you've got something to laugh at now, haven't you? You can't stop loving the girl, even if she has done wrong. I can try. I've never seen you like this before. You're hard as nails, aren't you? What do you expect me to be? I don't know. I suppose you never cared for Queenie as much as you did the other two. It's not fair to say that. It's true, though, isn't it? No, it's not. She's always been the most trouble, that's true enough, and she certainly never put herself out to try and help me like my has, that's true too. But I've cared for her just as much as the others, and don't you start saying I haven't. It's no use trying to lay the blame for this at my door. What she's done, she's done on her own, and I'll never forgive her for it until the end of my days. Well, if you feel like that, it's not much good talking about it, is it? Will you turn out or shall I? Ethel. I'm going back to bed now. You might put the bottle of whiskey back in the sideboard before you come up. Oh, Queen. Six months later, 
4.30 on a fine afternoon in May 1932. Been late so early because Frank's taking us to the Majestic. Oh, we should suddenly turn that radio off. It's getting on my nerves. Ethel have it playing all day just because Reg gave it to her. Woo-hoo. Well, the skies will fall next. I shouldn't wonder you doing something I asked you without grumbling. Now then, Mrs. Flint, don't start. I must say, having a steady job at the lab has done you a lot of good. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you're not so touchy as you used to be, flying off at the least thing. Oh, I'm very glad, I'm sure. It was a lucky day for all of us when you met that Mrs. Wilmot. I don't know to what you're referring. I was only saying it was a good thing you meeting that Mrs. Wilmot. Perhaps you'd rather have me the way I was before, not sleeping a wink at night and suffering and, and being in error. In what? Error. Oh, so that's what it was. And you needn't sneer at Mrs. Wilmot either. She's a wonderful woman. She must be, to make you believe there wasn't anything the matter with you. That's what I've been saying for years. Um, how long before tea's ready? About five minutes. Uh, tell Ethel to start without me, Sylvia. I've got one more bed to weed. Frank's been a changed man since Queenie went. I haven't noticed much difference. Do you think she'll ever come back? She'll get a piece of my mind if she does. Bringing disgrace on all of us. Frank had a letter from her the other day. How do you know? I recognise the handwriting. Think he told Ethel? Not very likely. She doesn't let him mention her name if she can help it. It had a French stamp. Oh, how disgusting. What's disgusting? Oh, gracious, Ethel. What a start you gave me. What was disgusting? A French stamp. A French stamp? What are you talking about? We were talking about the letter Frank had from Queenie. Oh, where are you? It's a pity that Christian science of yours hasn't taught you to mind your own business, among other things, Sylvia. Well, I'm sure I don't know what I've done. You know perfectly well I won't have Queenie's name spoken in this house. She's gone her own way, and that's that. She doesn't belong here anymore. Now, where's Frank? In the garden. He started weeding another bed. The tea's ready. We well, said we were to begin without him. You coming to the table, Mrs. Flint, or shall I bring it over to you? I'll stay here. The less I open my mouth, the better. Yes, Sylvia. Take it over to her. Bread and butter? No, thank you. I wish Frank had come in. We shall be late next thing we know. Why not take a cup of tea to him? He never eats much, anyhow. It's nearly half past now. I'll take it if you like. No, I will. Once he starts weeding, he'd go on all night if we let him. No, I wonder who that is. It might be Reg and Phil. Can't be. Get on to seven notes with them friends of theirs. Mum Take Granny upstairs. What? There's been an accident. It's Reg and Phil. I've got to tell Mum and Dad. What's that? What sort of an accident? What happened? They were in Reggie's car and a lorry came out of a turning. Are they badly hurt? They're dead. Oh, oh my God. Please take Granny upstairs. I must tell them alone. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Four years have passed. It is just after 10 o'clock in the evening of the 10th of December, 1936. And now, we all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. Well, that's that. Funny to think that that's been listened to all over the world. Where's Ethel? In the kitchen, I think. I wish she'd get someone in to help her. I've tried to make her, but she won't. 
There's not so much to do since Mrs Flint passed on. Oh, I do wish you wouldn't talk like that, Sylvia. Sounds as soft. I don't know what you mean, I'm sure. Mother died, see? First of all, she got flu, and that turned to pneumonia, and the strain of that affected her heart, which was none too strong at the best of times, and she died. Nothing to do with passing on at all. How do you know? I admit it's only your spiritual way of talking, but it gets me down, see? What are you shouting about? I'm not shouting about anything at all. I'm merely explaining to Sylvia that Mother died. She didn't pass on or pass over or pass out. She died. I think I'll go up to bed now, Ethel. Mm. All right, dear. Good night. Good night. Good night, Sylvia. Oh, dear. Vi was looking a bit peaky this evening. She's worried about Joan being a bit off colour, I think. No, she'll be all right. Remember the trouble we had with Queenie when she was tiny? Sorry, I forgot. You're lucky. You are a funny woman, Ethel, and no mistake. I expect I am. Well, as God made us and there's nothing to be done about it. Well, all I can say is he might have done a better job on some people without straining himself. How often have I told you I won't have you talking like that, no, I wasn't meaning you. I don't care who he was meaning. If you don't believe in anything yourself, you can at least have the decency to spare the feelings of them as do. As a matter of fact, I believe in a whole lot of things. Well, that's nice to know. And one of them is that being bitter about anybody isn't a good thing. Let alone if it happens to be your own daughter. I'm not bitter. I just don't think of her any more, that's all. Yeah, that's one of the things I don't believe. Well, don't let's talk about it, shall we? Why don't you have a nice read of the paper? Ah, oh, that'll be Bob. Oh, and now I can get on with me darning. Well, here's a surprise. Billy. Hello, Mr Gibbons. Mrs Gibbons. Why, Billy? I'd no idea you was back. Um, I've got a couple of weeks' leave. I've been transferred from a cruiser to a destroyer. Oh, do you like that? You bet I do. <laughs> like a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I uh, just had one with Dad. Is he coming in? Yes, I think so. A bit later on. He must be glad you're back. It must be lonely for him in that house all by himself since your mother was taken. Nora died, Ethel. Nobody took her. But you ought to be ashamed talking like that in front of Billy. Oh, it was a blessed release, really, you know, Mrs Gibbons. What with one thing and another... She'd been bedridden so long. Look, would you like me to go make you a cup of tea? It won't take a minute. Uh, no, thanks, Mrs Gibbons. There's something I want to talk to you about, as a matter of fact. Both of you. All right, son, what is it? I feel a bit awkward, really. I wanted Dad to come with me and back me up, but he wouldn't. <laughs> Man of your age, hanging on to his father's coattails. <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. Oh, what have you been up to? What is it, Billy? It's about Queenie. What about her? Does it still make you angry, even to hear her name? I'm not angry. Have you seen her, Billy? Yes, I've seen her. How is she? Fine. Well, what is it you wanted to say about Queenie, Billy? I sympathise with how you feel, Mrs Gibbons. I really do, and what's more, she does too. She knows what a wrong she did. She hasn't had too good a time, you know. In fact, she's been through a good deal. He left her, the man she went off with, Major Blunt, after about a year. He went back to his wife. He left Queenie stranded in a sort of boarding house in Brussels. How soon was it before she found another man to take her on? Ethel. A long time. Over three years. She's all right now, then, isn't she? Yes. She's all right now. What sort of a bad time did she have? How do you mean? Well, trying to earn a living for herself, getting in and out of different jobs... By the time she had a little money saved and was coming home to England, she got ill with appendicitis and was taken to hospital. Where? How long ago? Oh, Paris. About a year ago. Then, when she was in the hospital, she picked up with an old Scotswoman who was in the next bed, and a little while later, the two of them started an old English tea room in Montaigne in the south of France. You know, just for the English visitors. And that's where I ran into her by accident. We were doing a summer cruise, and the ship I was in laid off there. Is she there now? No. She isn't there now. Where is she, then? She's here. Here? How do you mean, here? Next door. With Dad. <gasps> Billy! We were married last week in a registry office in Plymouth. Married? I, I've always loved her, you know. I, I always said I'd wait for her. Oh, son. I can't believe it. Oh, son. You'll forgive her now, won't you, Mrs Gibbons? I don't seem to have any choice, do I? 
I always thought you'd like to have me for a son. Better late than never. <laughs> well, that's what it is, isn't it? Better late than, than never. <laughs> oh, dear. Shall I get you a little nip or something? Please, sir. Hello, Mum. So you've come back, have you? You bad girl. Yes, Mum. That's a nice way to behave, I must say. Upsetting me like this. <gasps> Nearly two years pass. It is now September the 30th, 1938, at about nine o'clock in the evening. I always knew it, you know, Vi. Always knew what, Auntie Sylvia? That there wouldn't be a war. Well, I thought there would, I must say. Otherwise, I shouldn't have sent Sheila and Joan down to Mrs Marsh in Dorset. Your mother was worried, too, about Queenie and little Frankie, but I wasn't. Neither was Mrs Wilmot. Fancy that now. Mrs Wilmot laughed outright, you know, when the woman came to try on a gas mask. Take that stupid thing away, she said. The woman was furious. I'm not surprised. Mrs Wilmot is a very remarkable woman. She sounds a bit silly to me. It shows a very small mind to talk like that, Vi. Your very life has been saved at this moment by the triumph of right thinking over wrong thinking. Well, that's nice, isn't it? I've often thought Mr Chamberlain must be a Christian scientist at art. Well, let's hope that Hitler and Mussolini are too, and then we shall all be on velvet. You know, what are you two looking so glam about? We were talking about Mr Chamberlain. Auntie Sill says she thinks he must be a Christian scientist. Mm. That might account for a lot. Where's your mother? Upstairs with Queenie and his lordship. Did you see anything of the crowds? Yes, I did. We heard him arrive at the airport on the radio. So did I. Sam's meeting me at the Strand Corner House a little later on. We thought we'd have a look at the West End. Talk to be exciting. Well, it's exciting, all right. If you like to see a lot of people yelling themselves hoarse without the faintest idea what they're yelling about. How can you, Frank? They're cheering because we've been saved from war. Mm, I'll cheer about that when it's proved to me. You wouldn't care if there was another war. Just because you enjoyed yourself in the last one. Now, listen here, Sylvia. Don't you talk to me like that because I won't have it, see? I did not enjoy myself in the last war. Nobody but a bloody fool without any imagination would ever say that he did. But what I would say is this. I've seen something today that I wouldn't have believed could happen in this country. I've seen thousands of people, English people, mark you, carrying on like maniacs, shouting and cheering with relief for no other reason but that they've been thoroughly frightened. And it makes me sick, and that's a fact. And I only hope to God that we shall have guts enough to learn one lesson from this, and that we shall never find ourselves in a position again when we have to appease anybody. All you men think about is having guts and being top dog and killing each other. I'm a woman. And I don't care how much we appease as long as we don't have a war. War is wicked and evil and vile. They that live by the sword shall die by the sword. Mm. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I don't think it's more blessed to give in and receive a nice kick on the bottom for Will doing it. you two stop shouting, you wake up Frankie? He's a warmonger, that's all. He is a warmonger. Judging by the every way you're breathing, Sylvia, I should say you was in error. Oh, you're no brother of mine. I don't want to speak to you ever again. Mm. What's the use of arguing with her, Frank? You know it never does any good. She started it, Mother. She was ever so silly. She's getting sillier and sillier every day. Don't you talk about your Aunt Sylvia like that. Dear old Mum. I'm 35, you know, not 15. I don't give you 105. I won't have you being saucy to your Aunt Sylvia. Or to me, either, for that matter. What about Dad? I can be saucy to him. Oh, get that. on with you, Miss Sharp. I'm just going anyhow. I'm picking up Sam. We're going to see the crowds. Sorry, Dad. You can cheer your head off for all I care. Why don't you take a squeak up with you? Maybe I will. Night all. Night bye. Good night. <sighs> How's Queenie? 
Oh, she's all right. It did. Nobody had ever had a baby before. All the fuss we've had the last month. She got up too soon. She, oh, she had a letter from Billy this afternoon. He wants her to go out there after Christmas, all being well. The baby won't be old enough to travel. Well, she'll leave him here. What, with us? Of course. Oh, don't be so silly. Who else would she leave you oh. with? Well, that'll be fine, won't it? Oh, fine for you, maybe. You won't have to look after it. <laughs> go on upstairs and say goodnight to her before she drops off. I'm, uh, I'm expecting Bob to come in and have a farewell binge, so give me a shout when he comes. A uh, binge indeed. One small one's all you're going to have, my lad, if I have to come down and take the bottle away from you. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> Hello, Ethel. Oh, evening, Bob. Um, Frank's just saying good night to Queenie. He'll be down in a minute. What a week. What with the crisis yeah. and the sandbags and me having to pack up all the furniture into the bargain. Yes, that's most of it gone. Yes. Went this afternoon. I'm sleeping on a camp bed tonight. Oh, Frank will miss you. Well, so shall I. You'll both come down and see me, won't you? Oh, of course we will, Bob. You have often wondered why you stayed so long in that house all by yourself. Oh, I don't know. It was near you and Frank, and it was somewhere for Billy to come out to. Mm. You'll feel a bit lost, I expect, living in the country. Well, I shall have my garden. A damn sight nicer one than I've got here. And there's the sea nearby and the village pub. We'll come down and see you soon. I'll go and tell Frank you're here. Righto. Bob's here. Right. <sighs> well, he's back. Umbrella and all. Yes. Let's have a drink. I'm feeling a bit low, what with one thing and another. Only one good thing's happened. What's that? If Queenie goes out to Singapore after Christmas, we're taking charge of the kid. Oh, I thought you'd get him. Well, you couldn't have had him, could you, all alone by the set sea waves? All right, all right. No hard feelings. Here goes. Happy days. <laughs> Remember the first night we moved in, when we had Sylvia's wind carnage? Oh, that's going back a bit. <laughs> Nearly 20 years. And here we are, just the same. Are we? Oh, no. I suppose we're not. It's a strange world. All them years. All the things that happened in them. Oh, I wouldn't go back over them again for all the rice in China, would you? Not on your life. I wonder what happens to rooms when people give them up, go away and leave the house empty. How do you mean? I don't know. I was just thinking about you going away from next door after all that time and... Me and Ethel going away too, pretty soon. I shouldn't think we'll stay on here much longer. I'm wondering what the next people that live in this room would be like. You know, whether they'll feel any bits of us left about the place. Yeah. Shut up. You're giving me the willies. <laughs> Funny you're going to live just near where I was born. It's about 11 miles, isn't it? Oh, less than that if you go by the Marsh Road. I'll probably come back there one day, I hope. That is, if I can get round Ethel. She hates the country. I suppose it's all according to what you're used to. You don't think the Germans will ever get here, do you? No. Of course I don't. I'm going to miss you a hell of a lot. Same here. You'll be coming down, though, won't you? You bet. Here's to you, old pal. Here's to you, old pal. <laughs> Nine months later, a warm summer's evening, June 1939. Mum? Yes, dear? I have to be getting along now. All right, dear. I brought the pram in. <laughs> Has it been good? Good as gold. I gave him the postcard Queenie sent him with a camel on it. He liked it. <gasps> Oh, he's dropped off now. There's nothing more I can do to help, is there? Oh, no, thanks, dear. Everything's done now. They're coming for the rest of the stuff in the morning. I'm just getting a bit of supper ready for your dad and me. We're going to walk round to the flat afterwards. I do hope you like it, Mum. Well, it's got a nice view of the common. I will say that for it. You'll find it easier being on one floor, of course. Yes. I suppose I will. It looked quite nice to me. <laughs> 
modernistic, of course. Well, that can't be helped. Dad's enjoying himself with that hammer, isn't he? <laughs> the more noise, the better, says Motto. Dad! Hello. Going now. Righto. See you in the morning. Night, Mum. Thank you for coming, dear. Give my love to Sam and the children. I will. Night. Good night. Hello. Having a breather? I am that. My back's breaking. <laughs> Not as young as you were. That, who were you to talk? As his lordship. Now, don't wake him up now. He's dribbling, dirty boy. Well, I expect you dribbled when you was his age. Oh, I shall miss that garden. Well, it's your fault. You're the one that wanted to move. I know. You'll have a balcony anyhow. You could put window boxes all round it. Window boxes. One day, a bit later on, when I stopped working, we uh, we might get a little place in the country, mightn't we? <laughs> when will that be, may I ask? Oh, I don't know. A few years, I suppose. Well, we'll think about that when the time comes. It's a funny thing. What is? You'd think taking all the furniture out of a room would make it look bigger, but this one looks smaller. I shall be glad when we're out of it. So shall I. Sorry, too, though, in a way. Well... I must go and get on with the supper. Here, wait, here. What? Now, I don't mind how many flats we move into, or where we go, or what we do, as long as I've got you. Don't talk so silly. <laughs> Hello, cock. So... You've decided to wake up, have you? Well, Frankie boy, I wonder what you're going to turn out like. Now, there's nobody here to interrupt us, so we can talk as man to man, can't we? There's not much to worry about, really, so long as you remember one or two things always. The first thing is that life isn't all jam for anybody, and you've got to have trouble of some kind or another, whoever you are. But if you don't let it get you down, however bad it is, you won't go far wrong. And another thing you'd better get into that little bullet head of yours is that you belong to something that nobody can't ever break, however much they try. And they'll try all right, they're trying now. Not only people in other countries who want to do us in, but people here in England. People who've let themselves get soft and afraid. People who go on a lot about peace and goodwill and the ideals they believe in, but somehow don't seem to believe in them enough to think they're worth fighting for. Well, the trouble with the world is, Frankie, that there are too many ideals and too little horse sense. We're human beings, we are. All of us. And that's what people are liable to forget. Human beings don't like peace and goodwill, everybody loving everybody else. Human beings like eating and drinking and loving and hating. They also like showing off, grabbing all they can, fighting for their rights and bossing anybody or give them half a chance. And you belong to a race that's been bossy for years. And the reason it's held on as long as it has is that nine times out of ten it's behaved decently and treated people right. And just lately, I admit, we've been giving at the knees a bit and letting people down who trusted us, allowing noisy little men to bully us with lots of guns and bombs and aeroplanes, but don't worry, that won't last. The people themselves... The ordinary people, like you and me, we know something better than all the fussy old politicians put together. We know what we belong to, where we come from, and where we're going. We may not know it with our brains, but we know it with our roots. And we know another thing, too, and it's this. We haven't lived and died and struggled all these hundreds of years to get decency and justice and freedom for ourselves without being prepared to fight fifty wars, if need be, to keep them. What in the world are you doing? Talking to yourself? I wasn't talking to myself. I was talking to Frankie. Well, I'm sure I hope he enjoyed it. And he stopped dribbling anyhow. Come on. Supper's ready. 
So long, Sam. In This Happy Breed by Noel Coward, John Moffat played Frank Gibbons, Rosemary Leach, Ethel, Doris Hare, Mrs. Flint, Robert Lang, Bob Mitchell, Anna Cropper, Sylvia, Michael Maloney, Billy, Alice Arnold, Queenie, Julia Swift, Vi, Simon Treves, Sam, John McAndrew, Reg, and Elizabeth Mansfield, Phyllis. This Happy Breed was directed by Glyn Dillon. Waiting in the Wings Well, that's that. You owe me two and six. You owe me a shilling from last Sunday. In that case, you only owe me one and six. We'd better hold it over until next time we play, Canasta. I thought you'd say that. Why, may I ask? Because you always do, dear. I see they're hoping to get Buck Randy for the midnight matinee this year. Who in heaven's name is Buck Randy? Really, May, you must have heard of Buck Randy. He's the rage of America. I haven't been to America since 1913. What does he do? He sings, stripped to the waist, to a zither. Why should he be stripped to the waist? Because he's supposed to have the most beautiful male body in the world, dear. He was Mr. America of 1955 and 1956. Why the zither? He accompanies himself on it. Last year, one of his records sold over two million. He has to have police protection wherever he goes. I'm not surprised. They say that Carolita Pagadici is going to appear, too. She's flying over from Rome, specially. Is that the one with the vast bust who, who came last year and just stood about? I'm sure it's very kind of all of them to take so much trouble for a bunch of old has-beens like us. Speak for yourself, dear. I know they got a lot of publicity out of it, but even so, I shouldn't think from their point of view it was worth all the effort. It is always possible, my dear caller. That just one or two of them might do it from sheer kindness of heart. I said it was kind of them to take the trouble, and Monita flew at me. I didn't fly at you for that. It was because you said we were a bunch of old has-beens. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. In essence, you're quite right, my dear Cora. But please remember, before you say things like that again, that it's painful to some of us to be vulgarly reminded that we're dependent on the charity of our younger colleagues. Oh, dear. I'm sure I'm sorry I spoke. So are we all, Cora. So are we all. I'm telling you all here and now that I would like to take the windpipe of the man who invented television in my old rheumatic hands and strangle the damn life out of him. Has it gone wrong again? Oh, it has indeed. And for no reason in the world other than pure devilment. I was sitting there, quiet as the grave, listening to Father Duggan giving a Sunday afternoon talk when suddenly the, the damn contraption gets up to its blasphemous tricks. And before me very eyes, I see the blessed Father begin to, to wobble about like a dancing dervish. And one side of his saintly face pulled out of shape as though it was made of India rubber. Miss Archie will fix it, dear. I'll go and ask her. Oh, by the time Miss Arch is fiddling with the damn thing, the Blessed Father will have finished this talk and be having his tea. Well, I'm going off to have me forty winks. It's a dark world we're living in when a bit of soulless machinery can suddenly turn a holy man into a figure of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that old girl's wonderful. She really is. You must have seen her in the old days, May. Was she really good? Mm hmm. Good, but unreliable. She's never played a scene the same way twice. I'm perished to the hips, and it's no good pretending I'm not. Who oh, do you think we shall ever get it? Get what, dear? The solarium, love. 
The letter went off to the committee over two weeks ago. It probably came up at Friday's meeting. Even if they say yes, I shall be dead and gone before they get round to building it. My heart's been pounding again. I hardly slept a wink last night. You know perfectly well, Armina, that that's only an indigestion. Dr. Jevons told you so. You eat far too much, far too quickly. I like eating. That east wind comes straight across the valley and cuts you in two. Oh, the committee could very well afford it if they chose. But he told me so himself. As official secretary to the fund, he had no right to. That young man talks far too much. Now then, May, you know perfectly well you dote on him. We all do. You gossip away with him for hours whenever you get the chance. Oh, what nonsense you talk. My dear Bonita. I suppose he'll be down as usual this afternoon. Of course he will. It's Sunday. Also, he'll be sure to come today in order to welcome... Cora! Uh, well, you know what I mean. In order to welcome who? We've got a new addition to our cosy little family arriving this afternoon. Why wasn't I told? Who is it? Oh, dear. That cat's out of the bag now with a vengeance. I suppose we'd better say... Well, what are you all talking about? Why all this mystery? It's Lotta Bainbridge. Lotta Bainbridge? Yes. Lotta Bainbridge. Coming here. We all thought, knowing that you and she are not exactly the best of friends, that it would be better not to say anything about it. How long have you known? Perry told us last Sunday. You mean you were all prepared to let me meet her face to face without even warning me? Oh, Dora, her dresser, who's been with her for years, is leaving her to get married. And the maisonette she had just off the Fulham Road is being pulled down to make way for office buildings. I'm not in the least interested in where she lives or what is being pulled down. I only know that I find your combined conspiracy of silence difficult to forgive. It was only that we didn't want to upset you. Do you seriously imagine that it would have upset me less to find her here in this house without being prepared? Don't be angry with us, May. After all, it was a long, long time ago, wasn't it? The quarrel, I mean. There was no quarrel, my dear Bonita. You have been misinformed. Well, whatever it was then... I have not spoken to Lotta Bainbridge for 30 years, and I have no intention of doing so now. Oh, May, dear, don't be like that. It's all over and done with. None of you had better explain the situation to her when she arrives. Don't be afraid she won't understand. She'll understand perfectly. Well... That's that, isn't it? I suppose we ought to have told her, really. They'll probably settle down together in time. They can't go on not speaking forever, but the next few weeks are going to be hell. Who was it that said that there was something beautiful about growing old? Whoever it was, I have news for him. Since I've been here, I somehow can't remember not being old. Perhaps that's something to do with having played character parts for so long, Estelle. I was an ingenue for years. I was very pretty, and my eyes were enormous. They're quite small now. What started it, the feud between her and May? Come off it, Maudie. You weren't toddling home from school with your pencil box in 1918. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I was doing, eight times a week. I was in Miss Mouse at the Adelphi, and I had a number in the last act called Don't Play the Fool with a Schoolgirl. It used to stop the show. As far as I can remember, it was the notices that stopped the show. Here's Perry. He's earlier than usual. Bless his heart. He'll tell us whether we're going to get the solarium lounge. Oh, no, he won't. He'll just say that the committee has it under consideration. In any case, we shall know by his tone whether there's any hope. I don't know why you're all working yourselves up about this damn solarium. It could be wasted money even if we do get it. Just so much more glass for the rain to beat against. That's right, dear. Keep us all in aesthetics. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Perry. Perry. My dears, I'm in trouble. What sort of trouble? I knocked over a milk cart in Maidenhead. <laughs> 
Fortunately, they were mostly empties. <laughs> the milkman was livid. <laughs> Where's old May? Upstairs. Good. Not so good. She knows. Oh, Lord, who told her? We all did. We had to. Well, maybe it's all for the best. It isn't. She's hopping mad. Oh, poor Lotta. She's got enough to put up with without this. When's she arriving? Any minute now. Musgrave lent her his car and Dora's bringing her down with all her bits and pieces. Have you seen her? Yes, last week. I went along to her flat and had tea with her. Made all the final arrangements. How did she look? Sort of miserable, but she tried not to show it. I don't think she minds about the flat so much. It's, it's Dora leaving her that's really got her down. Where's the colonel? In our office, deciding whether we're going to have shepherd's pie or macaroni cheese for supper. I expect. We had macaroni cheese last night, and it nearly killed me. Oh, there you are, Perry. Hello, Duck. I thought I heard the old bike. The old bike's older than ever since the last half hour. She grazed her knees against a milk cart. Whew. Good Lord, that means ten days confined to barracks for you, my lad. Ooh, <laughs> I love to hear you talk like that, Archie. Reminds me of my Uncle Edgar. Well, never mind about your Uncle Edgar now, Perry. What time is Lotta Bainbridge arriving? Any moment. She's coming down in Billy Musgrove's car. Nobody tells me anything. Has Osgood been yet? No, he's late. Hmm. How is poor old Martha? She was a bit under the weather on Friday and yesterday, but she always perks up on Sundays when he visits her. Old Osgood must be 70 if he's a day. Were they ever lovers, do you think, in the old days? Good heavens, no. He's 25 years younger than she is to start with. No, no, it's just star worship, a sort of obsession. He used to wait outside stage doors for her when she was in her heyday, and he was only a young boy. Rain or shine, there he'd be with his bunch of violets. He still brings her violets. I know. It really is rather sweet, isn't it? I was in the last place she ever did. We all loathed her. Oh, there he is now, I expect. I'll answer. Doreen's gone to the village. Is Doreen working out all right? She has adenoids and no time sense. But she's better than that awful Gladys. I rather liked Gladys. She was like a bad character performance in Act Three. Good afternoon, ladies. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Hello, Osgood. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, my dear. A little twinge every now and then, you know, but apart from that, fit as a fiddle. I'll take you up. Oh, no, please, don't trouble Miss Archie. I know the way. She is expecting me, isn't she? Oh, yes, Mr. Meeker, she's always expecting you. Has she been... Uh, happier this week? Yes, yes, she was a little low on Friday and yesterday, but nothing to worry about. Oh, well, I, I'll go on up there. And I'll have a cup of tea for you when you come down. Oh, thank you, my dear, thank you. That, that would be delightful. Do you think she recognises him? Oh, yes. She's never caught her on one of her bad days. She gets quite gay with him sometimes, tells him risque stories about the past. Her memory's fantastic, at least for things that happened a long while ago. But well, that's quite usual, isn't it? I mean, when people get old, they can recall, say, Queen Victoria's Jubilee, and yet not be able to remember what happened last week. Nothing did. One thing I can remember, and that is that we wrote a round robin to the committee two weeks ago about having a solarium lounge so that we could enjoy the sun without being frozen to death. Did they read it, Perry? Yes, it came up at Friday's meeting. What did they say? They said they'd consider it. There, now, what did I tell you? Is there any hope, do you think? Of course there is. We must always look on the bright side. Didn't anyone ever suggest sending for an estimate? I gave them an estimate. How much? 2,500. God almighty, what are they planning to build it of? Uranium? Well, it's the frontage, I expect. It's a very wide frontage and glass costs an awful lot. Were any of the committee in favour of it? One or two, but not the majority. You mean to say the fund couldn't afford it, even after Morris's legacy? Well, that's already been invested. What, did Moody never sell, sir? She was not in favour of it. Oh, she wasn't, wasn't she? Look here, Perry, my lad, you know you're not supposed to discuss the committee. Oh, go and form force for a minute, dear. This is important to all of us. Moody never sold, indeed. I'd like to strangle her. So would I if I could find her neck. I say, steady. I, I really can't say any more. She was just a bit more bossy about it than the others. You mean she swung them round against the idea? Well, yes, I, I suppose so. Oh, perhaps it was too much to ask. The home is very comfortable on the whole, but it would have been nice to enjoy the sun when it comes out, 
without having to face that awful east wind. I promise I'll bring it up again at the next meeting. That booty nether soul. I'll have a few words to say to her the next time she comes bouncing down here in her bloody Bentley. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's change the subject. It doesn't matter all that much anyhow. A little while ago, we'd none of us even heard of a solarium. We've all got one foot in the grave anyway. Excuse me while I slip into my shroud. Oh, that'll be lot of Bainbridge, I expect. Oh, be a good chap, Perry, and yell for Ted to take up the bags. He's in the kitchen. Right. Ted. Ted. I'll go to the door. Oh, I hate welcoming new arrivals. They always look sort of lost. It's nothing to the way they look after they've been here a few months. Why do you say that, Cora? You know you don't really mean it. Perhaps I was trying to be funny. Come along this way, Miss Bainbridge. Well, this is all very exciting. Rather like going to a new school. Except, of course, that at a new school one doesn't meet old friends. Cora, I haven't seen you for years. No. How do you do, Miss Bainbridge? Miss Melrose? Yes. We're not exactly old friends, but I have admired you so often. I remember you years ago singing a most enchanting song dressed as a schoolgirl. I've forgotten the name of the play. It was Miss Mouse at the Adelphi. Miss Mouse, of course it was. You're Benita Belgrave, aren't you? Mm. I'd recognize you anywhere. I knew you were here because we have a great friend in common, Lucas Bradshaw. Luke Bradshaw? I didn't know he was still alive. How is the old soak? Still soaking, I'm afraid, but only every now and then. He comes to see me sometimes in his more lucid moments, and we reminisce about the good old days. A lot of that goes on here. Between ourselves, you know, I'm really getting a bit tired of the good old days. But I suppose it is fun once in a while to wander back for a little. You know Almina Clare? Oh, of course <laughs> I do. <laughs> Almina! Oh, you really are very naughty to put on so much weight. You used to be thin as a rail. I like eating, and there's no need to diet anymore. No, I suppose there isn't really. And this is Estelle Craven. Hello. Uh, how do you do? Welcome to St. Trinian's, Miss Bainbridge. Why, Mr. Lasco, I had no idea you'd be here to greet me. How very nice. Uh, this is my beloved Dora. Good afternoon. Hello, Dora. She's going to be married in a month's time. We don't talk about being separated much because we burst into tears. Now, why don't you go upstairs, Dora, and do just a little unpacking for me as a sort of final gesture? It's all right. Would you be very kind and show her where my room is, Miss Archibald? Yes, certainly. Follow me, Dora. Yes, Miss Archibald. Just after. May I take your coat? Oh. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, dear. I really felt quite nervous when I came in, like a, a first night. But I feel better now. Sarita Myrtle's here, isn't she? Yes, but she's a bit round the bend, as you probably know. Poor Sarita. She was always vague, even in the old days. May Davenport is here, too. Yes. Yes, I know she is. I wonder who painted that picture of dear Ellen Terry. It really isn't very good, is it? But even flat painting can't quite subdue her radiance, can it? It's awfully nice to have you here, Miss Bainbridge. We're all tremendously thrilled. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much. Why don't you sit here quietly for a little and relax and sort of get accustomed to the atmosphere? It's about time for our afternoon snooze, anyhow. Are you coming up, Cora? Yes, I suppose so. You all know, don't you, that May Davenport and I have not been on speaking terms for many, many years? Yes. Yes, we do. Don't worry. It'll all work out in the long run. <laughs> the situation is not without humour. <laughs> it's certainly ironic that fate should arrange so neatly for May and me to end our days under the same roof. Now, all I want to explain to you is that I am fully armed with olive branches. I couldn't bear to think that my coming here was in any way an embarrassment for you. I shall do my best, but please don't blame me too much if I fail. May is fairly implacable. I suppose it would be too much to ask what caused the feud in the first place. Yes, Cora, it would. In any case, it would be redundant, because I'm well aware that you know the whole story. If ever I heard a cue for exit, Cora, that's it. 
Come on up, Almina. You too, Maud. See you later, Miss Bainbridge. Yes, Au revoir, indeed. Miss Mouse. Oh, 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 it wasn't me that was Miss Mouse. I was only the soubrette. It was poor Dolly Drexel. Actually, it was the last thing she did before she went off her rocker. You remember her, don't you? Vaguely. China blue eyes and no middle register. We mustn't forget to ask Miss Archie to fix the television before tonight. There's a new quiz game. I hate quiz games. You never actually played Rebecca at some of the time, did you, dear? I don't know. I've played a long time ago. Would you like to be left alone for a bit? Oh, no. No, I'm, I'm quite happy. Dora will be down in a minute anyhow, and then, if you don't mind, I should like you to leave us. It'll be a rather painful goodbye scene, I'm afraid. She's been working up for it all day. Is Billy's car taking you back to London? Yes. It was dear of him to lend it to me. She'll go back to the flat and do all the final tidying up. Poor old Dora. I shall miss her dreadfully. You'll soon get to like it here. I'm sure you will. I'm sure I shall, too. If there's anything that really upsets you, I mean, anything that you really hate, do let me know, privately. And then, if necessary, I can tactfully bring it up before the committee. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. I don't suppose there will be. Well, just remember, if you need me, I'll be down like a flash. Thank you. You you gave up the theatre very young, didn't you? Yes, six years ago, when I was 33. Why? I started out believing I was going to be a star. And then I suddenly realised that I wasn't. I see. Do you regret it? No. No, not really. Every now and then I get a pang or two when I see some young man prancing about the stage. And I think to myself, I could have done that better. (laughs) But really, deep down, I'm not altogether sure that I could have. And you like this job? You like having to cope with all these old shadows? It's a fixed salary to start with, so Mum's taken care of. And I love the old shadows. The committee gets me down a bit sometimes, but you can't have everything. Uh, Dora's nearly finished, Miss Bainbridge. She'll be down in a minute. Uh, unless you care to go up. No, I'd rather wait here, I think. Buzz off for a minute, Perry. There's a good chap. I'd like to have a little talk with Miss Bainbridge. Where shall I buzz to? Well, go and look at the telly. I can't. It's bust. Oh, I bet that's old Deirdre. She's always losing her temper and bashing it with her stick. I'll deal with it later. I'll brave the east wind in the garden. Good. Goodbye for the moment, Miss Bainbridge. Oh, thank you. And thank you for being so considerate and kind. Good value, that lad. We get on like a house on fire. I'm glad. I'm sure it's awfully important that you should. Perry is the liaison officer between the committee and me. (laughs) We have our ups and downs occasionally, of course. But most of the time, we manage to keep on an even keel. Now then, uh, in regard to rules and regulations... Oh, dear. Don't be alarmed. There aren't many restrictions. Are we allowed out alone? (laughs) Oh, yes. You can go anywhere you like. (laughs) Not quite, I'm afraid. One rule we're very firm about is no pets. Uh, Yes, I know. Uh, Mr. Lasco explained that to me last week. I had my little dog put to sleep the day before yesterday. I... I bought him at the Army and Navy stores nine years ago when he was a tiny puppy. He was very devoted to me, and I don't think he would have been happy with anyone else. I say, I'm most awfully sorry. That's damned hard luck. Please don't sympathize with me about it. It's the only thing among my present rather dismal circumstances that is liable to break me down. Yes, I quite understand. Oh, here comes Dora. I wonder if you'd be very kind and leave us alone for a few minutes. Mm. She has to get back to London. You can brief me about the rest of the rules and regulations later on. I expect there'll be lots of time. Of course. Well, cherry over the moment. I'll be in my office if you want me. How's the room, Dora? Quite nice, dear. It's a bit chintzy. There's a pretty view. And it is quiet. Where is it? Second door to the right along the passage. Do you want to come up now? No. I'll save it until after you've gone. I can't go away and leave you here, dear. I thought I could, but I can't. Oh, no, don't talk nonsense, Dora. Of course you can. You must. There's nothing else to be done anyhow. You know that as well as I do. I can't bear it. After all these years, I just can't bear it. Pull yourself together, my dear, for my sake as well as for your own. I'll tell Frank he'd better go off and marry someone else. I swear to God I will. 
you and me find a flat somewhere and go along as we always have. I can't go off and leave you in a sort of workhouse. Oh, it isn't a workhouse, Dora. It's a very smart home for retired actresses. And in a few days, when the first strangeness has worn off, I'm quite sure I shall be far happier here and far less lonely than I would be in a flat. And you couldn't have stayed with me much longer anyhow because I couldn't afford it. And if I died, I, I should have nothing to leave you and you'd be alone. I couldn't bear to think of that. We've talked about this over and over again. Oh, please, please, dear Dora, don't cry any more. It, it, it isn't nearly as bad as it looks. Now, now you promised, remember, to come down and see me next Sunday fortnight. Yes. Yes, I know. I shall look forward to it. And I shall write to you first thing tomorrow and let you know how my first meeting with May went off. Horrible old cat. Oh, no, no, no. She may have mellowed with the years. I'll give her mellow if I get within spitting distance of her. Oh, Dora. Darling old Dora. I want you now, this, this very minute, to go out of the house, get into the car and drive away. Now, now, now don't let either of us say another word. I'm beginning to feel a little tremulous myself. Please. Please, dearest old friend. Away with you. I've put the snapshot of Peachy on the mantelpiece. The one with the ball in his mouth. Oh. The, thank you, Dora. Thank you. Oh, they ought to be here soon. Is the soup on? Yes, Miss Archibald. I just took a look at the two old ladies. They're both asleep. I hope the others won't disturb them. You'd better have a kettle going, too. Some of them will probably want tea. Uh, uh, yes, Miss Archibald. Sorry to keep you up, Doreen. You can have an extra hour in the morning. They'll all be kipping late after tonight. <sighs> Still raining, damn it. That means the roads will be greasy and Baxter will have to drive slowly. The show's tomorrow, isn't it, Miss Archibald? Yes. Um, tonight, really. It's three o'clock in the morning. Is it true that Buck Randy's in it? Yes, I think so. Oh, he's smashing. You've never seen him, have you? He was on the telly last week. The man made him take off his shirt and sing a song. Oh, it was lovely. Miss Myrtle, I thought you were asleep. Everyone's forgotten me. The house is empty and I'm left alone, except for Martha Clarington. You didn't wake her, did you? No, I passed her door on tiptoe and she was snoring. Miss Myrtle, you're really very naughty. You ought to be in bed. You know you ought. Oh, please, please, let me come to the fire. My room is so cold. You know that's not true, dear. It's right next to the airing cupboard. Out, damn spot, out, I say. One, two. Why then, just time to do it. You must not quote Macbeth in this house, Miss Myrtle. You know how it upsets everybody. There isn't anybody to upset. All the rooms on the landing are empty, vast and wandering air. Perhaps it's the end of the world. Oh, good heavens, sandwiches. Who ever thought of sandwiches on the Day of Judgment? It isn't the Day of Judgment, old dear. It's three o'clock on Monday morning and you must go back to bed. But why the sandwiches? They're for the others when they come back from the rehearsal at the Palladium. You went with them last year, don't you remember? Why didn't I go this year? Because Dr. Jevon said it would be bad for you. He said your heart wasn't up to it. There isn't anything wrong with my heart. It's my head that betrays me. It's so noisy. The island is full of noises. My head is an island. An island is a piece of land entirely surrounded by water. Please, may I have a glass of water? Doreen, run into the kitchen and get her one. There's a good girl. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Now, Miss Myrtle, you go back to bed and I'll bring the water up to you. Who is that girl who runs about? You know Doreen, dear. She brings you your breakfast every morning. Doreen is a very common name, don't you think? Well, that's not her fault. All names ending in Ean are common. Doreen, Maureen, Noreen. Eileen, Kathleen, they're all right, aren't they? Eileen and Kathleen who? Here you are, Miss Myrtle. What's this for? You asked for a glass of water. Thank you, my dear kind child. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the performance. What does she mean? Never mind, just say 
Yes, it saves time. Oh. <laughs> yes, Miss Myrtle. I'm afraid it was a rather dull matinee audience. But it was the boat race, I expect. Their minds were divided. Take her back to bed, Doreen. I don't care for sandwiches as a rule. But tonight, I am hungry as a hunter. Mm. Oh, here they are. Run and open the door, Doreen. Oh, yes, Miss Archibald. You really must go back to bed, Miss Myrtle. Whatever would Dr. Jevons say if he found you wandering about the house in the middle of the night in your dressing gown? Oh, please. Please don't send me back to bed. It's so lonely and cold upstairs with all those empty rooms. Please let me stay here. Please, please. There, 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 oh dear. There's nothing to cry about. <laughs> all right, you can stay down here if you really want to, but do try not to get overexcited. I don't know who you are, but you smell like horses. It's raining cats and dogs. Oh, I thought we'd never get here. Good God, what's Sarita doing? Oughtn't she to be in bed? She woke up and came down only a few minutes ago, and I can't get her back. Hello, dear. I haven't seen you for a long time. I've been away on tour. You can bring in the soup now, Doreen. Okay, Miss Archibald. I'm absolutely exhausted. I thought that ash with the drizzle would never stop. Personally, I'm going straight up to bed. I don't want any soup. It might wake me up. Good night. Good, good night, Lord. Now, uh, how was the rehearsal? Oh, very good, but I fear much too long. Why did they have to have all those microphones? None of them nowadays could project their voices beyond a whisper. I thought Marjorie Atherton's dance with all the men was very charming. Very. Considering that she can't put one foot in front of the other. There's that girl who brings me my breakfast. What's she doing here? That's Doreen, dear. You remember Doreen, don't you? Of course I do. We shared digs in Wolverhampton years and years ago. Don't you remember? Oh, uh, well, Miss Myrtle, I am... Of course she remembers. Who would forget a thing like that? You can hop off to bed now, Doreen. Okay, Miss Archie, thanks. Thank you for waiting up for us, Doreen. I'm afraid you must be very tired. Oh, it's a pleasure, I'm sure, Miss. Don't forget to turn the gas out on the landing. We promised Mrs. Worsley we would, and we don't want any more scenes. Okay, Miss Myrtle. Head like a sieve, that girl. No concentration. She dried up dead in the first act last night, just stood there with her mouth opening and shutting silently like a carp. Poor Ronnie was frantic. Bedtime now, old dear. I know, I know. Can't afford to lose our beauty sleep. Train call tomorrow at 9.30. Oh, dear. I must remember to give a little present to that girl who keeps running about. What is her name? Doreen, dear. Poor child. Fancy being saddled with a name like that. Sounds like an eye lotion. Oh. Well, girls, here's to the midnight matinee from which all our blessings flow. And to all those very kind people who worked so hard for it. Here, here. <laughs> Poor old Sarita. Do you think she'll ever get any better? Or just go on and on, getting madder and madder? She'll probably stay about the same. She's quite happy most of the time. At least that's what Dr. Jevons says. It's a form of escape, isn't it? Yes, I suppose so. Miss Archie's wonderful with her. Miss Archie's a pretty good sort taken all round. If only she didn't make us feel we ought to present arms all the time. Here's some soup, May. I said, here's some soup, May. Would you like it or not? Are you never going to break down? Oh, for goodness sake, mate, Davenport, it's shame you should be feeling. Walking through the last years of your life with your head so high and your heart so full of hatred. Please don't talk to me like that. Mind your own business. It is Deirdre's business, May. It's the business of all of us in this house to live together as amicably as possible without causing each other any embarrassment. Well, if you take my advice, you'll pay no attention to her. She's warming her cold heart at the fire of her own hatred. Take that away and she'll freeze to death. You mark my words. I'll mark them, Deirdre, but I fear at the present moment they are not being very helpful. Oh, well, the sweet waters of oblivion for me. I'll say a couple of 
Hail Mary's before I drop off in case the good Lord should see fit to gather me to his bosom in the middle of the night. Somehow I don't feel that he will. Good, good night, Deirdre. Good night. May? May, I want to talk to you. Please let me pass. I have no intention of letting you pass, nor have I any intention of allowing you to carry on this idiocy any longer. We've now been in this house together for a month without addressing one word to each other, and the situation is intolerable. You are going to listen to me, to what I have to say, so you'd better make up your mind to it. I am not. Stay where you are. Leave go of me immediately. You must be out of your mind. Listen to me. I implore you to listen to me. Not for my sake, I don't care if you never speak to me again, but for the sake of all the other people in this house. The age-old feud must be resolved here and now. If we were living our ordinary lives, it would be different. We could go on avoiding each other, as we have done for the last 30 years, but here we can't. Here we are forced to see each other, morning, noon and night, until we die. We'd better face this fact, May. We've fallen on evil days, and there's no sense in making them more evil than they need be. Oh, do let us, for God's sake, forget the past and welcome our limited future with as much grace as possible. Eloquently put, Lotta. I would be the last to deny your sentimental appeal to an audience. Once a ham, always a ham. I did my best. I shan't try any more. It's a waste of time. And there's so little time left. Thank God. Hello, sir. Hello, Doreen. How are you? Nice name, thanks. It's through here, is it? Where is everyone? Oh, upstairs, I think. Only oh, except Miss Clark and Miss Davenport. They've gone for a walk. Is Miss Archie in her office? Yes, sir. You might tell her we're here. Okay, sir. Oh, quite a nice room. Uh, who's that bust off? Sir Hilary Brooks. He founded the place. Oh, my mother was crazy about him when she was young. He used to wait in pit queues for hours and hours. Mm. I have a feeling he was rather an old ham. Oh, my grandmother was crazy about her, Ellen Terry. A keen theatre-going family. Good Lord, yes, they never stopped. I was dragged screaming to matinees from the age of four <laughs> onwards. <laughs> Didn't you enjoy them? Not the jolly pantomimes and children's plays. I can't think of Peter Pan to this day without a shudder. Oh, I love Peter Pan. That's because you've got a mother fixation. All sensitive lads with mother fixations worship Peter Pan. I expect I've got a crocodile fixation, too. Lord, <laughs> says she won't be a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Doreen. Uh, who is the uh, oldest inmate here? Martha Carrington. She's pushing 95. Good Lord. And what's more, she still has a beau. Oh. Osgood Meeker. He's just a kiddie of 70. <laughs> He comes to visit her every Sunday, rain or shine. He's probably up with her now. He always brings her violets. Oh, good. That's the sort of stuff I want. You will be careful, won't you? Um, well, I mean, don't mention names more than you can help. Don't worry, I'll be discretion itself. It's just possible, though, that one or two of them may recognise me. I shouldn't think so. You haven't started your new television programme yet. No, but they'll know my name from the column. I'll introduce you as... Miss Starkey. Why, Starkey, for heaven's sake. Peter Pan again. Oh. It's an obsession with me. Uh, where are they going to put the, um, what do you call it, if they get it? Solarium. Ah. Uh, through the French windows, there. Oh. We want to glass the whole terrace in. It would mean an awful lot to them to be able to enjoy the sun without the wind. As it is, they can hardly ever use the terrace unless the weather's perfect. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Oh, damn house was built in the wrong place to begin with. Hello, Perry. I didn't hear the old bike. Hello, Archie. No, I came down with a friend. May I introduce Miss Starkey? Miss Archibald. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? She drives like a fiend. <laughs> I think she has a sterling moss fixation. <laughs> Good show. <laughs> I've got an old Jack convertible. Quite a nice little job. I should just say so. What can you do in her? Up to 120 on the open road. Wizard. <laughs> Perhaps I'd better leave you girls to your feminine secrets. I had an MG just after the war, but I ran it into a lorry. Butterfingers? Uh, were you wafts, uh, Renz or, or ATS? And such. Oh, Lord. That must be 
must have been a bit tricky having to deal with all those actors. Oh, it was damned interesting. My job, of course, was mainly administrative, but I managed to get about a bit. Cairo, Bombay, Burma. Better than staying at home and pen-pushing in some ministry. I was a wren. A uh, mortar for two years. Good for you. Hello, Penny. Hello, Cora. May I introduce an old friend of mine? Miss Starkey, Miss Cora Clark. How do you do? How do you do? And Miss May Davenport. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, my father was one of your greatest admirers, Miss Davenport. Uh, I fear you must be confusing your father with your grandfather, my dear. <laughs> Have you had a nice walk? Very pleasant. We managed to hobble to the towpath and back. Miss Starkey was most anxious to come and see the wings and everything. So I, I brought her down to tea. How nice. If you'll forgive us for a moment or two, we'll go upstairs and uh, take off our things. <laughs> a bientôt, Miss Starkey. <laughs> He's Osgood here today. Of course. He never misses a Sunday. Uh, Lotta Bainbridge is here, isn't she? Yes. Yes, she came in June. Lotta Bainbridge and May Davenport. Wasn't there a famous quorum or something? A... I seem to remember hearing about it. Yes, there was. What was it about? I don't know. It was ages ago, anyhow. Have they kissed and made friends? Well, no, not exactly. Yeah. Actually, actually, it's a bit tricky. Hmm, there's a good story in that, isn't there? Story? How do you mean? Old foes still feuding in the twilight of their lives. That sounds like newspaper stuff. <laughs> yes. Yes, it, it does rather, doesn't it? There you are, Miss Archie. I, I, I didn't see you when I arrived, so I went straight up as usual. Uh, I hope you don't mind. No, of course not. <laughs> She's in splendid form today. Positively blooming. Uh, may I... Uh, uh, this is uh, Miss Starkey, Mr. Meeker. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, hello, Mr. Lasko. Hello, sir. I understand that you visit Miss Carrington every Sunday. Oh, yes. Yes, ever since she first arrived here years ago. It's become quite a little ritual, hasn't it, Miss Archie? <laughs> Rather. <laughs> I think, uh, well, I, I hope it gives her pleasure. It, it seems oh, Of course it does, Mr. Meeker. She looks forward to it all through the week. How long is it since she retired? Oh, many, many years. <laughs> Thirty or more. <laughs> I last saw her in the twenties in the late Mrs. Robert. It was St. James's, you know. <laughs> she was getting on in years even then. But she was as witty and stylish as ever. She had a, a special way of moving about the stage that was all her own, effortless and with such infinite grace. I saw her for the first time in 1906, I think it was, in The Lavender Girl. The Lavender Girl? <laughs> it's certainly going back a bit. Yeah, I was only 18 at the time, and I quite lost my heart. <laughs> well, those were her great years, you know, her musical comedy years. There was nobody like her. And there never will be again. All London was at her feet. I remember my parents talking about her. <laughs> Do you? She hadn't much of a voice, had she? Well, I suppose she hadn't much of anything, really, except magic. And she had a great deal of that. And now she's dying upstairs. No, Miss... Uh, living upstairs. I don't think she will ever die. Not quite. Bully for you, Mr. Meeker. I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Uh, would you like to have your tea in my office, as usual, Mr. Meeker, or, or will you wait and have it with all of us in the dining room? Oh, uh, neither today, thank you, Miss Archie. I have an appointment in London. I can just catch the 4.40 if I have You're quite sure? No trouble. Oh, uh, quite sure. Thank you all the same. You're always so kind. Um, goodbye, Mr. Lasko. Goodbye, sir. Until next Sunday? Oh, yes, yes, next Sunday. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss... Uh, uh, Starkey. Goodbye. Uh, your parents were quite right. She hadn't much of a voice, but it didn't matter. I really do assure you, it didn't matter in the least. There's certainly gold in these yard hills. Uh, Miss Archibald, would it be all right if I took a few shots of the house uh, from the garden? Mm. Well, the light's still good. Shots? Uh, snapshots. For my memory book. My camera's in the car. I'll get it. His... No, 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 no. Don't, don't you travel. I'd like to wander around on my own for a bit anyhow. I shan't be long. What is going on? How do you mean? Who is she, Perry? Why, well, I, I told you. She's an old friend of mine, Miss Stark. You're up to something. Don't be silly. What would I be up she's to? She's pressed, isn't she? Yes. Yes, she's 
Zelda Fennick. Zelda Fennick? The one who writes all that hogwash in the clarion? Yes. Good God, have you gone out of your mind? You know that press interviews are dead against the rules. She has a lot of influence. Do any of the committee know she's here? But of course not. It, it, it was my idea. Now, look here, my lad. You're going to get yourself into serious trouble. I don't care. I want the old girls to get that solarium. The committee has dug its feet in. I, I've done everything I can to persuade them, but they're as stubborn as mules. The fund could afford it perfectly well. I've got another estimate from Weatherby's. Only 1800 What has all this got to do with Zelda Fennick? I said that if she'd promised to make an appeal for us on her television program, I'd arrange for her to have an exclusive story on the wings. You'll get the sack. You'll get us both the sack. Why the hell didn't you consult me first? Well, you needn't know anything about it. I'll take the rap. I can't agree to it. You'll have to get her out and quick pack up the whole idea. Don't get into such a frizz. Well, she's promised to let me see whatever she writes before it goes in. Oh, I've heard that one before. I don't like it, Perry. I don't like it one little bit. It's going dead against the regulations. The old girls have built up this solarium in their minds as the one thing in the world they really want. I, I don't see why they should be deprived of it just because some dizzy fathead like Booty Nethersoul talks a lot of hot air about needless expenditure. Who were in favour of it? Laura, uh, Dame Maggie, old Cecil Murdoch. A few of the others were wavering, but, but they allowed themselves to be overruled. Damn it. I don't know what to think. Well, it isn't needless expenditure anyway. It would make a very real difference to their health and comfort. All right. I'll play ball. At a girl. We shall probably find ourselves up the old creek, but they can't fire us both. They can, but they won't. They'd have to find replacements. And the few of them that really take an interest and do the work, like Laura and Dame Maggie, know damn well that's easier said than done. Look out. Sarita's coming. Oh, Lord. Let's go into my office. Right. How do you do? I'm afraid my sister is at a rehearsal, but she's sure to be back soon. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Isn't that pretty? Uh, yes, uh, very, very pretty. Well, when we were very young, we used to have boxes of coloured matches on Guy Fawkes Day, and the tips of them were different from ordinary matches, longer and fatter like little black sausages. When you struck them, they were like red and green stars. You... You must forgive my ignorance, but I don't know your name. Uh, mine is Zelda F uh, Starkey. Miserable Starkey. <laughs> What's yours? I'm Sarita Myrtle. I expect that surprises you, doesn't it? Uh, oh, yes. yes. Yes, of course. I've always looked so much younger than my age. It's an advantage in a way, of course, but one can't go on playing out a news forever, can one? How long have you been here? Oh, quite a while. It's a very nice house, isn't it? Capacity. Are you happy here on the whole? Oh, yes, except on matinee days. I hate those tea trays. They're so distracting. Are they kind to you? Oh, yes. Sometimes they are a little dull in the first act, but they generally warm up. <laughs> Is your room comfortable? It's cold. She says it isn't, because it's next to the airing cupboard. But she doesn't always speak the truth, I'm afraid. Is she Miss Archibald? Yes, I think so. It's difficult to be quite sure. People's faces change so. It's very confusing. There. What the hell are you doing with those matches, Sarita Myrtle? Is it burning us off to send us that you're after? Please go back to bed this very minute. How do you do? Never you mind how I do. Come away with you before Miss Archie catches you and clubs you in arms. Take her arm, Estelle. For heaven's sake, keep your voice down, Rupert. The children will hear. Come on now. Henceforward, Mr. Cartwright, we must regard one another as strangers. I can say no more. Farewell. Go after Estelle and see her safe in her bed. You have more of a way with her than I have. The poor old thing's a bit weak in the head. <laughs> yes, I gather that. My name's Deirdre O'Malley. You a friend of Miss Archie's? No. As a matter of fact, I came down with Perry Lasco. I'm just a, a stray visitor. I've heard so much about the wings, and I wanted to see it for myself. My name is Starkey. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you, I'm sure. New face is always a bit of a treat. 
We get tired of looking at our own old ones year in, year out. Have you been here long? Nearly 20 years. Oh. I've seen a lot of them come and go, but the good Lord seen fit to let me linger on. Are you happy here? As happy as you could expect a bunch of old women to be when the tide of life has turned away from them and are left high and dry waiting for the grave. Is the food good? Oh, that's a practical question and deserves a practical answer. No, it is not. What's wrong with it? You're not one of the committee, are you? Oh, no. <laughs> good. I'd have a few home truths to tell you if you were. Aren't you being a little bitter, Miss O'Malley? Ah, bitter, is it? You'd be bitter if the last years of your life were controlled by a lot of gabbing, clippity gibbets who don't really give a hoot in hell whether you're alive or dead. You wouldn't stay off, of course, and give the understudy a chance, not her. And the result was that the whole company went down with mumps. I had mumps once in Inverness. I nearly went mad. Oh, how do you do? And this is a friend of Perry's, Miss... Uh, uh, Miss Starkey. Badge. I'm Benita Belgrave, and this is Maud Melrose. How do you do? I'm beginning to think that the Sunday Times must be subsidised by the French government, Cora. Do you think so? Why, Perry, I thought you deserted us. No, of course not. Miss Archie and I have been having a little gossip. Is that your car outside? Uh, yes. It's a beauty, isn't it? <laughs> I saw it from the lavatory window. Really, my dear Bonita, there's no need to be over-explicit. Well, I couldn't have seen it from my own window because it faces in the opposite direction. Oh, when I think of the changes in the world during the span of my own miserable lifetime, my head reels. That's no lie. Your lifespan hasn't been in the least miserable, Deirdre. You've enjoyed every minute of it and still do. And what is there to enjoy, I should like to know? Loitering about here in me dotage, getting feebler and wearier with every blessed breath I take. Oh, pay no attention to Deirdre, Miss Starkey. She loves talking like that. She also takes considerable pleasure in embarrassing the rest of us. Maybe it's the unacceptable ring of truth behind me words that embarrasses you, May Davenport. I wish you would address me either as May or Miss Davenport, Deirdre. May Davenport sounds like a roll call. You can save your almighty arrogance until you get to the final roll call, Miss May Dunford. Now then, Deirdre, that's no way to talk when there are strangers present. Oh, nothing I do is right and nothing I say is right. If I fell into the dark waters of the river this very night, I doubt if anyone would lift a finger to help me. <laughs> the Irish can never resist cheap sentimentality. Oh, May, don't make things worse, for heaven's oh, sake. What's happening? Nothing much. Deirdre's getting a bit out of hand, that's all. Out of hand, is it? Yes, uh, it is. Be quiet. Uh, Lotta, I don't think you've met Miss Starkey. Hello, how are you? Miss Starkey? Yes, I, I came down with Perry. We're old friends. Is Starkey your private name? Private name? Uh, you're really Zelda Fennick, aren't you? The one who writes the People Are News column in the Sunday Clarion. Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, Lord. That's torn it. Is this true, Perry? Uh, yes. Perfectly true. I saw you on television a few weeks ago. I think, Perry, that it would have been more polite and considerate if you'd introduced Miss Fenwick by her proper name. I I'll, I'll explain it later. I'll explain it all later. I'm sure that no explanation is in the least necessary. It's merely a little confusing. I beg all. to differ. A great deal of explanation is necessary. May I ask, Miss Fenwick, if you're here in a professional capacity? I, I am always in a professional capacity, Miss Davenport. That is an essential part of my job. Is the committee aware of your visit to us? No, and if I may say so, I rather resent your tone. I am not answerable to you for my actions or to your committee. Oh. Um, j just a minute, everybody. Uh, please let me explain. Be quiet, Perry. It seems to me that the situation is being rather over-dramatized. Well, I don't no, say... we no, I'm afraid I must insist on speaking. I'm sure Miss Fenwick will be the first to realize that it will place us all in a most humiliating position if she mentions either the wings itself or any of its occupants in her newspaper. In the first place, it would be a breach of the rules of this, uh, this rather specialized charity. And in the second place, I'm sure that even in her professional capacity, she would not wish either to betray our confidence or abuse our hospitality. 
I am right, aren't I, Miss Fenwick? Well, as a matter of fact... You will promise, won't you? Even if you had it in mind to write a story about us, not to write it. We're happy enough here, living out our days in this most agreeable backwater. The last thing any of us wants is publicity. It would shed too harsh a light on us, show up all our lines and wrinkles. That would be an unkind thing to do, wouldn't it? We are still actresses in our hearts. We'd like to be remembered as we were, not as we are. You will give us your promise, won't you? I I appreciate what you say, Miss Bainbridge. But I'm afraid I must be honest with you. My editor has been trying to get a story on this place for years. I know you will understand that it isn't only in the theatre that the job must come first. I cannot promise not to write about the wind. Well, I'd like to I say... I can promise to do all I can to help. I've already arranged with Perry that if he let me come here, that I would make an appeal on my TV programme for your solarium. Solarium? Good God! Are we to sell ourselves to get that damn solarium? Oh, Cora, please. I'm ashamed of you, Perry. Mortally, mortally ashamed. Here, steady on. It's no good flying off the handle at Perry. He only did it for the best. Shame on you. Miss whatever your name is, shame on you for worming your way in here like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now may the Holy Mother of God forgive you for making a mock of a house full of poor defenseless old women who are only asking to be left in peace and quiet. The devil's curse on you for being a double-faced scheming hypocrite. Write what you like and be dumb to you. <sighs> well, that might say. You certainly have, Deirdre, and I, for one, would like to throttle you. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. Are you coming, Perry? No, uh, I've got to stay here. Goodbye, everybody. I'm sorry to have caused such a hullabaloo. <laughs> This whole thing's an outrage. An outrage. Oh, for heaven's sake, calm down, May. The committee must be warned immediately. Pressure must be brought to bear. Personally, I think a great deal of fuss is being made about nothing. What does it really matter whether she writes about us or not? We shall be publicly degraded. Nonsense. She'll probably write a lot of sentimental rubbish, which will embarrass us for a little until we forget it and everyone else does too. Oh, let's go into tea and talk about something else. Come along, Benita. Maud. May I? I, I really am sorry. Don't, don't speak to me. Come on, Paula. Lotta, I did it for the best. Honestly, I did. I'm sure you did, Perry. But if you'll forgive my saying so, it was an error in taste. Come on, old chap. I don't want any tea. Oh, cheer up. It'll all blow over. An error in taste. No, I suppose it was, really. But I didn't see it like that. I don't feel like tea either. Let's pop into my office and have a slug of something a bit stronger. Sarita's room. Wake up the others, dear Drea. I'll fetch Miss Archie. Well, right Miss Archie, come quickly. Sarita's room is on fire. Sarita's room on fire. Oh. Don't panic now. Keep calm, everybody. Oh, out of the way, Miss Davenport. I must get to the fire extinguisher. Uh, all form up in your regular lines and wait for orders. Has anyone telephoned the fire brigade? No, not yet. And I suggest we do so immediately. Come and help me find the number. I've left my glasses upstairs. So have I. In that case, we'll dial 999. Nine, nine. nine comes before O. Oh, we can't miss it. Bang the nozzle against the wall. Oh, for God's sake. Somebody shut that window. Having escaped death by burning, it would be idiotic to die of pneumonia. I only opened it to let the smoke out. We were suffocating. Poor Sarita. Oh, it's all right. Everything's under control. Presented the curtains were caught fire. I've got them right. Has anyone got any specs? May and I can't see the damn dial. We tried 999, but nothing's happened. It doesn't matter. It was only the curtains, and Miss Archie's put them out. Oh, thank God. It looks so pretty. So very pretty. Busy indeed. More thanks to you, Sarita Myrtle, that we're not all charred corpses at this very minute. Burnt to bloody crisps in our beds. And we should have been if I hadn't smelt the smoke. Uh, 
keep that blanket round you. Why am I wearing this strange garment? I is this to be an oriental production? How did she get a hold of the matches? She must have pinched them when nobody was looking and hidden them somewhere. You know, Miss Archie always searches her room thoroughly every night. Well, it's as much as our lives are worth to have her in the house a minute longer. Calm down, dear Dre. I'll calm down when I feel like it, not before. And you can put that in your high and mighty pipe and smoke it, made dumb board. Do you think we ought to telephone to Dr. Jevons? For four? For Sarita, of course. He might give her a sedative or something. Oh, tell him to bring a straitjacket while he's at it. Oh, you be quiet, dear. It's unkind to say things like that. Oh, dear, I wonder how poor old Martha is. I'd better go and see. I'll go, Lotta. Stay where you are. I've got to get some cigarettes anyhow. I'm shaking like a leaf. Now, what do you expect with the whole house blazing to the skies? The house isn't blazing to the skies, dear. Then well, it might well be if I hadn't noticed that smoke curling under me door like a grey serpent. I know what I could do with, and that's a nip of whiskey. I've got some in my room. How about you, Cora? Thanks. Any other offers? Lotta? May? No, thanks, dear Bonita. I should love a little. You're very kind. I'll fetch the bottle. Now, stay by Sarita, Cora, while I go and find some glasses. What are we all waiting here for in the middle of the night? Is someone going to read a play to us? That's not for anybody who tries. Martha's all right. She's fast asleep. But poor Miss Archie is wet through. Cigarette anybody? Thanks, I'd love one. How is Martha, Maud? She's fast asleep. She didn't hear a thing. Yes, the booze, girls. Miss Archie's having a wonderful time upstairs, charging about in her pyjamas and shouting orders like a sergeant major. She and Doreen are moving Sarita's things into the room at the end of the passage. Oh, dear, that's the one next to mine. I shan't sleep a wink, I know. I shan't. My heart's pounding as it is. Take some bismuth, dear. Oh, that was a plain shame and very mistake. Thank God the jolly old extinguisher worked all right. It seems to work almost too well. You're soaking. That was when the damn thing just went off. I was holding it the wrong way round. <laughs> Have a drop of this, Mon Colonel, before you catch your death. Oh, thanks. I could do with a snifter. I think your presence of mind was absolutely splendid, Miss Archie. We're all very grateful to you. Here, here. Oh, I'm glad you agree with me, May. I think it's time we all went back to bed. Well, I'll just slip out of these pyjamas and pop on the dressing gown, and then we'll take Sarita up. I shan't be too shaky. Come on up, Arlena. There's no sense in just sitting about. I suppose it's a shock, but I'm feeling all trembly. Well, the shock's over now, so there's nothing to feel trembly about anymore. Come along. Shock's a very dangerous thing. A friend of mine once saw a man run over by a bus in Newcastle, and three days later she fell down dead. Come on, dear. It's no use being morbid. I fell in love with Herbert in Newcastle. Herbert who? My Herbert, of course. We used to go to Whitney Bay on non-matinee days and hold hands and look at the sea. I think I'll go up too. Deirdre, you coming? Yeah, all right, all right. Good come night, on. everybody. Good night, Maud. Good night, Maud. Now, come along, Sarita. Time for Bedfordshire. Mm. My brother Armand and I were all in all to each other. He the little father. I, the tiny mother. Good Lord, the scarlet pimp. And Give me a hand, Bonita. Of course. I'm sorry if I've done anything wrong, but please do not touch me. I cannot bear people to touch Quickly, me. Quickly, Bonita, head her off from going to her own room. I don't want her to see it as it is. The sea was rather muddy, and there was always a wind. But there was a freshness in the air, and we were in love. Oh, God. It's intolerable. Of course it is, but it's no use allowing yourself to be upset by it. There's nothing to be done. I suppose you'll have to be sent away, eventually. Yes, I suppose you will. What happens when the mind goes like that? Does it make it better or worse? Living, I mean. Who knows? More bearable, perhaps. I think Sarita's quite happy. I expect she's to be ended, really. At least she doesn't realize what a bore it all is, all this sitting around and waiting. Are you coming, May? No. I'm going to stand by the fire for a little. So am I. Good night, girl. <laughs> they, were, they were here all the time. My glasses. They were here all the time in my work bag. 
and frosts were slain and flowers begotten, and in green underwood and cover, blossom by blossom, the spring begins. The fire's nearly out. There's enough heat left, really. It's not very cold. Were you happy with him? Yes. I was happy with him until the day he died. That's something gained at any rate, isn't it? He was a monster sometimes, of course. Those black Irish rages. Yes, I remember them well. Why did you take him from me? I didn't. He came to me of his own free will. You must have known that. He wasn't the sort of character that anyone could take from anyone else. You were prettier than I was. You know perfectly well that had nothing to do with it. The spark is struck or it isn't. It's seldom the fault of any one person. Any one person can achieve a lot by determination. Would you like a piece of accurate but rather unpleasant information? What do you mean? There was somebody else. Somebody else? Yes. Between the time he left you and came to me. I don't believe it. It's quite true. Her name was Lavinia. Lavinia Parsons. Not that dreadful girl who played Ophelia with poor old Godfrey. <laughs> That's the one. Are you telling me this in order to exonerate yourself? No, May. I'm not apologizing to you, you know, nor asking for your forgiveness. I see no reason to exonerate myself. Charles fell in love with me, and I fell in love with him, and we were married. I have no regrets. You're very fortunate. I have a great many. Well, don't. It's a waste of time. What became of your first husband, Webster, whatever his name was? His name was Webster Bennett. After our divorce in 1926, he went to Canada and died there a few years later. You had a son, didn't you? Yes. I had a son. Is he alive? Yes. He went to Canada with his father. He's there still. He's had two wives. The first one apparently was a disaster. The second one, we'll hope, is satisfactory. Does he write to you often? I haven't heard from him for 17 years. I'm sorry, Lotta. I'm very sorry. Thank you. That's kind of you. I was unhappy about it for a long time, but I'm not anymore. He was always his father's boy more than mine. I don't think he ever cared for me much. Except, of course, when he was little. Why did you come here? Was it absolutely necessary? Yes, absolutely. I have a minute income of 200 pounds a year and nothing saved. The last two plays I did were failures and there was nothing else to be done. Also, I found I couldn't learn lines anymore. That broke my nerve. Well, that's what really finished me, too. I was always a slow study at the best of times... The strain became intolerable and humiliating, more humiliating even than this. I refuse to consider this humiliating. I think we've earned this honestly. Really, I do. Perhaps we have, Lotta. Perhaps we have. Bonita's left her bottle of whiskey. Would you like a sip? A very small one. All right. Lavinia Parsons. He must have been mad. She was prettier than you and prettier than me, and a great deal younger than both of us. Here you are. I must buy a bottle of whiskey tomorrow in Maidenhead. What's really the best sort? Oh, I don't know. There's um, Haig and Haig and Black and White. Oh, they're all much of a muchness unless one happens to be a connoisseur. And we're neither of us that. Well, Lotta... We meet again? Yes, my dear. We meet again. Happy days. <laughs> you really must listen to this, May. It really is too ghastly. 
I've already told you I do not wish to hear a word of it. Old foes still feuding in the twilight of their lives. <laughs> it's in large black letters, May. The first time we've ever been co-starred. <laughs> well, I can see nothing to laugh at. It's vulgar and inaccurate and full of treacly sentimentality, I admit, but... Somehow it isn't as bad as I feared. I cannot imagine how it could have been much worse. Well, it might have been a good deal more vindictive. I wouldn't have been surprised after Deirdre's little outburst. I said what I had in my heart to say to the fawning, deceitful creature, and I don't regret a word of it. She's even dragged poor old Osgood in. It's lower down in the column after the bit about us all sitting in the garden at dusk, listening to the rooks cawing and wistfully remembering our former triumph. Sitting in the garden at dusk, indeed. We should all be eaten alive. She seemed quite a well-educated young woman. It's curious that she should write so abominably. No other sort of writing would be accepted by that horrible rag. There is no elegance, dignity or reticence left. Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. England hath need of thee. Curtain. <laughs> really, listen to this. I wonder if we ordinary people realize how much we owe to these faithful old servants of the public, wearily playing out the last act of their lives, all passion spent, all glamour gone, unwanted and forgotten, just waiting Waiting in the wings. That would make a wonderful number, wouldn't it, Maud? Yes, yes. I've got it. Hmm. Yes. Waiting in the wings, waiting in the wings. Older than God, on we God, waiting in the wings. Hopping about the garden like a lot of Douglas things. Waiting, waiting, waiting in the wings. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies. I, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Of course you're not, Osgood. We're just feeling rather skittish. Well, the front door was on the latch, so I didn't bother to ring the bell. Quite right. You're one of the family, anyhow. Oh, how kind of you to say that. How very kind. Um, I, I suppose it'll be all right if I go straight up. I'm sure it will. I'll call Miss Archie if you like. No, 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 please. <laughs> Don't trouble. I know the way. <laughs> There's such a nice article about all of you in the Sunday Clarion. I read it in the train coming down. It almost brought tears to my eyes. So sensitively written. Most touching. Most touching. I, I... The poor man must be out of his mind. An honest reaction from an ordinary member of the public. I give up. It only goes to prove that we are all far too touchy. Yes, Perry. Oh, poor boy, I feel so sorry for him. Personally, I find it hard to forgive him for unleashing all this vulgarity on her head. Well, then it's shame you should be feeling made, Davenport. Do you think he's come to say goodbye? Goodbye? Oh, how awful. Whatever should we do without him? I shouldn't. I'd leave. And where would you go, may I ask? I'd go and live with my horrible niece in Penge. Oh, we'd all go on strike. Suppose it is the last time we shall ever see him. I can't bear it. I think we'd all better keep quite calm until Perry can tell us exactly what happened. Hello, everybody. Oh, darling Perry. Thank you, Maud. I see that one of you has forgiven me, at least. Oh, nonsense. We've all forgiven you ages ago, except May. And she's only holding out so that you can make an extra fuss of her. Really, Lotta, how can you say such things? I suppose you've all read it. We certainly have. It's no use me saying I'm sorry anymore, is it? I mean, I, I did write and try and explain. It was a very nice letter, Perry. Miss Archie read it out to us. But that was before the special meeting. What happened? Exactly what I expected would happen. Oh, Perry. It was hell. Oh, poor Perry. It was all my fault. I shall never forgive myself. Never. What happened exactly, Perry? Tell us. For heaven's sake, Perry. Oh, they all flew at me. And Booty Nethersole said a lot about me exceeding my duties and assuming responsibilities that I had no right to assume. Silly bitch. Anita, please. Go on, Perry. Dame Maggie had already telephoned to the editor of the Clarion to have Zelda's peace stopped, but he flatly refused. Then, after a lot more talk, they told me that I should have to go. 
I was sacked. Oh, oh, oh Perry, I really am most distressed. We all are. Even May? I'm sure I hope it will be a lesson to you in the future. Oh, really, May? I think you're being unnecessarily disagreeable. Just a moment, everybody, please. I haven't quite finished my story. Go on, then, Perry. Finish it. There was another meeting called yesterday, a much smaller one. Dame Maggie was in the chair, and Booty, thank God, was playing her matinee. I hope I've guessed what happened. Go on. The resolution of Thursday's meeting, by some oversight, had not been minuted. And so, after a rather kind little lecture, I was reinstated. Hooray! Oh, how perfectly splendid. And would you, would you all like to know why I was reinstated? Yes. Why there was such a change in the weather? Perry, I absolutely forbid you to say another word. Just allow me five. Thank you. Dear, dear May. Well, I'll be damned. What in the name of the blessed saints did he say that for? You've been very sly, May. I'm surprised at you. Did you write to Maggie? I'd prefer not to discuss it. You must tell us. You really must. Please, May. I telephoned to Dame Maggie from Miss Archie's office on Thursday evening while you were all at supper. I explained that the whole thing had been a foolish mistake on Perry's part and that he was too important to all of us to be summarily dismissed for such a trivial misdemeanor. I added that we were all prepared to write strong letters of protest to the committee. Well, blow me down and bury me bones if that's not the biggest surprise I've ever had in my life. Hats off to you, May Davenport. Once and for all, will you stop calling me May Davenport? Who's that, I wonder? Dr. Jevons, I expect. Oh, of course, yes, I'd quite forgotten. Oh, how horrid. I'd forgotten, too, for the moment, what with a clarion article of Perry arriving and everything. Poor old love. I suppose it's all for the best, really. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, is Miss Archie in her office? No, she's upstairs. It's not an ambulance, is it? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, just my old Hillman. I'm driving Miss Myrtle myself. Oh, how nice of you. I am so glad. I'll go up. Uh, may I suggest something without appearing to be unduly officious? Of course, Doctor. What is it? I think it would be advisable if no goodbyes were said or implied. Just behave ordinarily as though nothing had happened. It is absolutely necessary for her to go... Uh, to go away, isn't it? In my opinion, yes, but I do assure you there is nothing to worry about. She will be well and most kindly taken care of and never made to feel that she is in any way out of line. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. I wonder how he can be so certain that there's nothing to worry about, I mean. There's no absolute certainty, I suppose. But he is a good doctor and a sensible, kindly man. I'd be inclined to trust his word. In any case, there really isn't any alternative. No, I suppose not. But it does seem awful somehow. Of course there's no alternative. She obviously must go somewhere where she can be under proper supervision. Somewhere where she isn't dangerous to anyone else. The poor old duck didn't mean to be dangerous. I'm not suggesting that she did, Benita. But the fact remains... She was. Was that the doctor? Yes, he's gone off. Does she know that she's being sent to... being sent away? Miss Archie explained to her tactfully this morning that she was going to stay with some new friends, but she didn't seem to take it in. Oh, poor old girl. I do hope she won't mind. That's what haunts me. The idea of waking up in strange surroundings and, and being suddenly lonely and afraid. Oh, don't. I can't bear it. An aunt of mine went out her head when I was a wee girl. I remember it well. Oh, there was no shilly shallying about in those days. They came for her in the middle of Sunday dinner and hauled her up to the asylum like a sack of potatoes. Oh, dear, Trid, really? I think they're coming down now. Oh, dear. I don't think I can bear it. I can only cry and make a fool of myself. Stay where you are. The doctor said we were to behave as though nothing happened. We'd better talk, I think. I can't think of anything to say. Play the piano, Maud. Play anything that comes into your head. Oh, no, I, I couldn't. Oh, please, just to cover up the silence, quickly. All right. Oh, what 
What a charming hotel. It has quite an atmosphere of home, hasn't it? That's right, dear. Come along. I remember that tune. It's Chopin, isn't it? Yes, dear. It's Chopin. I made an exit to it in Lady Mary's secret many, many years ago. Long before your day, young man. <laughs> It was a lovely, long exit, and I wore a white evening dress. And just as I got to the door, I turned slowly and threw a red rose to my leading man. It was only a property rose, of course, and he didn't always catch it. But it always brought the house down. Au revoir, my dears. I won't say goodbye. Because it's so unlucky. It has been such a really lovely engagement. Good luck to you all. till tomorrow, Doreen. Go and get the coffee and then cut along home to your family. You've had quite a day. Okay, Miss Archie, thanks. And there are two boxes of crackers left over. You can take them to your little brother. Oh, thanks ever so. And wish him jolly good hauls, jolly good term, and jolly good luck with his 11+. plus. He's as bright as a button, really, if it wasn't for his impediment. Good Lord, what's a stutter? Look at that corporal clerk of mine, Betty something. Worst stutter I ever heard. And where is she now? I couldn't say, Miss Archibald. Right up with the top brass of Peter Jones. Oh. Uh, run and see who that is. There's a good girl. Oh, yes, Miss Archibald. Uh, who the devil can that be at this time of night? It's someone to see you, Miss Archibald. Oh. Good evening. Uh, I didn't realise who it was. I mean, I mean, uh, Doreen didn't say. Happy Christmas. The same to you. I've been at a party in Maidenhead, and I'm on my way back to London. I, I thought I'd call in for a moment with uh, this peace offering. Peace offering? It's a case of champagne. Champagne? Good Lord, I really don't I think you... I gather that I'm still in the doghouse. Oh, well, Miss Fenwick, I wouldn't exactly say that. But, of course, they, they were a bit upset at the time, and it's no use saying they weren't. Please, don't be embarrassed. I'm only staying for a moment. You needn't even say that I've been here if you don't want to. You can pretend the champagne was just left at the door. I, I hasten to add that I am not here in a professional capacity for once. It's just that I had rather a guilty conscience. I see. Not about what I wrote. Please don't misunderstand me. That was part of my job. But because I didn't keep my word. No, I don't quite know what you mean. I promised Perry I'd make an appeal on my television program. Oh, that, yes. Yes, I remember. But the television people were against it. So was my editor, so... So I gave in. Oh, please, don't worry any more about it. It's all over and forgotten. Can I offer you a drink? No, 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 thanks. I must go. I've, uh, I've got a friend outside in the car. My boss asked me to give you this. For the wings. Your boss? His lordship. He's a barking old tyrant, but he's in mortal dread of hell's fire, and uh, so occasionally he likes to make a gesture. Maybe a form of spiritual insurance, or it may even be genuine kindness. With him, it's difficult to tell. At any rate, this is it. Good God! Two thousand pounds! It's for the solarium. I can't believe it! And there are no strings attached. It's a private donation for a specific purpose. So see that the committee don't use it for anything else. Give my love to the inmates. Even that old Irish battle. Oh, please, stay a minute. No, no, I think I'd better At go. At least give them a chance to say thank you. I don't want them to say thank you. They have to say thank you every day of their lives. They must be sick to death of it. I'm off. Well, perhaps you'll let me say it then on their behalf. All right. Fire away. Thank you. You know, curiously enough, that 
paper hat is rather becoming. Good night, Colonel. Good night, Miss. Do they want this coffee in the dining room or in here? They're in here. Put it on the table. Okay, Miss Archie. Will, will that be all? Yes, Doreen, that'll be all. Um, sorry for the same for the brooch. It's smashing. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Well, um, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye for now. Good night, everyone. Bye, Doreen. The turkey was delicious, Miss Archie. In fact, the whole dinner was perfect. It will take me at least three days to get over it. <laughs> we really ought to say thank you to Mrs. Blake. Is she still here? No, she's gone home. Oh, we must remember in the morning. Coffee, everybody? Not for me. I shouldn't sleep a week. Hello, what's this? It's a case of champagne. A case of champagne? Somebody must have gone mad. Where on earth did it come from? I expect you'll be angry when I tell you. Why? Zelda Fenwick brought it a few minutes ago. She was on her way to London and she just dropped in to wish you all a happy Christmas. Zelda Fenwick? Good heavens. She said it was a peace offering. I wish it be photographed. Drinking it? No. There were no ulterior motives. She meant it kindly. I assure you she did. I think it was very decent of her. Send it back. We don't want to be beholden to her. I think that would be ungracious. Champagne, indeed, for a lot of defeated, miserable old crones. We are not defeated, miserable old crones, Deirdre. We're well cared for, very comfortable, and we've just enjoyed a most excellent Christmas dinner. I think it was extremely generous of Miss Fenwick to bring us a case of champagne. And I propose that we open a bottle immediately and drink her health. Here, here. Miss Fenwick brought something else, too. What is it? A present to the wings from her boss, Lord Chartley. It's a cheque for £2,000 for the solarium. Well, I'll be damned. £2,000? It can't be true. It can't be true. Oh. Look, 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 it, it is true. Two thousand pounds. Oh, really, Perry? Oh, where's the catch in it? There must be a catch in it somewhere. She said there were no strings attached, that it was a private donation, and that I was to inform the committee that it was for the solarium and nothing else. Booty Neversoul, thou shouldst be with us at this hour. To hell with Booty Neversoul. To hell with the committee. <laughs> this is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened. No, I don't think you should say to hell with the committee, Bonita, even in fun. They do their best and they did send all of us those pretty little powder compacts. <laughs> Come on, Perry, my lad. Bring that case of booze into the kitchen and, and let's bash it open. Right, here we go. Always oh, a ton. I'm afraid we'll have to use tumblers. There aren't any champagne glasses. Whoever heard of a home for defeated old crones without champagne glasses? Oh, I'm so glad. So very, very glad. Oh, cheer up, dear. That really is very good to cry about. I can't help it. I always cry when something nice happens. Don't waste your foolish tears on a scrap of happiness, Estelle. Save them until you need them. And you were one of these fine days, mark my words. I sometimes wonder, Deirdre, if you ever believe anything you say. And what might you be meaning by that? I would like to know what inspires you continually harping on misery and age and the imminence of death. Are you so afraid of it? Are you whispering in the dark? I've never been afraid of anyone or anything made of mud since the day I was born. Well, in that case, it would be kinder to spare the feelings of those who are less courageous. Hooray! Oh, that's right. Take sides against me, all of you. Just because I'm old and weary and a foreigner among you. You've got more vitality than all of us put together. So be quiet and stop overacting. Overacting? Now am I? Yes, dear Dre, you are. And you always did. Never mind about all that now. Let's stop arguing. After all, it is Christmas Day. Oh, oh, oh. I don't think I've heard that sound since they turned dailies into a cinema. <laughs> Here we are. This will be the death of me. I know it will, on top of all that brandy sauce. I hope it's a good year. Bollinger, 1938. Never mind. Only a drop for me, really. Miss Archie, it was so very kind of you to invite me to share your Christmas dinner. Most thoughtful. I, I, I was just wondering, do you think it would be all right if I took just a little sip of the champagne up to Martha? I, I think it would please of her. Of course. Damn good idea. 
Uh, Perry? Thank you. She won't be asleep, will she? She may be dozing, but she never really settles down for the night before 11. Well, if she is, I wake her very gently. <laughs> A little unexpected treat never hurt anyone, eh? <laughs> you know, that man breaks my heart. He really does. Fancy anyone loving anyone as much as that over all those years. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Who's helping on death now, I should like to know? William Shakespeare. Oh, I might have known it. An unlikely contingency. I propose we drink a toast to Zelda Fenwick and Lord Charkley. Will those in favour raise their glasses? I suppose well, it's the least we could do, really. Come on, Lord. Right. <laughs> Zelda Fenwick... And Lord Charkley. Drink up, everyone. There's plenty more champagne in the kitchen. Certainly. I shall have a hangover in the morning, but who cares? Come on. A little of what you fancy does you good. I don't know what Dr. Jevons would say. There's always something glamorous about champagne, isn't there? Because it's a devil's brew and very expensive. When I was at the Gaiety with Millie James, she used to have a magnum in her dressing room every night. That was in 1904. Poor Millie. The results were only too apparent in 1905. <laughs> <laughs> champagne, champagne, champagne. Sublime, so divine, so profane. It pierces the borders and vanishes troubles. Champagne, champagne, champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Common little lyric, if ever I heard one. It's the waltz from Miss Mouse. Poor Dolly Drexel sang it at the end of the second act. She had a big headdress of ostrich feathers, and they kept getting into her mouth. <laughs> Play the other one, Maudie. The one I like about the little bits of cheese. Oh, dear. I can't remember much of it. Uh, wait a minute. Won't you come and live in my house, Miss Mouse? Now, you all have to repeat, Miss Mouse. Let's start again. Won't you come and live in my house, Miss Mouse? Miss Mouse! It's sweet as any apple pie house, Miss Mouse! Miss Mouse! I will give you honey from the bees, bread and milk and lovely bits of cheese. Please, 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 please come and live in my house all together. Come and live in my house. Come and live in my house. Miss Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> that really is the most idiotic song I ever heard. Come on, Benita. <laughs> Over the hill I'll find you. Good God, no. It's too long ago. I couldn't. Come on. I'll prompt you. <laughs> Over the hill I find you There by the murmuring stream And the bird in the woods And the bird in the woods behind you Will echo our secret dream There in the twilight waiting Gentle, serene, and still All the cares of the day Will be banished away When I find you over the hill When I find you over the Sentimental poppycock. The words are a little sugary, but it's a very pretty tune. That'll go better, second house. What was that number you did in Two's a Crowd, Perry? Oh, no, Morty, I couldn't. 
couldn't. I, I couldn't really. I'd dry up. Come on, dear. Don't be coy. You're among friends. Play it, Mordy. <laughs> no. no, that's much too high. Can you take it down a bit? Come the wild, wild weather, come the wind, come the rain, come the little white flakes of snow, come the joy, come the pain. We shall still be together when our life's story ends. For wherever we chance to go, we shall always be friends. We may find while we're traveling through the years. Moments of joy and love and happiness, reason for grief, reason for tears. Come the wild, wild weather, if we've lost or we've won, we'll remember these words we say till our story is done. Time may hold in store for us glory or defeat, Maybe never more for us Life will seem so sweet Time will change so many things Tides will ebb and flow But wherever fate may lead us Always we shall know Come the wild, wild weather Come the wind, come the rain Come the little white flakes of snow, come the joy, come the pain. We shall still be together when our life story ends. For wherever we chance to go, we shall always be friends. We may find while we're traveling through the years, moments of joy and love and happiness, reason for grief. Have you any children? Oh, uh, yes, indeed. Three. Oh. I brought some snapshots to show you. I'm afraid they're not very good, but they'll give you an idea. Oh, I I'll put my glasses on. That's Joan. <laughs> She's the baby. When that was taken, she was only three. She looks a sweet little thing. Uh, that's Eileen. She's at boarding school. Oh. A nice, sensible face. Does she have to wear those glasses? Yes. She had an astigmatism. They're supposed to correct it. Oh, poor child. Let's hope they do. And this is Ronnie, the eldest. He's quite grown up. <laughs> He's going to be a chartered accountant. How tall he is, isn't he? Nearly six foot already. He has a wonderful head for figures. Oh, he's fortunate. Oh, thank you for letting me see them. Why didn't you let me know you were coming? I wanted it to be a surprise. You got your wish. It is. A not too unpleasant one, I hope. Oh, Alan. Why on earth did you come? I came... Well, to get you out of this place. I had no idea you were here until a friend of Cynthia sent her a cutting from the Sunday Clarion. But it was months old, of course, but that was the first we knew of it. Cynthia was terribly upset. Really, she was. Why? Well, hang it. You are her mother-in-law, after all. We've never set eyes on each other in our lives. Well, it's not her fault. I didn't say it was. I was merely stating a fact. I only heard from her once, and that was 17 years ago, just after you were married. Well, at any rate, we had a long talk about your situation. Situation? Well, you living here, in a charity home... I had no idea. Well, neither of us had that things had gone so badly wrong with you. Things haven't gone so badly wrong with me as all that. I'm quite content here. It's a very comfortable home. Why didn't you write to me when... when the breakup happened? I think I'd mislaid your address. You're being very hard, Mother. I'm trying to do my best. Please help me. It was kind of you to come, Alan. At least I... I think it was. I'm not even sure of that. Well, I am your son. Yes, I know. Does that sound as strange to you as it does to me? 
I'm sorry for having hurt you all those years ago. Please believe me. I believe you, Alan. I'm sorry, too. I expect there were faults on both sides, but I think it is a little late now to try to bridge the gulf. I'm a selfish old woman and set in my ways. Here's a letter from Cynthia. She asked me to give it to you. Oh, thank you. She means every word of it. It's a very kind letter. I'll write to her tomorrow. Do you agree with what she says? Do you? Of course. Well, that's why I'm here. This is a dreadfully difficult moment, Alan. Full of sadness and regret and... Well, a sort of hopelessness. I can't find any words to deal with it. I wish you hadn't come. I wish you'd stayed out there in your own life and, and left me to finish mine here in my own way, in peace and quiet. Living out your last years on public charity. Does that sound so very humiliating to you? Of course it does. Cynthia was genuinely horrified when she heard it. Well, so was Myrtle. Myrtle? Well, Cynthia's sister. She's married to one of the most prominent gynecologists in Toronto. How convenient. Oh, please try to see my point, Mother. I see it clearly enough, dear. Cynthia suggests in her letter that I come and live with you both. That would be private charity. Is there much difference between that and the public sort? Of course there is. You are my mother. There is no question of charity. <laughs> you keep on making almost defiant statements. I am your son. You are my mother. Do you really believe that they mean much? Well, I'm doing my best to prove to you that I believe it. Yes. Yes, I know you are. And I'm being very churlish and disagreeable. But it won't work, my dear, really, it won't. You and I may be mother and son in actual fact, but spiritually, oh, we're two strangers, shouting to each other across a void of 33 years. When you were young, we managed to draw close to each other every now and then, but not for long. Your father saw to that. It wasn't all father's fault. I never said it was. It was mine, too, and also the fault of circumstances. I was away on tour a great deal and beginning to do well in the theatre. Your father, on the other hand, wasn't. He was a very jealous man. Not only personally jealous, but professionally jealous. I... Oh, no, I don't blame him for taking you away from me. Knowing his character, it was inevitable. But I couldn't have stopped working then, even if I'd wanted to. If I had, we should all three have starved. There's not much point in raking all that up again, is there? I think it's important that we should both remember exactly where we stood in a very critical moment of our lives. After the divorce, you had to make your choice, and you made it. You were certainly old enough to know your own mind. Mother, I really... No, please don't think that I'm reproaching you. I'm not. I'm merely trying to make you see that certain gestures in life are irrevocable. Do you mean that you won't come? That you won't accept the home that Cynthia and I offer you? <laughs> of course I won't, my dear. It would be insupportable for everyone concerned. You must know that in your heart. You must. One day, if I live long enough and you can afford it, I would like to come to you for a visit and meet Cynthia and... and my grandchildren. Oh, Mother... They... Please don't be hasty over this. Think it over carefully before you decide absolutely. Very well. I shall be here until the end of next week. I have some business to do for my firm. <laughs> I don't even know what your firm is. The Ontario Travel Bureau. It's a steady income, nothing spectacular, but there are chances of advancement. And if I hang on long enough, I get a pension when I retire. Like me. Um, I think I'd better be going now. I've got a taxi outside. Wouldn't you like to send it away and stay to tea? We're quite a cheerful little group. Uh, no, uh, really, I'd rather not. Uh, shall I come and see you again? Oh, yes, dear, do. Please do. Just once more. Mother, I... Go now. Go at once. There's a dear boy. But, but Mother... Please do as I ask. It's It's been rather a shock seeing you again, so... So unexpectedly. 
Where can I get in touch with you? I'm at the Cumberland Hotel. The Cumberland. I'll remember. Goodbye, dear. Go now. Will Wednesday or Thursday be all right? Wednesday or Thursday will be fine. Let's say Thursday, then. If I came about noon, I could take you out to lunch. Oh, yes. That would be lovely. I shall look forward to it. Au revoir. Au revoir, then. Please don't cry. I'll be all right in a minute. Why did he come here? He, he brought me a letter from his wife inviting me to go and live with them in Canada. It was quite a kind letter and very carefully written. And you said no? Yes, I said no. I see. Is there anything I can do to help? Yes, dear me. You can hand me my knitting. Oh, well, that's Perry. He'll be able to tell us how the rehearsals are going for the matinee. Here you are. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone had told me a year ago that a time would come when I should really enjoy knitting, I should have thought they were mad. Well, they're almost too hot in the solarium. That damn television has started wobbling again. Fortunately, it's only a Welsh choir. Miss Archie will fix it. Time for a game of backgammon before tea, Cora. Bonjour, madame. Comment ça va? Ever so très bien, thanks. <laughs> Many happy returns, May. Oh. Perry, you know you're breaking the rules again. You know perfectly well that any mention of birthdays is forbidden in this house. Here's just a little something to make you smell pretty. Oh. Many happy returns, May. <laughs> Why happy didn't birthday. you tell us? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Perry, you really shouldn't have... I'm, I'm most displeased and very touched. Has Topsy Baskerville arrived yet? No, Miss Archie went up this morning. She's bringing her down on the 2-5, so they ought to be here any minute. Poor old Topsy. I wonder how she feels. There's no need to wonder. We all know how she feels. I was with her at the Hippodrome during the First War in 1915. She sang, Oh, Mr. Kaiser. Oh, yes. I remember that. Oh, Mr. Kaiser, see a legal advisor. You've bitten not much more than you can chew. For when Mr. Tommy Atkins comes a marching to Berlin, you'll be gibbering like a monkey in the zoo. Have a banana. Oh, Mr. Kaiser, but when you're older and wiser, you'll learn some things you never learned in school. When we found up the watch on your dear old <laughs> Who is this Topsy? I've never heard of her. Topsy Baskerville. She was in musical comedy and review mostly. Poor thing. So exhausting. <laughs> She's a sweet old girl. You'll love her. I'm sure we shall, Perry, dear. I'm sure we shall. Oh, I expect that's exactly what you said a year ago when I arrived. Yes, I expect we did. Fancy. A whole year ago. It doesn't seem possible, does it? I remember I was in deep despair. Lonely and hopeless and feeling as though I were going to prison. And now, after a year in prison, I feel suddenly free. Isn't that curious? Come along. This way, Miss Baskerville. <laughs> Hello, Topsy. It's me, Benita. Oh, Mr. Kaiser, when you're older and wiser, you'll learn some things you never learned at school. When we wound up the watch on your dear old boy, you're going to look up on Stamford. In Waiting in the Wings by Noel Coward, you heard in order of appearance Josephine Gordon as Benita, Evelyn Lay as Cora, Audrey Laban as Maud, Mary Ellis as May, Mary Wimbush as Deirdre, 
Ursula Hurst as Estelle, Joan Matheson as Almina, David Griffin as Perry, Jill Balkan as Miss Archie, Alan Wheatley as Osgood, Dinah Sheridan as Lotta, June Spencer as Dora, Alice Arnold as Doreen, Patricia Hayes as Sarita, Hannah Gordon as Zelda, Peter Craze as Dr. Jevons, and David Googe as Alan.